Hansen ascended the cliff wall a dozen meters or so, and in a few more steps, he would reach the lizard creature. Hansen had secretly activated his gene lock, and with it, he could sense the creature's desire to turn around. When it did, he also had the foresight to know the creature would extend its tongue. In the next second, the lizard shot out its long, red, spiky tongue towards him. Being able to tell what was coming felt amazing. Hansen felt as if he could predict everything. Hansen leapt away from the cliffside. Borrowing strength from the air, he dodged the giant, toxic-looking tongue and returned to the cliffside near the creature. Unsheathing his silver sword, he quickly chopped its head off. This result even surpassed his own expectation, as the head quickly dislodged from the creature and fell to the ground. His sword went through it like a hot knife through butter, and it was enough to make Hansen question whether or not it was actually a sacred blood creature. Sacred blood creature hunted, mountain lizard. The beast soul was not acquired. Consume its flesh to obtain a random numeric amount of sacred geno points, ranging from zero to ten. But the voice confirmed what Zhu Ting had told him, that it was indeed a sacred blood creature. Hansen was chuffed. He now knew for sure that having unlocked his gene lock, his base power had increased by a dizzying amount, not just his abilities of perception. Right now, even sacred blood creatures could be killed with little to no effort. This was powerful power. Zhu Ting, who remained at the bottom, continued looking up as if he was frozen. He did not say a word. Even he was shocked at how easy it was for Han Sen to slay the sacred blood creature. Peng. The mountain lizard now fell to the ground, as did Han Senator quickly, Zhu Ting sprang to help pick his master up. But then he said, you asshole. I asked you to help me out and weaken the fiend, I didn't ask you to kill it. Did you get the beast soul? I was careless. Sometimes I don't know my own strength. I'm sorry, I'm sorry. Hansen gave a wry smile while he apologized, and then he continued, but I didn't get the beast soul, really. How about I make it up to you by finding another sacred blood beast soul, eh? I'll weaken it and let you get in the final hit. Does that sound okay? Zhu Ting calmed down after hearing that, but he still had to double check. So he asked, but you really didn't get the beast soul? I, Han Sen, in the name of the deities that command our existence, swear a proclamation that I did not receive a beast soul. If I did, smite me, O oh heavenly beings. Hansen jovially said aloud. What kind of oath is that? Do you think I'll believe that? Few people actually die from swearing such a thing. Swear again, and this time, say that you will never ever have a wife. Zhu Ting said. Hansen did as he requested and said it, which comforted him fully. They then hauled the mountain lizard's body onto a summoned mount and decided to return to the shelter. Honestly, though, how have you achieved what you have? You have only been in the second god sanctuary for less than a year, yet you have grown so much and achieved so many things. You haven't unlocked your gene lock, have you? On his way back, Zhu Ting watched Han Sen with fervent curiosity. Now, he couldn't help but ask. Opening a gene lock is not that hard, Han Sen told him, without blinking. Zhu Ting wasn't sure if what he had said was a confirmation, but he chose to believe that he had indeed. After all, Han Sen had been in the second god sanctuary for a way too short a time. Back in the shelter, Han Sen returned to his room to see a woman reclining on a chair reading his books. Although he could only see her shadow from the doorway, Han Sen already knew that it was Queen. Her body was far too special, and its beauty was difficult not to recognize. Han Sen did not expect Queen to receive word and come to see him so soon. It looked as if she was taking his inclusion within her team as a serious thing. Ping Ching said you are willing to join my team? Queen put down her book and turned around to look at Han Sen. Yes, I am. Hansen nodded. What made you change your mind so soon? Queen asked. I've had it rattling around my head for the past few days, and with my sacred geno points almost being at max capacity, 
I thought this would be a good time for me to find out if there are any creatures above the sacred blood class. So, yes, after giving it much thought, I have decided to join you, Hansen said. You won't be tagging along to watch, you know. You will have to obey my command. These creatures are extremely dangerous, and those who have unlocked their gene lock can still perish in the blink of an eye. Especially you. So, when the team is fighting, you must adhere to my orders and leave that lone wolf nonsense behind, Queen told him with a stern face. I know that. Hansen nodded. He then said, but there is something I would like to tell you. My pet has this special ability that causes creatures of the surrounding area to fall back. I am not sure if it will have the same effect on these super creatures, and what's more, my pet cannot attack creatures. I already guessed it made creatures flee, but I had expected it to fight back. The former ability is what I value the most, anyway, Queen said. Wait, so that's all you want? Hansen froze. Queen then told him, there are a lot of creatures around this powerful one we have set our sights on. Although we are not afraid of them, fighting them alongside this bigger super creature would prove too much of a hassle. Not to mention dangerous. With your pet in tow, we would not have to worry about the others, which would allow us all to focus on the primary target. Now Hansen knew why Queen wanted his presence so badly. You sort things out here this night. Tomorrow, you can come with me. I'm only passing through today, so I thought I'd stop by. For attacking a powerful creature, I already have a plan in motion. When you come with me, however, you'll have to meet and greet the team. If they have no objection, we'll have no problem making you a member, Queen said. Wait, so you aren't the absolute decider? Hansen frowned. When I created this team, we established a rule. For the acceptance of a new team member, a unanimous vote must take place. Although I am the team's leader, I cannot override this rule. Okay. The next day, Hansen arranged for others to deal with the shelter's business in his time away, and with the silver fox in hand, followed Queen out of the ice field. With the silver fox in their company, they were not hassled by any intervening creatures, and before long, they arrived at the ocean side. There, Queen summoned a whale for a ship and rode it alongside Hansen. The silver fox was quite amazing, as no creatures of the sea decided to harass them there, either. This seemed to satisfy Queen, as she now looked at the silver fox with greater kindness. But Hansen couldn't enjoy the same treatment, for she had not spoken to him once for the duration of their journey together. And the way she looked at him was cold. Hansen understood that she was still angry with him over what happened that day. Knowing his place, and acknowledging the need to give her space, he avoided talking with her in fear of increasing the tension between them. They sailed across the sea for two days before they caught sight of a black island on the horizon. Queen beelined for it, clearly marking it as her destination. As they neared the island, they espied three people standing on the shoreline two men and a woman, each clad in beast soul armor. They looked refined and elegant, and it was plain to see that these were not ordinary evolvers. Big sis, what took you so long, the woman yelled from afar. The woman was quite short, and despite looking quite beautiful, displayed a hint of laziness. There was a rock in the road, so I had to delay my arrival by an extra couple of days, Queen explained. Although she was a proud woman, she was not unreasonable. Big sis, who is this man? The woman seemed surprised to see Hansen standing by Queen. After the two men greeted Queen as well, they too seemed to have been alarmed by Hansen's presence. His name is Hansen, and I wish to propose his inclusion on our team, Queen merely said, foregoing any detailed introduction. You must be an elite, for big sis, to personally invite you on our team. Can I ask, what is your gene lock power? The woman asked Hansen with curiosity. The two men remained silent, and they continued to lock Hansen within their gazes. Certainly, then, they cared deeply about Queen's reasoning for bringing aboard someone else. Oh, me? I haven't even unlocked by gene lock yet, Hansen lied. Since Queen only said she needed the help of the silver fox, he didn't need to step up to the plate and disclose himself fully. 
Now, he could just follow the team from behind as Queen had personally told him to. Super creatures were nothing to trifle with, and the image of the blue seahorse was still fresh in his mind. If the opportunity to avoid risks was available to him, then he would gladly refrain from engaging with such fearsome enemies. You didn't unlock your gene lock? The three of them called out, simultaneously. After looking at Hansen with bewilderment, they then turned to look at Queen. Queen attempted to explain Hansen's situation by saying, I have tested this personally on my journey here. His silver fox is special. Whenever it is around, no other creatures are, either. If that is true, then why not just buy the pet? There is no need for this slouch to join the team, one of the men said. This man was downright handsome, with blonde hair and emerald eyes. The other man and woman did not say anything yet, as they were a little unsure as to how they felt. Sorry, this pet is not for sale. Hansen quickly shut him down. The blonde man looked to say something again, but Queen prevented him. She said, according to the rules we established upon this group's formation, everyone is provided the opportunity to say their piece. If you don't want this person on our team, then feel free to say so. If that is the case, he will be gone. But I am the one who brought him here, so no one can touch him. An uneasy silence followed, which Queen broke by asking, where is the rest of the team? Have they still not arrived yet? Big sis, it sounded like the three of them were delayed by something. But I'm sure they'll be along shortly, the woman said. Well, in that case, let's wait until they have arrived. We can discuss and vote on Hansen's inclusion when they get here, Queen said. The handsome blonde man then said, Pa. We don't have to wait. I disagree and don't want him. Did you forget that one of our founding laws stated that anyone who joined must have unlocked their gene lock? This guy wants to be some Klingon, using his pet while he reaps the benefit of the potential slaying of a super creature? I understand, but his pet may prove vital to our current struggle. It could save us a lot of trouble, Queen rebutted, shooting the handsome man with her stiletto gaze. Yes, tyrant. To have someone like this isn't such a bad idea. The woman was in agreement with Queen, and so she joined in and tried to convince the handsome man. The handsome man called Tyrant now looked cold. He said, I would rather struggle than share the rewards of actually slaying a super creature with a noob who hasn't unlocked their first gene lock. Queen frowned at Tyrant adamance about Hansen's exclusion from the team. She nodded and said, Okay, fine. If that is how things will be, I'll return him home. After that, Queen climbed on top of the whale's back again with Han Senator she apologized to him, saying, I am sorry for wasting your time. This was a pointless journey. It's okay. Hansen shook his head and gave a wry smile. He didn't want to risk his life, and that's why he did not admit that he had unlocked his gene lock, but he didn't expect that he would be rejected by the group and shot down so quickly. He had only just arrived here and now he was to be sent back. Hansen wasn't too happy about this, but he did not think it would be a good idea to admit the truth now, either. So, he prepared himself to return home with Queen. As Queen prepared to take off with the whale, Hansen noticed the coming of someone who was riding a sea beast. He was gliding across the waves at a furious pace. Before long, he had arrived on the island. Strangely, however, he looked severely wounded and was covered in a mass of burns. Many were dressed in hastily wrapped bandages, but even so, you could tell he was not in good shape. Horny old man. Are you okay? Where is Shang Qing? Queen dismounted, and everyone gathered around him. The other woman quickly moved to help support him. On our way here, we came across a creature that breathed fire. It was too powerful and I got separated from Shang Qing. I don't know if the rest made it away, horny old man bleakly told the group, with a face as white as a ghost. The faces of the group were horrified, but they could not do anything. To encounter a super creature was always a frightening, life-threatening ordeal, but to stumble across one in the sea was a nightmare. He was lucky to have made it out alive. The burns that had scorched horny old man's body were not mild. 
The group helped carry him down to the shore and tried to remedy his wounds. When Hansen saw the burn marks, he could not help but ask himself, did they meet the blue seahorse? Lazy cat, you stay here and tend to horny old man me, tyrant, and sky jealousy will go and take a look. We'll see if we can find them. Queen leapt onto the back of her whale as she spoke. Tyrant and Sky Jealousy summoned their own sea rides, and they all hurriedly took off in the direction Horny Old Man pointed. When they reached the area Horny Old Man told them about, they split up and tried to look for the missing people. Hansen was still on the whale, sitting next to Queen. Despite looking for the missing persons, they weren't able to find a trace. It was mostly likely that they had died. It looks like Queen and her people haven't yet killed a single super creature, despite the fact that they have unlocked their gene lock. Humans in the Second God Sanctuary are still struggling with their overwhelming strength, it seems. Hansen's mind was alert. When he first unlocked his gene lock, he was extremely happy about it. But now he felt as if its status carried a certain weight to it that he had not realized previously. The thought that a few people, who had striven to unlock their first gene lock as much as Hansen had, were now dead. They were taken out by a super creature in the sea in no time at all. It terrified him. Queen, Tyrant, and Sky Jealousy rendezvoused in a location they had established. Their faces looked dim, a clear indication that they had no luck in searching for their missing compatriots. Let's go back to the island first. It is not safe to remain in these waters. Queen was immediately decisive, afraid something might happen if they remained. Quickly, they returned. What do we do now? Even if they were killed, you were not even able to recover their bodies? Horny old man is still injured. Are we still going after the creature on the island? Lazy cat frowned. Of course we are. Otherwise, our time here will have been wasted. Tyrant coldly said. But right now, only the three of us remain. What if it really is? Lazy Cat trailed off and did not finish her sentence. Still, everyone knew what she meant. How about we allow this temporary friend of ours to join us? Sky Jealousy suggested, her presence breathing out an aura of elegance. Tyrant furrowed his brows at the prospect, but did not say anything in opposition. If the others had arrived without issue, he wouldn't have given the idea a second thought. But now, there were only five of them left. If they wanted to prove the existence of the creatures they sought, bringing Han Sen and the Silver Fox along to shoo off any additional mobs would be a great help. What does temporary mean? Han Sen skewed his eyebrows as he asked. Give us a price and we will hire you as a sellsword or mercenary, Tyrant coldly said still unwilling to offer a formal position in their fellowship. Hansen looked at Queen as she calmly said, No matter what you decide, I will have you returned home without injury. When Hansen heard Queen say this, he smiled and replied, Fine, you can hire me. I must warn you, however, I am expensive. I almost suspect you would not be able to afford me. How much do you want? Tyrant continued to look at Hansen with a stone-cold attitude. Well, the silver fox and I count as two people. Therefore, we will accept one sacred blood beast soul each. We won't settle for lower than that, Hansen stated. He wanted to receive some sort of benefit from this excursion, even if he hadn't come expecting any. And since he had come all this way anyway, he wanted to see how they planned on fighting a super creature. With someone now paying him to watch, there was no reason for him to decline. Formally becoming a member of Queen's team wasn't too important to him. After all, her team wasn't the only super creature hunting team in the Second God Sanctuary, so even if he wasn't accepted here, he was bound to be accepted elsewhere. Okay. Tyrant did not even blink before agreeing. He gave Hansen one sacred blood beast soul and then said, This is a deposit. After we are done, you can have the other. I like that you are quick to make decisions. I have no problem with that. Hansen accepted Tyrant's terms. After Hansen accepted, the others gathered around to form a plan of action. First, they would need to find the creature. They did have a plan initially, 
but it had been made under the assumption all members would be present and available for combat. Now, with only five of them remaining, they'd have to come up with another plan. Horny old man was injured, too, so that left only four battle-worthy team members. Hansen was now a part of the team, as well. After Hansen heard them discuss their predicament, he quickly understood the gravity of the situation. Deeper inland, it was said, resided a certain white tiger. Upon visiting the island, someone on the team had spotted this creature, which appeared to be encased in a whirlwind of some sort. This suggested it had the ability to harness the wind itself. They had all decided to come to the island today to fight this creature that had been appropriately named White Tiger. They had no plan to kill it just yet, only to get a feel for its power and accurately gauge the extent of its strength. With Hansen here, we do not have to worry about any of the additional mobs that populate the island. The only drawback to his inclusion is a reduction of any extra goodies we might collect from slaying them. Okay, so who will tank and try to withstand the tiger's first strike? Lazy Cat worriedly inquired. Tyrant stepped up and said, I will do it. I recently came into possession of a sacred blood shield. If it really is a super creature, I should be able to block its paws at least twice. Okay, so that is established. Tyrant will go in and block its attack first. I have drawn a map of the surrounding area. Sky Jealousy, you will go here. Queen went into great detail, explaining the plan. She had developed all sorts of contingencies, too, for if anything were to go wrong during their assault. Hansen wasn't included in the battle plans. All he had to do was stand a fair distance away from the creature, holding the silver fox to ensure no other monsters came near. Hansen had no complaints. Queen and the others worked well together. He had only come here to watch, but he also thought if he were to join in, he might interfere with the synergy the others had with each other. However, Hansen was well acquainted with the power super creatures possessed, and he didn't think Queen and her team had what it took to bring one down. Hansen was worried that the silver fox might also end up chasing the white tiger off, but these fears were soon allayed. From among three hills in the distance, a monstrous roar sounded, accompanied by a gusting wind. It was undoubtedly the white tiger, and since it was still nearby, this most likely meant no other super creature would fear the silver fox either. It felt as if a tornado was now racing down from the hills, and the white tiger in its midst would soon be upon them. Get ready to fight. When Queen issued her command, Tyrant and the others quickly assumed their positions and awaited the monster's arrival. There were supposed to be a great deal of other monsters on the island, but only the tiger and its wind came for them. No other creature could be seen, and this allowed the others to confirm the silver fox's ability for themselves. Hansen secretly turned on his gene lock, which pushed his seventh sense to the max. With it, he could see the white tiger running at them from a mile away. Compared to many other creatures he had encountered, the white tiger wasn't so big. It was only about four meters in length. Its body was snow white, and its eyes glistened like blood rubies. The white tiger was now carried on the wind it employed, and it ran towards them on the air, no different than how it would run on land. If it could fly in the sky without wings, then the creature could certainly harness the wind for its own devices. The white tiger looked angry, and the momentum that drove him in their direction was powerful. Although it wasn't too big, its presence exerted a pressure on them. It was almost like a champion, descending from the sky. The faces of Queen and her team were bleak. Hansen saw this, then fell back a bit with the silver fox in his arms. He was afraid of super creatures, and really wanted to avoid them. It felt as if it was only dumb luck that had allowed him to defeat one back in the first god's sanctuary. The super creatures that populated the second god's sanctuary had a crushing power unlike anything else. If the baby silver fox had the ability to kill a person who had unlocked their gene lock in one hit, whatever the white tiger could do would be much worse. The silver fox now saw the white tiger and it too looked nervous. Its hair rose up on its ends, and it looked at the tiger with hostility. Hansen held the silver fox tight, 
not allowing it to do anything unusual. Although the silver fox was powerful, he didn't think it had what it took to defeat the adult white tiger. The white tiger continued to traverse the air, but it was now only a mere dozen meters away from them. It raised its paw and whipped it through the air. As if the atmosphere was breaking in two, violent gusts of wind splintered out to attack the team. Tyrant shouted and raised his shield, his body clad in golden armor. His shield presented a phalanx of steel, blocking the arrows of wind that came towards him. Dong. After the loud noise, Tyrant opened his eyes to see the shield in his arms shatter. A sacred blood shield, destroyed in an instant. Tyrant's hand had also been damaged. It was bleeding badly, and there was a tear in his thenar space. The faces of the team members changed. The power of the white tiger was even greater than they had expected, and it only took a brush of the air it controlled to annihilate Tyrant's defenses. Plan C Queen yelled, as her body shining purple. She was making a move. Tyrant's body shone gold, like a heavenly being. He held a big black lance in his hands, which he used to thrust at the tiger. Lazy Cat also went into action. Despite her short and stout stature, which had led Hansen to believe she would be slow-moving, she was nimble and quick. Like the tiger itself, she harnessed the power of the wind. Sky Jealousy's hand held a sleek sword, the blade of which was thinner than a cicada's wing. After a low swing, a strong breath of frosted air was cast out of it. It looked like the sort of skill that would belong to someone from the Shwe family. The white tiger's purpose was very clear, it seemed to target Queen. The wind that was cast out of its paws resembled projectile claws that soared through the air towards her. Queen's breasts jiggled rhythmically as the purple light shone from within her body. Her long, incredible legs carried her with tremendous strength as she ducked to the side to avoid the incoming attack. The green claw wind she dodged past her by and sliced a boulder in two. Dong. One of Lazy Cat's daggers struck towards the tiger. Then Sky Jealousy's sword and Tyrant's lance attempted to pierce their foe together. But something scary happened. The tiger's fur ruffled with an additional stream of wind. Lazy Cat's dagger, Sky Jealousy's sword, and Tyrant's lance fell short of the beast as if their weapons were shielded from the tiger's skin by a thick, ardent, invisible shell of wind. Roar. The white tiger's body shook as it looked to the sky and roared. A horrid wind picked up, and a cyclone burst forth from its deafening cry. Catcha. Catcha. The cyclone weaved itself around the weapons that had tried to draw blood from the white tiger, and it twisted them out of shape. Only Tyrant's lance, which was incredibly heavy and durable, remained unbent. A few deep scratch marks affected its surface. The three of them fell back, unable to hear a thing as a loud ringing pounded in their heads from the sonic blast. Their heads were in pain. Fall back. Fall back now. Queen screamed and signaled. She summoned a dagger and threw it towards the tiger. The knife cracked the air as it traveled and looked as if it were about to impale itself in the tiger's eye. Roar! The white tiger cried out again. A frightening storm of wind coursed out of its mouth, becoming a solid slab of gale force terror. It deflected the incoming knife. Boom! The knife was blasted away, shattering into little more than glitter before the tiger's face. Like the twinkling of stars and sparks in the sky, the wind scattered the remains of the knife. Hansen was shocked. That knife was a one-time use sacred blood beast soul. It was wretchedly powerful, but it couldn't even deal a single scratch to the white tiger. The tiger's fury was triggered by her surprise knife throw, and it leapt towards Queen for retribution. But Queen was quick on her feet and, like a graceful goddess, she was able to dance away from the tiger's claws. Hansen's eyes watched her with admiration, and he deeply respected Queen's heavenly go. It was as efficient as his own Dongxian Sutra, but they both yielded their own particular benefits. Facing this white tiger and avoiding its attack was a testament to her dexterity. Tyrant and the others followed Queen's orders and quickly turned to fall back and escape from the beast. 
The white tiger was far more powerful than they expected it to be. It was unique, unlike any other creature they had seen before. There was no hope of competing with it, so they hastily retreated as soon as the order was given. What are you doing standing there? Go. Lazy cat yelled at Hansen while she ran. It seemed as if they wholly trusted Queen's own ability to fall back once they had gotten clear. Hansen nodded, and with the silver fox in his arms, he pulled back. He didn't return at the same speed as the others did, though, and so he stayed behind them. Although they were confident in Queen's heavenly go, Han Sen was the only one there who had learned it. He understood Queen's position and situation more than anyone else did. Heavenly Go was an incredible talent and it was currently eluding a beast as monstrous as the white tiger right now. But Queen's foe was imbued with the power of wind, and its speed was something else. No matter how effective her Heavenly Go was, she still couldn't shake the chasing tiger, and it would only take one misstep for her to meet her demise. After all, she was just human. If she could not get rid of the white tiger in time, she would inevitably make a mistake. Even if she remained flawless, it was only a matter of time before she exhausted her energy, and when that time came, death would await her. Hansen was thinking of how he might help Queen. They had a history together, and she was the one who taught him his heavenly go in the first place. Queen was leading the tiger to the beach and still, Hansen could not come up with an idea. Hansen understood what she sought to do, by attempting to use the sea to halt the tiger's advance. The white tiger had an affinity for the wind, so its abilities in water must not be very good. An idea then struck him, so he turned and went off in another direction. What are you doing? Don't run off. Tyrant called out to him. Ignoring him, Hansen summoned his golden growler and ran to the beach. With his own knowledge of heavenly go and the proficiency of his seventh sense, he could gauge where Queen was planning to go. He wanted to help. The white tiger was furious, and Hansen was worried Queen might not hold out until she got to the shoreline. Hey, what are you doing? Stop. Lazy Cat yelled at Hansen's fleeing shadow. Just ignore him. This is why I cannot allow people such as that to earn a place on this team, Tyrant spat. The three of them saw Hansen head away from Queen's current position, with no idea of what he was hoping to achieve. Pretending not to hear anything, Hansen carried on. He wasn't an official member of the team either, so he did not see why he had to explain his actions to the others. This test was already over, they had learned of the white tiger's power, and they had failed in their attempts to attack it. He feared no one might ever be able to kill it. Hansen continued riding Golden Growler to the shore and arrived before Queen did, since she kept having to switch her direction to avoid the white tiger. He could see her approaching from a distance. She was bleeding, having sustained many injuries, and it looked as if her beast soul armor could break at any second. Fortunately, they weren't grievous wounds. Her ability to reach the ocean side was not compromised. Hansen gave a long sigh and said to himself, Queen is magnificent. If I was in her position, I don't think I'd last half as long. Hansen then went silent for a bit. He put away his golden growler and went into the sea. There was no use for him on the shore, so he had to get ready to meet up with Queen. Hansen hadn't been in the sea long before he saw Queen approaching. Like an arrow, she bolted into the sea. The blood on her body brought a misty haze of red flowers to the water, and it looked beautiful. He then saw a flash of white light descend across the tumultuous waves of the sea, and it violently scraped and clawed its way across the sea surface. When the tiger brought its paws down on the water, the seas parted in half, creating a trench of a few dozen meters. It looked as if the tiger wasn't yet willing to quit its pursuit. The purple light in Queen's body was shining and she now clutched a lance in each hand. They were both dyed purple. She quickly turned around to block an incoming attack. Dong. Both lances were destroyed, which prompted Queen to say, hum. Bleeding from her chest, she was knocked further into the sea. Pang. Queen was driven into the seabed, forming a deep hole in the shape of her body. 
This hit put her in a critical status. Although the white tiger would not swim, it continued to swing its paws. The violent gusts of wind drove the sea mad, producing waves that were thirty feet high, many coursed through the waters to slice at the seabed. Queen resisted succumbing to the pain that engulfed her. She dodged the white tiger's attacks as she tried swimming deeper and deeper into the sea. Crap. This white tiger is too much. Hansen was planning to meet up with Queen under the sea, but he hadn't counted on the white tiger being as feral as it was. Going down there now would be useless, so he simply stayed where he was, hoping Queen could continue dodging the creature's assault. But the hit Queen had received was terrible, and it affected her performance a great deal. It was already hard enough for a person to maneuver in the sea, and now Hansen could see she was about to miss her next dodge. Gritting his teeth, Hansen took the plunge and went under towards Queen. Queen was still struggling. She noticed a shadow coming right for her, and after squinting for greater clarity, saw that it was Hansen. Hansen pulled Queen deeper into the sea. He was incredibly dexterous in the sea, so he was far more mobile than Queen underwater. Hold me. Hansen put Queen on his back and told her to grab his waist. Then, with full speed, he sped off into darker waters. The white tiger was not keen to give up, so it continued casting its murderous gusts down into the sea. But Hansen was like one of the mare folk as he swam across the seabed with great speed, effortlessly dodging each of the tiger's attacks. Queen was grabbing Hansen tight, and she felt touched. She had never expected Hansen to come and save her like he had. Even in the sea, Hansen was using the formation taught to him by the Dongxian Sutra. He kept maneuvering and switching position to dodge the tiger as he went, as pure speed wouldn't have cut it. But still, the white tiger was not willing to let them go. It wasn't until they were at a depth of 80 meters that the tiger gave up its attacks. At that depth, even the ferocious bullets of wind could not damage them. But the white tiger was still in pursuit, for wherever Hansen swam, the tiger hovered above. It was not going to give up its prey so easily, and it most certainly wasn't going to allow them to swim up to the surface. Crap. Is it a dog? Hansen had already swum 300 meters deep without being able to shake its chase. He cursed it in his heart and continued swimming deeper. After swimming for half an hour, Han Sen was around 500 meters deep. But it was still to no avail. From above the brackish waters, the tiger continued to watch them. Han Sen was preparing to swim even deeper, but then he noticed something was wrong with Queen. He turned around to take a look at her, and her face was not looking good. It wasn't because of the injuries she had sustained, however, it was because she was suffocating. Han Sen was shocked. After he learned Dongxian Sutra, he was able to breathe underwater. Even the silver fox had this ability. Alas, Queen did not. If she hadn't been injured, she could have remained under the sea for several hours, but she had taken a blow to the chest. Her lungs were damaged, which made it difficult for her to remain underwater as she was. Queen gestured to Han Sen, telling him that she wanted to return to the surface. She did not want to go up merely for air, but also to allow Hansen a chance of escaping their current predicament. Hansen pulled her close and shook his head. He looked into her eyes, touched her face, and sealed her lips with his own. There was a pleasant taste to her kiss. Her eyes opened wide at the sight of Hansen, whose face was directly in front of hers. But she quickly understood what he was trying to do. She didn't attempt to push him back as she initially desired, and instead swallowed the pleasant taste he was providing her with. She was no longer suffocating and she felt rejuvenated. When her body was relieved, she pushed Hansen away and grabbed his waist once again. Then they swam deeper. When Queen could no longer hold her breath, Hansen gladly breathed more air into her lungs. After doing this a few times, Hansen had swum several thousand meters below the sea. Eventually, the white tiger gave up its chase and returned to the island. Hansen was still worried, though. To ensure absolutely safety, he swam for another dozen miles and then returned to the surface. 
when they were back below the sky, the tiger was nowhere to be seen. Then, Queen summoned her whale. She quickly climbed onto it and fell down, her face looked poorly. The wound in her chest was deep and it hadn't had the chance to heal, due to being in the water for so long. She had also suffered much blood loss. Hansen quickly searched himself and Queen, but realized the package they had brought with them was gone. They had no curatives or medical items. It's okay. I'll be able to hold on. Cough. Cough. Queen managed to maintain her composure, and if weren't for the gaping wound, it would be difficult to tell she had been severely injured. But having damaged her lung, even speaking caused her to spit out some blood. Just hold on. Hansen used his hands to tear off some of her battle suit, clearing the area around her wound. The beast soul armor had already been destroyed by the white tiger, and the battle suit beneath was damaged. Hansen ripped it easily, exposing her chest. A pair of massive, snow-white breasts presented themselves to Han Senator, but they were damaged, a nasty gash cutting across them. Hansen wasn't sure whether or not to be aroused by the sight. Queen's eyes revealed her awkwardness over the situation, but she did not move. All she did was blush. Under their current circumstances, Hansen wasn't in the mood to admire her body, so he lifted the silver fox and placed it on her chest. He then told it, Silver Fox, please help. The silver fox looked at Han Sen and then turned to look at Queen. It then started licking her snow white skin. After the silver fox had licked her for a brief while, her body began to tremble. The wound that had already started to show signs of infection sealed shut. With the bleeding stopped, the area looked better and better each second. Queen felt as angry as she did awkward, having no idea what Han Sen was doing. But when she looked down at the afflicted area, she noticed the wound was starting to fade away as the silver fox licked her. She stared at the creature in bewilderment. Han Sen looked at the silver fox, but his eyes subconsciously moved to look elsewhere. He noticed Queen was breathing quite rapidly and her chest was beating hard. The jiggling almost caused Han Sen to lose all composure. Queen was surprised to see the silver fox possess this ability. For a brief moment, she forgot all about Hans and being near her. When she heard Wretched panting to her side, she looked over, shocked, to see Hans and unabashedly staring at her breasts. Her face turned red and she moved her hands to cover her exposed chest. But with the silver fox on top of her, and the size of the breasts themselves, she couldn't hold them. All she could do was yell, are you still looking? Oh, I'm sorry. Hansen used his hands to shield his eyes. Queen almost fainted in embarrassment. Although Hansen put his hands in front of his eyes, he made sure to keep taking peeks through the quick shuffling of his fingers. Turn around. Queen said angrily. Fine, fine. Hansen reluctantly turned around, feeling envious of the silver fox. While he was forced to look away, the silver fox was being allowed to freely enjoy the delight every man desired. After that, the silver fox jumped back to Han Senator, but he didn't hear Queen say anything. Can I turn around yet? he eventually asked. Give me a beast, soul armor. Her voice was cold once more, a sign she had mostly returned to normal. Sure. Hansen turned around to look at Queen and froze. The sun was setting, turning the ocean into a beautiful vat of molten, glittering gold. Queen, in all her elegant beauty, was sitting before the scene naked, with her arms wrapped around her busty chest. Her round shoulders, sexy bones, slim waist and bendy legs, in the light of the setting sun, she could have been mistaken for a mermaid queen. Still looking. Queen hissed these two words between clenched teeth. Eyes were built to watch things of beauty. I cannot ignore their desires. Hansen slumped his shoulders while he spoke. He pulled back his gaze, brought out his bloodscale armor, and gave it to Queen. She donned it immediately, and the armor concealed her voluptuous chest. Although you could make out slender curves, the overall sight was less arousing. Still, she had a beautiful face. It was the face of an elegant goddess, one who no man could touch. You looked better earlier. 
Now you look too cold, Hansen said. Don't think saving me grants you a free pass. I still want to kill you, and if you say another word about my body, I'll cut you down right this second. Queen directed a furious gaze towards Han Senator, if Ice could kill, he would have been diced into pieces already. Fine. I will stop. Hansen closed his eyes, but started to smile. And don't think about it, either, Queen added. The smile Hansen was giving her was unbearably smug, making her believe he was memorizing something he had no right to. I am afraid I cannot do that. This mind is my own, but I cannot fully control which fond neurological pastures it desires to revel in. Hansen opened his eyes as he spoke. Queen gritted her teeth and said nothing more. She did look mad, though. I think you look better when you're mad, you look quite feminine, Hansen told her. Queen thought she must have done something truly awful in her past life to have become acquainted with Hansen in this one. Hansen tore the clothes from her body when they last met, and he had pretty much done so again. It seemed as if all her most embarrassing moments kept occurring with Hansen. Eventually, Queen calmed her mood and became cool again. She resolved to try not to be so short-tempered, lest something even more embarrassing happen. After all, Han Sen had saved her. And she'd feel terrible if she did something bad to him. But whenever she opened her eyes and saw Han Sen, she got incredibly angry and her temper rose again. So, she turned around and decided to gaze at the sea instead of Han Senator she asked, Where are we? I don't know. My primary concern was shaking the white tiger, so I took a number of twists and turns. I don't even know which direction the island is in, anymore. Hansen blinked. Queen furrowed her eyebrows and said, Leave your silver fox here. We'll come back, but for now, we need to go get some food. There's no need. I can handle it. Hansen placed the silver fox on the back of the whale and then jumped into the water solo. A while later he returned, carrying a fish that was two feet long. He skinned and deboned it. Then, he cut the meat into thin slices and picked one up. I can. Queen thought Hansen was giving it to her. Before she could reject him, however, she noticed Hansen was instead feeding it to the silver fox. She quickly closed her mouth and blushed. Oh, you want some? I can give you some. Hansen heard her half-sentence, so he picked up another slice and brought it to her. Come on, open your mouth. Queen felt as if she was going to explode, as more and more blood pumped to her face. She clenched her jaw hard and didn't say anything. She then moved to sit behind Han Senator, without looking at him, she grabbed a slice of fish, by herself. Hansen slouched his shoulders and placed the fish he was holding into his mouth. He held the silver fox and sat in front of Queen. He and the fox happily shared their portion, dividing it evenly between them. When it came to the last slice, he picked it up and started to put it in his mouth. But before he could take it all, the silver fox jumped onto his arm and bit the other half of the fish. Neither of them wished to let go, which annoyed Queen. In her heart, she asked herself, what sort of person in their right mind would fight for food with their pet? But Queen felt like something was wrong. The lips of the silver fox and Hansen were connected, but the silver fox had just licked her most beautiful trophies earlier. Queen's cold face suddenly turned all red. She turned around and went to the head of the whale and looked out at the ocean. What did I do to upset her this time? Hansen was surprised because he was just playing with the silver fox. He had no idea why she was so mad again. By now, they had both acknowledged that they were lost. The whale had been swimming for half a day, with no sign of land. There was a giant creature swimming across the sea, which almost resembled a moving island. Seeing it, Han Sen and Queen did not even dare to breathe, and they steered the whale in another direction to avoid it. With the silver fox on board, the only creatures they were likely to meet would be insanely powerful ones. The two had been lost at sea for half a month, and this was the second time they had seen a creature like this. 
Fortunately, the creatures never paid them heed and would instead continue in the direction they were headed. They waited until the giant creature was out of sight and let out long sighs. After another half day, Hansen suddenly saw something green on the horizon. It could have been an island, he thought. We are saved. There is an island in the distance. Even if there is no one there, we could at least find some real food. All this time adrift, all we have been drinking is fish blood. I'm getting sick of it. Queen looked happy at this news, too. The entire time they had been on the back of the whale, they had been eating fish meat and drinking fish blood, and she too was starting to hate it. As the image of green drew nearer and nearer, it revealed itself to indeed be an island of sorts. The hills were quite steep, but they were short, and it was decorated with much foliage. There were no tall trees on the island, but there were many berry bushes. The berries they contained looked like delicious little grapes. Queen summoned her wings and flew over to take a look. The island wasn't too big, and it didn't seem to be populated with any creatures. Both feeling confident about their newfound parcel of land, they disembarked and climbed onto the island. Hansen looked at the red berries and thought to himself, these berries can't be like those red mushrooms, can they? Queen had already ventured inland. After a brief search, she found a pond hidden among the hills. The prospect of fresh water excited her very much. What are you looking at? Queen noticed Hansen squatting near the bushes. She furrowed her eyebrows. I am wondering whether or not I can eat these things. I am getting tired of eating fish meat, and I am keen to eat something fresh like this, Hansen answered. Don't randomly eat stuff. Let's stick to the fish, Queen told him. Although she was sick of fish meat, as well, not all plants in the world were safe for human consumption. The berries did look delicious, but who knew whether or not they'd cause problems if eaten. I think they're okay. I'd say it'd be okay for us to eat them. Hansen continued to observe the berries, and from the knowledge he had received from Professor Sun, he was sure they would be fine to eat. Queen ignored Hansen and simply returned to the sea to catch more fish. She was happy enough to be able to cook the fish meat, and doing that was certainly better than risking the consumption of curious, unknown berries. Although Hansen was sure they would be okay to eat, he didn't take any. Hansen had a question burning in his mind. Why did the berries, while edible, grow in such abundance on the island? And why were they wholly untouched? While they were out at sea, they saw many birds flying overhead. And yet, there was nothing in the remote vicinity of this island. This made Hansen believe something was wrong. Hansen fought back the desire to try out the berries, and decided to take a stroll around the island, find out what he could, and see if he could witness anything strange about the place they had ended up on. The island wasn't too large, and a regular human could walk around it in half a day. With Hansen a top golden growler, combined with his abilities, it didn't take him long to scope out the place. While the island wasn't too big, the hills inland were strange. The rocky hills were not too high, standing at about 20 meters tall, and from afar, one could mistake them for overgrown pineapples. The weirdest thing was how identical each hill was to the next. Hansen climbed a hill and looked around. On the tallest hill, he caught sight of a lotus-looking plant. It looked like an ordinary lotus, with seven leaves and a bud at the center. It was also pure white. Hansen frowned. Lotuses tended to grow in water, or at least in very moist soil. He had never seen one grow on a hill before, which made him question whether it was really a lotus. Seeing as it was just a plant, Hansen didn't think he'd have anything to be afraid of. Carrying the silver fox, he decided to ascend the hill. Upon reaching the top, he took a proper gander at the seven-leaved flower. Taking a closer look, Hansen confirmed that it was indeed a lotus. Its snow-white petals were all folded around the fist-sized lotus cup inside. This was different than the usual green ones, as this cup was snow-white on the inside, too. It was semi-transparent, and there were many red seeds on the inside. However, it wasn't very big, which indicated it wasn't fully mature yet. 
As Han Sen continued to observe it, the silver fox jumped out of his arms. It used its own nose to sniff the lotus and blinked as a human would. Then, it curiously circled the lotus as if inspecting the flower. After a while, the silver fox decided to lie down next to it. Silver fox, do you care to tell me what that means? Hansen asked, while looking at the silver fox with a puzzled expression. If the silver fox wanted to eat something, he'd usually gobble it down without a second thought. He had never waited for his food before. The silver fox's face suggested that it did want to eat the plant, but the fox continued to just lie down next to it. Hansen wasn't sure what it was thinking. Do you want to wait until it is ripe? Hansen thought of this possibility and asked the silver fox. But the silver fox could not reply. All it did was squint with its eyes and continue lying there. It was almost as if it were guarding the lotus plant, like a watchdog. Hansen saw smoke rising near the ocean side, which told him Queen had already gathered some fish and was most likely cooking it. When he reached down to grab the silver fox, it bolted out of the way as if it didn't want to leave. It then sat down, unmoving. Even if you want to wait until it is ripe, it could take a while. No one is fighting for it, so let's go eat some food and come back. Hansen comforted the silver fox and tried to grab him again. But again, the silver fox refused to budge. He had no intention of leaving the lotus and seemed resolute in his decision to guard the plant. With nothing he could do about it, Han Sen decided to walk back to the ocean side. As he made his way back, he thought to himself, that lotus must be some good stuff. Otherwise, why would he be so stubborn and stay there? He is rather picky when it comes to food. No, I can't let the silver fox take it all for himself. I bet he is waiting for the lotus seeds. Otherwise, he'd have munched it all at first sight. What other reason could there be for him to stay there and wait? Hmm, but how can I take them away from the silver fox? If the silver fox decides to fight me, how can I expect to look after it in the future? Many different thoughts and questions now plagued Han Sen's mind, and he wasn't entirely sure what to do. The silver fox was refusing to leave that spot and it was going to wait until the seeds were ripe. Stealing food from it would be a difficult thing. When Han Sen returned to the ocean side, Queen was using her sword to skewer and cook fish meat. Although the fire was only fueled by vines and sticks, it seemed decent enough to last. Han Sen saw a few other swords, propped up beside the fire as well, each packed with meat. The slices of fish were gold, and the oil sizzled on them in a tantalizingly. Hansen had to ask, is this for me? What do you mean, are they for you? I am planning to eat them once they are all done, Queen responded. Can I have some? Hansen asked politely. If you want, suit yourself. Queen did not look at Hansen once, and continued to stare at the meat in her hand. Hansen smiled. He picked up some meat and took a bite. Unfortunately, he should have waited, for his mouth burnt with the heat. Still, this fresh fish tasted divine compared to the raw fish they had been eating previously. Where's your fox? Queen watched Hansen eat like a madman and, feeling more relaxed, posed the question. I took it back. Hansen blinked as he told her. Really? Queen looked at Hansen, not believing him. Summon him so we can all eat together. There's no need. It is just a pet, ignore the creature. Hansen thought Queen had learned something else about the silver fox when it healed her, but he wasn't willing to admit it. Okay. Queen didn't inquire any further and simply continued cooking her meat. Hansen ate eight slices of meat. With a bloated belly, he fell backwards into the sand. After a large exhale of content, he called out, Awesome. Queen ate a few, too. But when she was done, she returned her beast soul sword and started walking off towards the hills. What are you doing? Hansen sat up and asked, worrying over whether or not Queen would find out about the silver fox and lotus. I'm just going for a walk, Queen replied, already walking off to the hills. I'll come with you. 
Hansen jumped up with a fright and thought to himself, I really can't hide the silver fox's reason for not coming back. It wouldn't be difficult for Queen to discover where the lotus and the silver fox were. After ascending a small hill, she caught sight of them both from afar. She turned around and looked at Han Senator with a cocky smile, she turned back and began walking towards the fox. What is that? Queen pointed towards the lotus as she neared the silver fox. I don't know, but the silver fox refused to leave after finding it, Hansen explained. Queen took a closer look at the lotus and began to rest near it without responding. The next day, Queen asked Hansen, are you leaving? If the silver fox isn't leaving, then neither am I. Do you want to leave first? Hansen asked, blinking. If we meet again, we will split it in half. Queen looked at Hansen, but it didn't look like she wanted to leave. What half? It is a pet. You want to fight for food with a pet? Hansen's heart was saying no, and he was only pretending. If he eats it, I don't want it anymore. If you take it, I will accept half, Queen said. Why would I want it? This is for the silver fox. I am not a pet, I don't need it, Hansen told her, sharply. He was starting to feel a little annoyed. Queen didn't say much, and she remained near the silver fox, guarding the lotus. The silver fox was guarding it, which made me think I had a chance. But now there are two people guarding it. Hansen thought to himself. He was also starting to believe that the silver fox was a girl. Otherwise, why would it be behaving like Queen was? That was the only explanation for how selfish it was being. Hansen never thought about the possibility that he was more selfish than the silver fox and queen combined. They stayed on the island for four days. The snow-white flowers started to wilt, but they did so slowly. Only two petals fell off a day. Since there were so many, heaven only knew how long it would take for the entire thing to wilt. The lotus seeds on the inside were growing bigger, as well. They looked like blood crystals, and they continued to grow fuller. They emitted a pleasant fragrance, and smelling it brought comfort and relaxation to their minds. That must be some good stuff, but how can I take all the seeds without Queen and the Silver Fox noticing? Hansen watched the lotus intently each day, all the while fostering a plan to take it from the others. Hansen was not sure if he could beat them both, otherwise, he'd just grab it. Half a month later, the petals had all come off. The lotus itself was now like a plate. The blood crystal seeds were so round and full, they looked like rubies the size of a pigeon's egg. Hansen had yet to come up with an idea that would allow him to claim ownership of the seeds, but all of a sudden, he heard the shriek of a bird. He saw a green and bluish-colored bird that didn't look too far removed from a peacock. With no idea where it had come from, Hansen saw it fly madly around the sky, cawing as loudly as it could. It also seemed to be afraid of the three of them, which stayed its desire to come down. The silver fox now looked nervous. It stood up and looked at the peacock in the sky as if it were an enemy. Hansen and Queen were shocked. They understood that it was most likely a super creature, seeing as it paid little heed to the silver fox's presence. This made their faces bleak. The peacock continued to circle them in the sky, refusing to leave but neither did it want to come down. It seemed as if it was waiting for the seeds to ripen, just like they were. Where did that bird come from? Why would it be out here at sea? Hansen thought only the silver fox and queen were competing with him for the seeds. If things had remained that way, at least he had a fair chance of obtaining a few of them. But now with a super creature in the vicinity, who knew what might happen? Perhaps even the combination of Hansen and the Silver Fox wouldn't be enough to fight the super creature. While Hansen was feeling depressed amidst these thoughts, suddenly heard a sound at the seashore. Looking out to the ocean, he watched the waters boil. A lobster with a purple shell that was a dozen meters long emerged. It remained afloat for a brief while, summoning up tall waves. It then moved on to circle the island, without getting too close. Crap! Another one. How many creatures want these seeds? 
Hansen felt frustrated. He didn't know when and where another super creature might arise, but fortunately, no more decided to make an appearance. Aside from the peacock and lobster, there was no sign of another one coming to vie for their seeds. With one of them taking the sea and one of them taking the sky, it would be impossible for him to escape now. Let's fall back. If we get surrounded, there is nothing we can do to fight them, Queen calmly said. Silver Fox, come. Hansen shouted at the Silver Fox, with a tone of gravity. He was afraid if the Silver Fox stayed here to guard, he would quickly be overwhelmed by the two super creatures. Even though it was a super creature itself, its strength had limits. Luckily, the Silver Fox wasn't too stubborn. Despite its craving for the seeds, it still leapt into Hansen's arms when called. Hansen took a long sigh, and with Queen, ran off. They didn't draw near to the sea, either, so they tucked themselves into a hidden spot near the base of the hills. Shortly after they left, the peacock-looking bird swooped down to where they had been. The lobster also came ashore, madly snapping its pincers as it rapidly scuttled inland and up to the hill where the lotus resided. The war for the lotus had begun. After observing the lotus seeds, it seemed even the peacock acknowledged the fact that they weren't yet ripe. So, instead of waiting, the bird turned around and screamed at the lobster. The lobster, with its claws snapping, skittered towards the bird. Its large body and shell didn't seem to slow it down in the least. The peacock opened its wings and took off into the sky. It broadened its feather train like a fan in a display of hostility. Beneath its green plumage was a collage of impeccable eye spots that emitted a blue light. When Hansen looked into the eye spots that decorated the peacock, he felt dizzy. He almost felt as if he was going to faint. Don't look at its blue lights, Queen said, already having closed her eyes. Her purple light was swirling around inside her, signifying she had already activated her gene lock. Hansen did what she bid and also used his hands to cover the eyes of the silver fox, but still, the blue light somehow managed to pierce his eyelids. He quickly turned around and moved to hide behind a rock, which brought him instant relief. Queen hid behind a rock, as well, with neither of them opting to open their eyes for a second. For now, they could only rely on their ears. Hansen used jade skin to activate his gene lock, as it didn't require him to have his eyes open. With it, he could survey the entire area and reconstruct the entire scene without looking. The giant lobster looked drunk as it rampaged to the left and right in response to the peacock's blue light. With its foe affected so badly, the peacock found an opening for its attack. The lobster's shell was unbelievably sturdy. When the peacock feistily pecked it, the only damage it sustained was a white scratch mark. Hansen watched their combat in awe. While the lobster may have seemed to be at a great disadvantage, its shell proved to be a most hardy defense for it. The peacock couldn't do anything to hurt it. The blue light from the eye spots across the peacock's plumage continued to make the lobster dizzy, however. Without being able to deal damage, they both seemed to be at a stalemate. But still, they had both come here for the lotus seeds. If the peacock could keep the lobster suppressed long enough for the plant to fully mature, it could quickly grab the seeds, gobble them up, and fly away. All while the lobster continued flailing around as if it were blind. What should we do? Hansen asked himself. There is nothing we can do. The peacock's blue light makes others dizzy. Even if we closed our eyes and rushed in, our eyelids aren't strong enough to block out the light entirely. And how are we supposed to fight two super creatures with our eyes shut? We'd be stabbing in the dark, Queen replied. Hansen did not respond. He suddenly smelled something quite pleasant, and noticed it was coming from the lotus seeds. The lotus was starting to emit a red light, and a red fog crept out of it, masking the area in a red haze. As ominous as it looked, its scent was delightful, and strong enough to be smelled from every corner of the island. The seeds are about to mature. Hansen continued observing the fight between the peacock and lobster, still of a mind to get the seeds, before anyone else could. 
he couldn't wait until some time after they had matured because the monsters would be upon them, swallowing them all in one nibble. Compared to the size of the peacock and lobster, the seats weren't even big enough to get stuck in their teeth. The silver fox looked like it wanted to jump out of Han Sen's arms any second, and its ardent desire for the lotus seeds was readily apparent. However, when it opened its eyes to take a look, it quickly buried its head in Han Sen's chest. The blue light was an extreme deterrent. While Han Sen was wondering whether or not he should rush over there, an ill feeling swept over him. A noise came from the sea. Even more super creatures are coming? Han Shen wondered in annoyed bewilderment. Using his seventh sense, he quickly surveyed the seaside. What he saw frightened him a great deal. All around the island, a vast host of different creatures had come, all of the mind to grab the lotus seeds for themselves. There were giant fish, giant shrimps, and even monstrous clams. There were many more that Han Sen could not even describe. A large group of creatures marched their way inland in the direction of the lotus. Holy smokes? What are these lotus seeds? The pleasant smell even makes them ignore the silver fox's presence. Disregarding the existence of the super creatures on the island, they all seem intent on taking the lotus seeds for themselves. Han Sen was more than surprised. It was difficult to wrap his mind around what sort of substance would actually incite so many ordinary creatures to muster the sort of courage required to go up against super creatures. In the sky, many more sea birds and flying creatures appeared. Without fear, they swooped down for the lotus seeds, ignoring the presence of the super creatures that were locked in combat. But when they entered the zone that was bathed in the peacock's blue light, they all crashed to the ground. It seemed as if ordinary creatures could not withstand the light at all. More and more creatures arrived at the hill, only to die upon their immediate arrival. Some were killed by the light, others fell victim to the violent thrashing of the lobster and peacock. It wasn't long before a vast number of bodies had collected to build a hill of their own, one that was dyed red. Let's fall back, it's too dangerous here, Queen said, as she started to retreat from the scene. Hansen noticed the rapid advancement of the seed's maturity and didn't want to fall back empty-handed. After mulling over what to do for a good while, he passed the silver fox to Queen. Take him out of here, I will go and try for the seeds. But the silver fox jumped away, not wanting to leave either. His body was unable to even stand straight in the light, almost as intoxicated as the lobster. Although the light could not deal the silver fox damage, it would have been difficult for it to exert the strength needed to go up, get the seeds, and get out. You get out of here. Don't worry, I'll give you some of the seeds after I collect them, Hansen told the silver fox. The silver fox either did not hear him or was too stubborn to leave. It wanted to grab the lotus seeds, despite its incapacitation. Hansen grabbed the silver fox and forced it back. It was behaving like almost any other creature giving up everything it could to take the lotus seeds. The peacock and the lobster were still sealed in turbulent conflict with one another. If any other creature tried to ascend the hill, they would be killed in the midst of their battle. Winning the lotus seeds would be a most difficult prize. All of a sudden, from inside the lotus, a bright light burst forth. It was red, and it beamed into the sky, widening like the bloom of a flower itself. The pleasant scent carried across the entire sea, urging even more creatures to come and battle for it. The lotus was ripe. The creatures on the island were no longer intent on fighting each other. They each exerted all the strength they had in running up the hill to grab the seeds before the others could. The peacock was the closest, and with its boon of flight, spared no time in soaring there. Although Hansen really wanted to grab the lotus, he was slowed down by his need to prevent the silver fox from going out on its own. He missed his chance and was too late. As the peacock was about to peck and gobble the lotus plant, one blood crystal lotus seed appeared to crack open. More accurately, it looked as if the blood crystals were beginning to sprout two translucent wings, as thin as a cicada's. The wings started to flap, and they began flying away from the lotus cup. The flying lotus seeds suddenly smacked into the peacock's face, 
making the giant beast fall back, screaming in pain. After the slight hit, giant red blisters scorched its face. It continued to retreat, crying in agony as it did. Then it took off into the skies, flew away, and did not return. The lobster seemed to ignore what had happened to the peacock, and instead vied to take its place and eat the lotus. But in the next second, blood crystals went airborne once again. They rushed into the lobster's shell. The lobster roared deafeningly. After sustaining the hit, even the lobster decided to retreat. In an instant, it raced off, skittering back to the sea. Hansen was frozen in place, seeing that the red crystal-looking things were not actually lotus seeds. They were red wasps, shaped like little ruby gemstones. The end of each wasp had a lethal stinger. Hansen saw the wasps pierce the lobster's shell and peacock's feathers as if it were nothing. The massive blister that had emerged upon the peacock's face indicated how poisonous it was. To see super creatures like the peacock and lobster run off in fright sent a chill coursing down Hansen's spine. Now, he was glad he hadn't been able to get there before the other creatures. If he had been struck by one of those wasps, he'd have been in far worse shape. Many blood crystal wasps were now flying out from the lotus. Hansen wasn't sure if the plant itself that birthed the blood crystals, or if a mother wasp had recently planted the eggs. But no matter their origin, it was clearly a vicious trap, and it would yield him no benefit. Eighteen wasps now shot out of the lotus, carried by their delicate wings. The toxicity of their venom was as dangerous to an ordinary creature as it was to a super creature. The consequences of being stung were horrid. At first, a giant blister would form. Then, bones would turn to liquid. And finally, the body itself would inflate, growing larger and larger until it burst like a reservoir of pus and blood. When creatures were splashed with excess venom, although the effect it had on them was not as lethal as a straight-up sting, their bodies and faces were still left scorched with massive blisters. Run! Hansen grabbed the silver fox and ran off down to the beach. The blood crystal wasps were frighteningly quick, and Hansen had no idea whether or not his body could withstand their sting. Without the light of the peacock, the silver fox and queen were both able to open their eyes. The previously pleasant fragrance had grown lighter, and it seemed to snap all the creatures out of their prior days. In fear, everything now fled the vile trap of the wasps. With so many creatures strewn about dead and bloodied, the island looked like a snippet of hell itself. The creature death toll must have been immeasurable on this day. Two people and a fox ran towards the ocean. No creatures fought amidst themselves, or even thought about targeting the humans. Escape was the only goal on everything's mind at that moment. I thought I could reap some benefits from that lotus thingy, little did I know how big of a mistake I was about to make. Hansen felt like a fool. When he turned around to take a look at what was going on behind him, his jaw hit the ground. One of the wasps was headed in their direction. Like a red, blazing meteor, it was coming their way at a terrifying speed. When people are unlucky, they tend to choke when they drink water. With so many other creatures that are free for you to take, why the hell have you come for us? Hansen's heart was now stripped of all hope. Hansen's body steeled itself, blazing with all the power and might he had. His heart thumped like rhythmic thunder. As his seventh sense kicked itself onto a whole new level, his blood began to boil. Queen noticed Hansen was not any slower than she was, which surprised her. If Hansen hadn't unlocked his gene lock, there was no way he would have been able to keep up with her. But now was not the time to stop and question him over his deception. So she gritted her teeth and kept running as fast as she could. As they continued to run, she noticed Hansen was actually gaining speed. Soon, he had overtaken her. After a while, he was far ahead, she couldn't keep up with him. Hansen was also just noticing that his speed must have grown exponentially since he opened the gene lock. Although Jade Skin did not grant him the power to manipulate and wield ice, the amount of power he had gained seemed greater than what most people received after opening their gene lock. But his joy drained as he noticed the red wasp drawing nearer and nearer. 
Han Sen was positive that its target was the three of them. If they weren't its target, it wouldn't have followed them as much as it did. But Han Sen was not entirely sure which of the trio was its primary target. Was it him? Was it the silver fox? Or was it Queen? We should split up. Hansen yelled at Queen before going off in another direction. As he suspected, the wasp turned just as he did. Its target was indeed Hansen. Fudge. It really is coming for me, and the silver fox. Despite having expected it, Hansen couldn't but feel compelled to swear. The wasps were way too fast. Despite his breakneck speed, the wasp had now caught up to Hansen. The wasp made its first attack. With all his power, Hansen dodged it while still maintaining his speed. The blood crystal wasp was so small, it was difficult to keep track of it at the speed they were both going. If it wasn't for Hansen's incredible seventh sense, he'd have been an oversized blister already. Although he was having difficulty following the wasp with his eyes, he cast the Dong Xian Sutra and used his feelings to determine when and where the wasp would strike next. He successfully dodged each attempted sting. The silver fox, who was still nestled in Han Sen's chest, was quite alert. Thunder sparked in the wells of its eyes, but try as it might, the wasp was too quick for it to thunder shock. Han Sen was not sure how much longer he could go on. All he could do was keep dodging on his way to the beach. He had to get into the sea, no matter what. If other wasps decided to join the chase, it would all be over. It wouldn't matter how proficient he was at sensing their locations, dodging any more would prove too difficult. One more was all it would take to tip the scales. Dealing with this single wasp, Han Sen was already exhausting his unusual talents of intuition and judgment. He couldn't use his seventh sense to lock down the wasp now, either. Queen had already reached the ocean side when she saw Han Sen in the distance, having trouble with the wasp. Gritting her teeth, she summoned a throwing knife and threw it in his direction. But being unable to track the dizzyingly quick wasp, it was impossible to hit it. Hansen wanted to jump into the sea, but the blood crystal wasp prevented him from getting close enough. He had to dodge in according to the wasp's attacks, so he wasn't able to go where he wanted to. It did not matter what skills Hansen used or how wickedly fast they were. The wasp only had to flap its wings to destroy any plan Hansen devised. Hansen hadn't been stung yet, despite how long the wasp had been nipping at his heels. This surprised Queen. Queen, putting herself in his boots, believed she would have been stung a long time ago. Queen didn't think it was only his skills that let him dodge the attacks. It was more like Hansen had the ability to predict whatever his enemies were planning. Before the blood crystal wasp showed any indication of where and when it would strike, Han Sen was already moving to dodge it. If he was being purely reactionary, he wouldn't have had the time to dodge, no matter how quick he was. Instead, it was more like he had incredible foresight. Also, he wasn't casting any skills to do this. It was as if this was purely an inherent talent of his. Her guesses weren't far off the mark. Although Hansen hadn't totally unlocked his seventh sense, the powers of his other senses were already far better than they should have been. And just as she thought, the reason Hansen dodged so well was because he could read the wasp's mind and dodge before it started to strike. If it was anyone else, even if their speed and skills were superior to Hansen's, they would not have been able to dodge such ferocious attacks. Queen was aiming her throwing knife from afar and had been doing so for quite some time. Similarly to the silver fox, she just couldn't find the right opportunity to attack. She gritted her teeth, summoned a sacred blood shield, and went towards Hansen. Don't come. Hansen noticed Queen approaching, which surprised him. Although her heavenly go was a tremendous thing, it would still be futile against the speed of these wasps. Queen did not heed his command and instead continued her approach. After a while, she threw the shield out of her hand and yelled, Run! Hansen saw where the shield was headed, and that it was on a collision course with exactly where the wasp was attacking. He was taken aback at the realization of how well she could predict the movement of the wasp. You really are a queen. 
Hansen's heart was glad. He used the opening queen and her shield had provided and dove into the sea. Dong. But the wasp's attacks were like bullets, and it pierced right through the shield. Despite the sturdiness of her metal aegis, the wasp had not lost any momentum, and it still had Hansen in its sights. Ping. At that moment, Queen's other hand let fly a throwing knife. It smacked against the wasp's head. The throwing knife shattered into little more than cold, hard glitter. The strike had taken the wasp in the exact center of its head, but again, it did not slow down. It avoided the belt of shiny knife shards and continued its pursuit of Hansen. Using the time Queen had bought him, Hansen ran ten meters. But as he marked his tenth, the wasp had already caught up again. Hansen noticed something, though. Although the wasp could spike itself through the shield, and was somehow unaffected by a throwing knife to its head, it did seem keen on avoiding the airborne remnants of the knife. That didn't mean it was afraid of those shards. Some pieces did hit the creature, and they did not harm it. But there were some pieces it avoided. That suggested the wasp had some sort of weakness. Even though Han Sen was not facing the wasp, he could analyze every last detail of what occurred behind him through the power of his senses. Hansen saw that it only avoided the splinters around its waist. It was the area that connected the abdomen with the thorax. It was like a woman's waist where it was slimmest. When the shattered pieces neared that point, the wasp carefully swerved out of the way. The wasp did not care about any of the others and let them bounce off of itself. This is it. A strange look streaked through Hansen's eyes. Under the buffs imparted by Snow Lady, his body started to release an air that purified Hansen's mind, clearing it like a virgin crystal. With the absence of human emotions, he had become fearless. All of a sudden, Hansen stopped moving and looked at the wasp that hunted him. What are you doing? Queen was surprised. The wasp was frighteningly powerful, and it looked like Hansen was preparing to fight it. Did he have a death wish? But what happened next made Queen's pupil shrink. The wasp flashed in front of Han Senator Queen didn't see where it tried to sting, but Han Sen's hand was moving. It was unbelievable. His hand moved like a blade, with the speed of lightning. Han Sen swung his hand horizontally, slicing the wasp's waist as it came for him. Her one-time use sacred blood weapon did not phase the wasp in the slightest, but the wasp swerved to dodge Han Sen's attack. Hansen missed his strike, but it confirmed that the wasp's waist must indeed have been its weak spot. There was no need for him to dodge and be afraid any more. While Hansen was falling back, he kept trying to stop the wasp. The maniacal little creature did its best to keep dodging Hansen's flurry of attacks, but so quick and fast did they come, it was never provided the opportunity to counter them. Hansen had given himself the chance to breathe and he continued his retreat towards the sea. Queen was already in the water, however. She only kept her head above the surface to watch Han Sen, who was still engaged with the wasp. The speed of Han Sen's attacks couldn't quite match the speed of the wasp, but Queen was still fascinated by the spectacle. He wasn't using any sort of formation. He was employing a high-tier prediction ability. As Queen watched the battle between Han Sen and the Wasp, she felt something in her heart. She couldn't quite put her finger on what it was, but it felt like an itch. Splash! Han Sen was finally able to jump into the sea. The Wasp was more afraid of the water than the White Tiger had been, and without similar abilities, it couldn't do anything to Han Sen once he was under the surface. Not wanting to follow Han Sen in, it flew around the shore in circles for a brief while and then buzzed on back to the deeper recesses of the island, chasing after creatures that hadn't returned to the sea yet. You hit it well. After they escaped their dangerous predicament, Queen confronted Han Sen with frosty eyes. Cough. Oh, I only just unlocked the gene lock. I was forced to use it, due to it being a life or death moment. Desperate times call for desperate measures. Han Sen laughed after his explanation, realizing that he couldn't hide his unlocked gene lock from Queen any longer. Queen rolled her eyes, unable to muster the strength needed to argue with him. 
she summoned her whale and climbed aboard. Thanks. Hansen thanked her with sincerity, jumping onto the whale with the silver fox in hand. If it wasn't for Queen's attack, which revealed the wasp's weak spot, he didn't think he'd be where he was right now. This bloodscale armor is mine, okay? Now we are even. Queen frowned, looking back at the island. There was no more screaming or squealing to be heard, and with the rest of the creatures having either escaped or been killed, the island was quiet. It still looked like hell, though. Bodies and blood were everywhere, and just looking at it made their skin crawl. Do you think you might be able to take down those wasps? Queen asked Hansen. Hansen knew what she meant, but he shook his head and told her, my speed is still a little too slow to go up against those wasps. I may know its weak spot, but what's the point if I cannot hit it? Besides. Besides what? Queen looked at Hansen. There is no guarantee I can kill it, even if I hit there. For all I know, I might only inflict a minor amount of damage. Hansen did not overestimate his talents. When he fought Golden Growler, he couldn't even break its eyes. The wasp's waist may have been its weak spot, but it couldn't be weaker than those eyes. A weak spot was just a place on a monster that was weaker. But the overall fitness of a super creature was just too high, and so the fact that it had a weak spot didn't mean much for Hansen. Queen sighed. She understood how he was feeling. There were eighteen of those wasps, and they had a lot of trouble escaping just one. It would be impossible to survive an encounter with any more, not to mention if all eighteen came after them. Few people could dodge their attacks like Hansen had. Even Queen wasn't entirely sure whether or not she'd be able to keep up and evade such quick attacks. The island was dead. They watched it for a while but knew that there was no hope of returning there. They readied themselves to leave and take to the seas on the whale again. But then the silver fox jumped out of Hansen's arms. It became a silver light and ran back to the island. Silver fox? What are you doing? Hansen was startled. It hadn't been easy to escape the island, so why was the fox now deciding to return? Stop. The eighteen wasps must be together by now. If we get in trouble with all of them, we'll never make it out again, Queen said. You wait here. I'll go back and get him. Hansen rushed back ashore without hesitation. He wasn't planning to risk his life for the silver fox, but he understood the silver fox well. He knew that it wouldn't want to risk its own life either. Otherwise, when Hansen was battling the wasps, the silver fox wouldn't have jumped into his arms to escape. It wouldn't have waited this long to come back, if it had no regard for its life. Something must have changed on the island, then. Hansen chased after the silver fox, and noticed he was being led back to the lotus. Still, he did not hesitate and quickly continued his pursuit. Hansen, using his senses, noticed there were no longer any wasps on the island. Did those wasps leave the island? Hansen asked himself, looking puzzled. But Hansen was still curious. If the wasps had left the island, then that meant the lotus plant was nothing special, and it had just been used to host a number of wasp eggs. If there was nothing extraordinary about the plant, why were they returning? Is there something the silver fox wants from the body of a deceased creature? Hansen wondered, having now reached the lotus hill with the silver fox. The scenery was marred with great horrors. Uncaring for the bodies that littered the once fertile green, Hansen hastily climbed up to the lotus. Perhaps it was because of the strength of their toxins, but after the wasps were born, the seven remaining lotus petals had wilted. All that remained was a sole lotus cup. Without a moment's pause, the silver fox ran up to it and munched it all down in one bite. The crystal clear lotus cup was chewed to pieces by the fox. Save me some. Save me some. Hansen grabbed the silver fox as he tried to pry open its mouth. Alas, the silver fox had already swallowed it all. Damn it, you mutt. You are too cruel. I just saved your life earlier. You little selfish bastard, you didn't even save me a bite. 
Hansen yelled at the silver fox. The silver fox, however, ignored its master. Elegantly, it sniffed around on the ground, and after a while of doing so, began digging into the rocky ground with its two front paws. The rock surface was like tofu under the power of its paws and claws, and it wasn't long before it had managed to dig a two-meter-deep hole. Is there something down there? Hansen quelled his rage, and his eyes lit up with inquisitiveness. He saw that there was something connected with the stalk of the lotus plant. As the silver fox continued to dig, Hansen noticed the unearthing of something white in color. Whatever it is, you've done your bit. You've earned yourself a rest, let me take over. Hansen quickly jumped into the hole and placed the silver fox on his shoulder. He rapidly started digging with his own two hands. He was afraid the silver fox would dig out some more food and gobble it all up without giving him a chance to even look at it. He didn't want a repeat of what had just happened. Hansen did not dig for long because he had soon excavated three lotus roots. They were like the arms of a baby, and they were each about a dozen centimeters long. Although they were underground, they still shone like white crystals. It was as if they were made from virgin snow. They smelled very good, too. Hansen picked up the three lotus roots to take a closer look, but before he could, the silver fox on his shoulder jumped down and grabbed one of the three. Immediately, it began to ravenously chew the root. How could I forget about this guy? This thing is a sneaky manipulator. I really do keep forgetting. Hansen's heart was bleeding. He didn't even know what treasure he had unearthed, and a third of it was already munched on by the silver fox. What's left is mine. You've already had your fill. Seeing the silver fox stare at the lotus roots intently, Hansen clutched the remaining two tightly. The silver fox went near Hansen's foot and began rubbing its head against him. Don't even bother trying to act cute. This thing is mine, end of story. Hansen quickly put away the lotus roots and picked the silver fox back up. Queen had now come ashore and was nearing the hill. Hansen quickly ran back down to meet her, with the silver fox in hand. He didn't want her to learn anything about what he had just found. I don't know where the wasps went, but it looks like they have all gone, Hansen said, as he stood in front of Queen. What did it find? Queen asked, seeing right through Hansen's deception. It was the lotus cup. But, by the time I caught up to the fiend, it had already eaten everything. He didn't save me any, so I have no idea what benefits it could have provided us. His selfishness hurts. Hansen hoped to squeeze out a few tears, but he couldn't. Queen's eyes were untrusting, but she didn't voice her concern. Shortly after, they returned to the ocean side. The two people and the fox began their journey once more. They hoped they'd soon be able to find land, but after another five days' travel, they had yet to see anything. There weren't even any islands around. Suddenly, a strange sound could be heard in the distance. Hansen and Queen were familiar with the sound, and so their faces changed. Hansen recognized the sound as belonging to the peacock they encountered earlier, which had received a nasty sting on its face. It flew far away after that, and they didn't think they'd run into it again so soon. Its screams are ones of pain and suffering. Is it because of the poison? Queen asked, looking in the direction the squeals were coming from. If it really was due to the poison, it would be the perfect opportunity for humans to take down a super creature. The first in history. Let's go find out. Hansen's face was vibrant with excitement and he looked genuinely happy at the prospect. If he could hunt down a super creature with minimal effort, even if he did not receive a beast soul, eating its meat would be good enough. They looked at each other and understood what they were each thinking. Queen commanded the big whale to start sailing in the direction of the screeching peacock. The bird screamed so loud, it seemed like it could shatter the atmosphere. The creatures around looked terrified, and those that flew in the sky seemed to avoid it at all costs. They sailed another forty miles before seeing an island on the horizon. It was surprisingly small, not any bigger than a protruding reef. The peacock was standing on the reef with a rotten face. 
It was red with infected blisters, and pus and blood oozed from its wounds. It must really be the poison, still working its wretched magic, Hansen said, aghast. He was happy that the peacock was in such a condition, obviously still struggling against the poison that blighted it. But he was concerned over whether or not he could eat the meat, seeing how effective and long-lasting the poison was. Queen commanded the whale to stop a good distance from the bird. She didn't want to go in blindly. And even though the super-creature was in significant pain, it was still a super-creature. They may very well not be able to slay it, even still. They weren't entirely sure how ill the peacock was, and they'd probably meet an unfortunate end if they marched in without a clue. It can still scream a good deal. It is most likely still quite energized. Perhaps we should wait here for a few days and see how it goes? Hansen suggested. The longer they waited, the weaker the bird would become. If they were going to risk their lives in an attempt to bring down a poison super creature, it would be better to do it later rather than sooner. But right after Hansen said that, the sea near the reef began spitting waves that were a few dozen meters tall. A giant purple creature with metal pincers came out from beneath the murky waves. Its target was most definitely the peacock. The giant purple lobster was back. Not having received any benefits from the island earlier, it seemed to want to exact vengeance on the wounded peacock that had bullied it previously. The peacock was poisoned right in the face, and it looked like the toxins had affected its brain. It didn't seem as smart or reactive as it had before. Already, the lobster managed to clamp down on one of its wings. It was impossible for the peacock to free itself from the lobster's grip. It flapped its wings the best it could, but could not escape. The more it flailed, the more feathers its wings dropped. The peacock was infuriated. It opened its feather train to reveal its blue eye spots and doused the area in its intoxicating blue light. Just like before, the lobster was made to appear drunk. It seemed as if the lobster knew this was coming, though, so it continued to maintain its grip on the peacock's wing. No matter how fiercely the peacock tried to repel its attacker, the lobster would not be loosened. The lobster's shell was too hard, as well. There was nothing the peacock could do. Eventually, its clutched wing began to bleed, and plumes of feathers danced in the air around it, cushioning the harsh sea. While both of these monsters fought, Queen closed her eyes and turned around to avoid the effects of the blue light. Although it was a good distance from them, the light was powerful and it spread far. Looking at it for one second could make them feel dizzy, and out at sea, there was the chance Queen could fall overboard and drown. Hansen appeared to be doing the same thing, but he activated his gene lock. With his senses, he didn't even have to face their direction to observe everything that was happening. The peacock may be an extremely powerful foe, but under the effects of that poisonous sting and the lobster's pummeling, it must assuredly be close to death, Hansen thought. He then proceeded to wonder how he might benefit from this situation. The reef began to crack and the waves boiled in the turmoil of combat. The reef was unable to sustain the weight of the monsters and it began to crumble. The lobster's shell was obscenely sturdy, and the lobster tried to drag the peacock down into the briny depths with its pincers. All the peacock could do was continue to peck at the shell, to no avail. Although the peacock was resisting, a collapse of the reef meant a guaranteed watery grave for it. How come that lobster didn't get poisoned, too? Hansen thought to himself. But seeing what was occurring, it was a good thing they did not rush into attack as they initially thought to. If they hadn't stayed back, they might have been killed by the lobster's incursion. Boom. Three hours later, the reef collapsed and the peacock went down with it. Although the peacock continued to emit its beams of drowsy light, it wasn't as effective as it was earlier. It did not affect Hansen and Queen as much. Queen turned around and looked into the sea. She saw the faint glimmer of blue light and a sea that was made mad with the peacock's wild thrashing. Great waves collided with each other, above where it sunk to its inevitable demise. What a horrible creature. It would have been too difficult for us to fight it, Queen said with a sigh. It would have been impossible for us to kill it, yes. But now we have a chance. 
Han Sen watched the restless waves with greedy eyes. They may not have been able to kill the poison peacock, but it had been attacked by the lobster and dragged deep down into the sea. It was going to die, no matter what. Perhaps this was his opportunity for an easy kill. But still, Han Sen did not dare try to steal the lobster's prey directly. He lacked the strength and he knew it. But if he did it quickly, there was a chance he could receive the beast's soul. What are you doing? Queen frowned as she looked at Han Sen. Wait here, okay? After speaking, Han Sen quickly dove into the sea. The silver fox was still on Han Sen's shoulder. It used its paws to grab a hold of his neck, and it dove in with him. Because the two monsters were still twirling about in the sea, the underwater currents were a little unpredictable. Every now and again, Han Sen would be sent spinning around due to mad fluctuations in the flow. He actually found it difficult to swim right. It was fortunate he could breathe underwater. Because of this, he did not have to fear drowning. The only issue was the fact he was swimming slower than he would have liked. The lobster was trying its best to drag the peacock into the deeper recesses of the sea. Although the peacock tried to resist, it was futile. The lobster was getting its way, and deeper and deeper they went. Hansen chased both creatures down into the darker waters. He watched what was happening intently, biding his time for the perfect opportunity to strike. Although the peacock was not accomplished in underwater battle, it still kicked fairly well. It did not look as if it was going to be killed by the lobster anytime soon. Hansen pursued the lobster, which had reached a depth of over 1,000 meters. The blue light of the peacock continued to grow dimmer and dimmer, a sure sign that it was dying. Its wings had been broken by the lobster's pincers. Blood seeped into the ocean from the torn flesh, coloring the area in a red haze. Hansen could only see the peacock when its blue lights flickered. The peacock's face was rotten. Its flesh had been stripped and melted away, which exposed parts of its skull. All across its body, its once pleasant mane of graceful feathers had been shredded to tatters. Its train in the back had been mangled by the cruel ferocity of the lobster. The peacock that had looked fine and proud back on the island was now uglier than a skinned chicken. It looks like having a high defense is a worthier investment. It seemed to pay off for the lobster, in beating this week's nemesis, Hansen thought to himself. Although the peacock was powerful, its power wasn't enough to compete with the hardy lobster. The lobster was not Han Sen's focus. The peacock super creature was only able to leave shallow scratch marks upon its shell, with the lobster being that strong, he didn't want to risk becoming its next potential target. Even if he used in force, he doubted it would do much. Seeing that the peacock was dying, Han Sen dove in after it. The murky blood that tainted the waters helped to mask his chase. Hansen was now about 10 meters away from them. The lobster was happily toying with the peacock's near lifeless body, unaware that it was being watched. The peacock lacked the strength to fight back. Its eyes were white and it was starting to drown. It only reacted when the lobster made another cruel dig into its flesh. Hansen summoned his mascot beast sword and held it tight. This was a berserk sacred blood beast soul sword, if he could inflict one mighty blow upon the peacock's weakest point, he might be able to end its life for good. The weak point Hansen was referring to was the most grievous of the wounds inflicted by the lobster. Hansen positioned himself carefully. He could not allow the lobster to become aware of his intrusion, but he had to get as close to the peacock as he possibly could. After thorough observation of the peacock's current state, he considered a number of wounds he might go for. But whichever he chose, he'd only have one chance to ensure the kill. Once he attacked, the lobster that was jovially munching its prey would be alerted to his presence. There would be no retries. The wound on the peacock's wing was the most severe. But even if he attacked there, it wasn't a deadly, critical location. Although the peacock looked utterly ravaged, its wounds were greater than the sum of their parts. None were truly grievous on their own. From the way things looked, the peacock's cause of death would be drowning. 
The wounds themselves weren't enough to stop its body from operating or make it bleed to death. Hansen continued to watch. If he wanted to slay the peacock in one fell swoop, the most viable location he could strike would be the wound left by the wasp. The peacock's face was a rotten mess. Blood plasma leaked from its eyes, indicating that its brain had been ravaged by the poison. Hansen carefully avoided the plasma that merged with the sea. Although it was similar to the blood, the plasma solidified in the water. It didn't merge and discolor the water as the red blood did. Hansen camouflaged himself in the clouds of blood and managed to sneak around behind the peacock's body. The big lobster was still snacking on its feathered foe and was not aware of Hansen's presence. Hansen was beginning to feel excited. If he was discovered, he'd have no choice but to fall back, for there would be no way he could battle a lobster deep down in its own domain, the sea. Although the lobster was not as scary as the wasp, the lobster's shell made it invulnerable to him in his current state. Furthermore, despite being an avid, extremely dexterous swimmer, there was no doubt that the lobster would be considerably faster than he was. He did not dare upset it. If they were on land, then maybe he'd have a chance to fight back. He wouldn't down here, though. Hansen could only pray that he would not be discovered. Fortunately, luck was on Hansen's side. He had managed to get up close to the peacock's side without the lobster noticing. If he wanted to attack the peacock's eyes, he'd have trouble. The lobster was facing that direction, so he'd definitely be seen. Hansen stuck close to the peacock's body for a while, waiting for the perfect opportunity. Alas, it never came. After biding his time for a while longer, the chance he was waiting for still never came. But now he was running out of time, for the peacock looked like it was starting to give up the ghost. Its head bobbed in the water and its body was twitching more and more faintly after each bite the lobster took. No. I cannot wait any longer. If I do, the peacock will die. This is a risk I'm going to have to take. Hansen gritted his teeth, held his mascot beast sword and stared at the bobbing head. He cast Heresy Mantra and the Jade Sun Force. With his heart like a generator and his kidneys kicking into overdrive, he was endowed with an infinite reserve of power. His power was at max capacity, and he was raring to go. Hansen chose not to transform into Snow Lady. He decided to use Fairy Queen. But he needed greater clarity of vision to more properly analyze the peacock's head and the lobster's movements. He used his remarkable senses and gathered a granularly detailed overview of the scene so he could predict every single possibility. To strike like this would definitely draw the lobster's attention. And after that, he could only flee. Hansen's life hinged on whether or not he could escape the lobster's pursuit, therefore, he could not make a single mistake. He couldn't afford to be careless. But then an opportunity presented itself. Without letting it pass him by, he leapt into action. He swam straight to the peacock's head like a torpedo, sword in hand and ready to strike. The moment Hansen made his move, the lobster became aware. The pincers that were working on dismembering the peacock's battered body now turned their attention to Hansen. Hansen's eyes looked cold. Ever since he unlocked his gene lock with jade skin, he could become emotionless and unafraid of death at will. The lobster's pincers were too quick. He knew if he continued his attack on the peacock, he would be unable to dodge its claws. If Hansen ran away now, however, he wouldn't be given a second chance to kill the peacock. His eyes looked different. The ancient mascot beast sword plunged itself into the peacock's eye repeatedly, and at the same time, he summoned his golden armor and the gargoyle glyph. With his other hand, he attempted to stop the pincer. Squelch. The mascot beast sword was driven deep into the peacock's eye, all four feet of its blade. There was no resistance. But at the same time, the big purple pincer of the lobster came bearing down on Han Senator, he slapped it. Pang. Hansen's hand was knocked back into his own chest. Coughing blood, he was launched like a cannonball a few dozen meters in the sea. Hansen's palm was nodding force and yang force. 
If it was, he'd have been shaken to death by the lobster's horrible power. Master Discharge Hansen had learned this skill to discharge power. He didn't employ any anti-seismic techniques, but instead borrowed the strength of the lobster to go flying a few dozen meters through the sea. The power of the lobster was way too strong. Although he had absorbed a considerable deal of the power unleashed onto him, he still felt as if his ribs and organs had been damaged. Blood spat out from his mouth, resembling red flowers in the sea. But simply hearing the notification ring in his head made him supremely happy. Super Creature Hunted, Dead Eye Peacock The beast soul has been acquired. Consume its flesh to obtain a random numeric amount of super geno points, ranging from 0 to 10. But now was not the time for Hansen to admire his deed and celebrate his acquisition of a super beast soul. He held on to the pain in his chest and swam upwards. If he reached the surface, he would live. Although the lobster was massive, it was a sea creature. Hansen could fly, so if he managed to get airborne, there was nothing the lobster could do. Hansen had made the lobster furious. The beast grabbed a hold of the peacock's lifeless body and launched itself towards Han Senator in an instant, it had almost caught up. Silver Fox, if you don't do anything, we're both going to die here. Hansen's heart was screaming with alarm as he patted the silver fox's head to show some anxiety. The silver fox looked confused. But then, a silver lightning flickered in its eyes, and it jumped away from Hansen's shoulder. It swam between its master and the rampaging lobster and unleashed a scary silver light. In a moment, the silver light had expanded and weaved its way across the entire area like a net. Ah! Hansen screamed. The silver fox didn't just attack the lobster, it attacked Hansen, too. The silver lightning spread through the water, as if it did not care who was friend or foe. Hansen's hair stood up with the shock and more blood oozed from his mouth. Now Hansen knew why the silver fox hadn't already used his silver lightning. The first thing it would kill wasn't the lobster, but Hansen himself. The lobster received a shock from the lightning, which just angered it further. With rage, it turned its attention to attack the silver fox. But before it could be nabbed, the silver critter turned to swim away and sped off quickly. Its swimming speed was greater than Hansen's. Seeing that the lobster was attracted to the silver fox gave Hansen some relief, but it worried him as well. He feared that if the lobster caught up, it could very well kill the silver fox. The silver fox was still young, so there was no way its strength would be greater than the lobster's. The silver lightning that it cast only subdued the lobster for a few brief seconds, its effect wasn't as strong as the blue light from the peacock had been. Even though the fox's speed was greater than Hansen's, it wasn't enough to outpace the lobster. In the blink of an eye the pursuer jumped forward, almost as if it teleported, in front of the silver fox. Boom! The silver fox's silver lightning was unleashed once again, which painted the sea like a canvas of countless thunderbolts. It shocked the lobster directly in front of him. In the time it was shocked and made immobile, the silver fox managed to get ahead once again and gain some distance from the lobster. The power of the lightning was not enough to damage the lobster, but it was enough to stun it for a brief while. And now, it had already caught up again. The silver fox repeated his previous move of unleashing silver lightning, but this time, its intensity wasn't nearly as high. It was because of this, the lobster wasn't stunned nearly as effectively. When the lobster caught up to the silver fox, the third time, the lightning could not stun it. Following the weakened discharge, a purple pincer came bearing down on the silver fox. The silver fox bravely dodged the clinch of its pursuer's pincers, but it still suffered a hearty jab and was sent careering through the water. With its small body, it was not dissimilar to a cannonball, surrounded by bubbles. Hansen bit down on his teeth and summoned his golden rock worm king and its berserk super pet armor. He threw the worm king in front of the silver fox as the lobster raced forward to finish it off. Pang! The golden rock worm king, wearing the berserk super pet armor, lasted a mere three seconds after it found itself between the crushing force of the lobster's pincers. 
Being unable to fight back, it was cut in half and cast away, destroying the beast's soul forever. But with the time its sacrifice bought, the silver fox managed to claw its way another few dozen meters in a bid to reach the surface. Hansen swam as quickly as he could, too. He may have been able to use the golden rockworm king and pet armor to save the silver fox this time, but now that it was gone, there wouldn't be a second opportunity. If he summoned Meowth without the berserk super pet armor, it wouldn't even be able to block the force of a hit or claw of the menacing lobster. It most likely wouldn't even buy a millisecond for the silver fox. My poor golden rockworm king and super pet armor. You have been with me for the longest time, surviving so many battles. I can't believe you were killed by this damn lobster. Do not worry, for I will avenge your death. One day, I will slay this lobster and cook it for a grand feast in your honor. I'll leave some upon your grave, too. Hansen was as angry as he was upset, and so he tried to console himself. There was still a chance they could escape, however. But now the lobster had caught up with the silver fox again. Hansen wasn't sure whether or not it was the silver fox's lightning that attracted the lobster's aggro, or if just wanted to hunt another super creature instead of a human. Seeing the lobster right on the silver fox's heels again made Hansen worry. Even if he tried to help, whatever efforts he made would be futile. There was nothing he could do, nor was there anything he could use to block the lobster for a short while. All of a sudden, the silver fox flashed with silver light again. There was even lightning coursing through his fur. It looked as if an extra powerful thunderbolt had been cooking inside his body. The lobster was directly in front of the silver fox again, its pincers raised as if ready to cut another victim in half. Boom! Silver lightning erupted from the silver fox like a barrage of rockets. Its little body accelerated with the sheer force of the attack, and it was sent shooting out of the sea, freeing itself from the lobster's aggression. It was sent a whole 600 meters. Holy smokes! Hansen froze, not having expected the silver fox to possess that ability. But now that the silver fox was gone, that made Hansen the lobster's target once more. Hansen did not say anything more and instead focused on trying to save himself by swimming as fast as he could. Fortunately, the silver fox had already drawn the lobster a good distance away, which gave him a head start. What the heck? If I knew it was planning that, I would have gone much earlier. Hansen's heart soured, only being able to flee for his life. He prayed he'd be able to escape the sea before the lobster caught up. Hansen wished he could grow a few extra arms and legs so he could swim with greater speed. With the lobster swimming a few dozen meters every second, it may as well have possessed the ability to teleport. It made Hansen bitter. Come on, just a little quicker, and I'll be out of here. Hansen saw the light above grow brighter and brighter. But as he did, the lobster was getting closer and closer. The possibility of the lobster getting to him before he could escape was still all too real. The lobster was directly behind Hansen, with its pincers gnashing for his blood. Hansen knew he could no longer dodge, as he couldn't afford to sacrifice the lead he had gained. If he couldn't hold on to it, he'd be dead before he reached the surface. He clutched his chest as his blood boiled in the tension. Hansen was only wearing his fairy queen armor, and he knew he couldn't risk being hit. Hansen summoned his bird, two meters tall and with four wings, in front of him. Catcha! The sacred blood class four-wing thunderbird was crushed into pieces by the lobster's pincers. Hansen used this time to reach the surface, summon his wings, and fly off into the sky. Flying forty meters high, he suddenly heard a great splashing sound. The giant lobster leapt out of the sea and was now soaring through the air in a final bid to grab Hansen. The speed of the berserk sacred blood wings was not faster than the airborne lobster, and it was sure to catch Hansen as he flew. So, Hansen's legs erupted with an incredible power. He borrowed the strength of the air and dashed two meters to the side. The pincer only just missed him. Boom! The lobster fell back down, triggering a tsunami of a wave like a meteor, crashing into the sea. 
Without hesitating, Hansen continued to fly higher and higher. The lobster swam around for a while, eyeing him, but after realizing it could no longer capture its intruder, it grabbed the peacock's body and returned to the deep sea. Queen flapped her wings, with the silver fox in her arms. The silver fox didn't seem to be doing so well, and looked incredibly weak. When Hansen returned to them, it leapt onto his shoulder and stayed there, unmoving. Hansen opened his mouth and coughed up blood. His organs had been damaged badly, and he feared it would take a long time to recover after this. Go. Hansen gritted his teeth as he held his chest, which pounded with an unbearable pain. He left the area with Queen and when they were clear, she summoned the whale so that Hansen could lie down and rest. Hansen was lying on the big whale's back. The silver fox dug its head into Hansen's arms. He didn't know what it was doing at first, but it wasn't long before the silver fox pulled out his lotus roots. Immediately, the silver fox started chewing one up. Silver fox, you are heartless. I have been grievously wounded, and yet you rob me blind. Hansen was disheartened, but he couldn't muster the strength to yell at the silver fox. The next second, Hansen was frozen. After the silver fox chewed the lotus root, he did not swallow it for himself. Rather, he fed it to Hansen. Hansen was surprised to see him not eat it for himself. He was feeding Hansen, and it touched him deeply. But he did feel uncomfortable eating food that had been chewed up by his pet. He almost thought of rejecting it, but the lotus root had been ground into juice and it dribbled into Hansen's mouth. Hansen knew he had risked his life to retrieve the lotus roots, so he thought it'd be a waste to spit it out. Without thinking about it too much, he accepted it all. After consuming it, he felt a refreshing and rejuvenating aura emanate from deep inside his body. The burning pain in his chest felt better and his pounding heart relaxed. Hansen quickly ran his Dongxian Sutra. He absorbed this new, refreshing power. His jade skin was limited by his fitness level, which meant he could only unlock the first tier. Unlocking the second would be impossible during his time in the second god sanctuary. That was why, recently, he had been more focused on improving his Dongxian Sutra, as opposed to his jade skin. Dongxian Sutra had an amazing effect whilst you breathed, wherein the metabolism of cells ran quicker. Now, the damaged parts of his body were being renewed, and newborn cells replaced the old, harmed ones. It was enabling him to recover from his wounds much faster. The refreshing air must have had a really effective power. Otherwise, his Dongxian Sutra would not have healed him so well. Every bit of his new, refreshed feeling was absorbed by the Dongxian Sutra and his body now looked white and silky. He smelled like a newborn baby, he smelled good. The silver fox lay down next to Han Sen, sniffing his master's new, fresher scent. He seemed to enjoy it. Queen noticed the two lotus roots and immediately acknowledged where they came from. But seeing the silver fox feed Han Sen made her observe him with a greater curiosity. Earlier, Han Sen was heavily injured. His face looked ill and his skin was pale. But now, not long after, his face was looking better. The color of his complexion returned and his skin seemed to radiate. It was silky smooth, too. Your face is white, but it looks a little red. It's quite special. Seeing Hansen, Queen couldn't help but say something cheesy. When she looked at Hansen, she thought this new image suited him. Hansen's face was rather firmly shaped and its structure was sharp. It often made him look mad, even when he wasn't. But with this new smooth skin, it portrayed him in a different light. He gave off a different feel. Queen felt a little jealous since she wasn't a person who cared much about her appearance. This must be the effect of a hypergeno art. Or is it an effect of the lotus root? Queen thought to herself. All of a sudden, a pleasant fragrance tickled Queen's nose. It made her feel as if she had eaten life fruit. The pores across her body all opened. What's going on? Queen looked at Han Sen with a puzzled expression. After she smelled the pleasant scent, the heavenly go in her body activated. 
It then seemed to be absorbing the fragrance. Queen felt incredible. She had never guessed there was a smell that could trigger heavenly go. If she hadn't been experiencing it at that moment, even if others told her, she would not have believed it to be true. The scariest thing with that smell, however, was how it seemed to be improving her heavenly go. It had been a long time since she made progress with the ability, yet now she was, entirely passively. Although she did not know what was going on, she did not let this opportunity pass her by. She quickly sat down by Han Sen's side and started absorbing as much of the smell as she could to take her heavenly go even further. The purple light in her body continued to glow, absorbing the fragrance that was all around. Eventually, even her purple light seemed to smell good. The way Queen presented herself often made her seem cold, but now she became prettier to look at. She resembled a fairy, minus all the glitter. She looked stunning, like someone no one could ever dare dream of hurting. The lotus roots must have been extremely beneficial to women, and they possessed a rather cold trait. Although men benefited from them, women would benefit more. The two lotus roots were most certainly not something ordinary. Their medical properties were incredibly strong. Han Sen absorbed them through his Dan Xian Sutra, and it helped his training a considerable amount. The Dan Xian Sutra absorbed the essence of the lotus roots into the body's cells. It generated new cells faster, pushing the old and damaged ones away at a hastened rate. All the while, the proficiency of the Dan Xian Sutra improved. The constant improvements of the Dan Xian Sutra made Han Sen smell nicer and nicer. The fragrance that graced him was strong, but it wasn't overwhelming. Han Sen did not know why the Dan Xian Sutra would make him smell nice, or exactly what benefits it provided. But whenever he trained it, there it was. As he lay there, the Dan Xian Sutra generated the pleasant scent just as it usually did. At the time, he didn't think anything of it. But when Queen absorbed the fragrance, however, her heavenly go made some progress. Queen's heart was too shocked to say much of anything. All it took was a quick sniff of Han Sen's delightful smell for her heavenly go to improve, it was unbelievable. When the essence of the lotus root was completely absorbed, Han Sen's wounds were fully healed. He felt supremely energized, as if he could go around punching cows to death. He opened his eyes and saw Queen training. He was surprised, because her body was surrounded by a yellow light. She was beautiful, quite reminiscent of a moon fairy. It was strange, though, for a fragrance seemed to permeate the air around her. It was not the ordinary scent of a woman, and it was vaguely familiar. He moved closer to get a finer whiff and that's when it hit him. Queen, although not as strongly, was smelling just like he did. As Hansen watched her, a strange feeling developed. He felt as if he could see the flow of Queen's body and witness the changes going on inside her at a granular level. But that was impossible. She was still wearing her bloodscale armor, and it wasn't as if Han Sen had X-ray vision. Even if he did have X-ray vision, the changes of a person's flow could not be seen by the human eye. Yet that was exactly what Han Sen was seeing. It was a peculiar sight. For the Qigong that Queen was training lay naked for Hansen to see. He could examine every little thing and observe every tiny detail, there was nothing hidden and nothing more secret. Hansen was taken aback. With this skill, even if he did not know it fully, he could follow what he was seeing and eventually learn the Qigong that she was in the midst of practicing. Hansen was lost in deep thought. When he came to, it was only then that he noticed he was not observing Queen's flow with his eyes. Smell. It must be her smell. Hansen was surprised. It was the smell that was tracing Queen's Qigong. Hansen could smell that fragrance all around, and through that, he was able to follow the flow inside Queen's body. What's going on, I wonder? Is this another amazing facet of the Dongxian Sutra? Hansen gave Queen a complicated look. That meant the heavenly go that was meant to be so secretive, no longer was. He could observe every last detail of it. Before Hansen could finish thinking, though, he felt his body's Dongxian Sutra running. 
It was treading a different path to that which it normally did, and it drifted to accompany Queen's flow. It was only then that he noticed it was copying Heavenly Go. The flow of Han Sen's body felt connected with Queen's smell. It was in sync with her, and it allowed him to understand Heavenly Go more than ever before. If Queen found out I stole her Heavenly Go this way, would she kill me? Han Sen had a wry smile unfurl in his heart. Queen's Heavenly Go continued to run, which led to some progress being made. When Queen had finally absorbed the entire smell, she opened her eyes and looked happy. It was then she saw Hansen standing right beside her, watching her without blinking. She couldn't refrain from blushing. Hansen was frozen. For a cold woman like Queen to have such a shy face only made her look sexier. With that fairy face of hers, it'd draw the attention of every man in a room. Queen felt guilty about absorbing Hansen's smell in order to train, and that was why she looked slightly embarrassed. She looked at Hansen's face and suddenly became very mad. She grabbed his ears and yelled in his face, What did you do in the sea? Hansen fell back, clutching his twisted ears. Queen blushed and put her hands down. She went back to acting cool and repeated her question in a softer tone, I asked you, what did you do in the sea? As he continued to rub his ears, Hansen replied, didn't you see anything? I was just trying to get myself an easy kill. Unfortunately, I failed, and that mistake almost cost me my life. Queen frowned at Han Sen, not knowing whether he was being truthful or not. But as she looked at him, his bedraggled visage made him look like he hadn't achieved anything. But Queen was more interested in the smell that surrounded Han Sen right now. She assumed the culprit was the lotus root he had consumed. Han Sen did not digest the medical properties of the roots. The medical properties, instead, wafted out of his body to affect her as well, and then go on to improve her heavenly go. But this was only what Queen was theorizing. She wanted to find out for sure. What is up with your skills? Why do you possess a strange smell? Queen asked, peering at Hansen. A strange smell? Me? Hansen raised his arms and sniffed his pits. He looked at Queen and smiled and then went on to say, are you referring to my body odor? How can the practice of such arts lead to a strange body smell? Queen looked at the Joker with seriousness, but after a while, she turned around and ignored him. Hansen was just talking crap, and she knew he'd continue to fool around no matter how many times she asked. But in her heart, she still believed it was down to the lotus root he had ingested. After all, she had never heard of a skill that could aid and improve the practice of someone else's abilities. Hansen wouldn't tell her the truth, no matter what. Otherwise, she'd want to kill him. Hansen then remembered something Huang Fu Pingqing once told him. In this world, there exist only two people who know how to perform Heavenly Go. One is Huang Fu Xiongqing's wife and the other is Queen. After today, there would be three. But Hansen didn't have to put too much effort into learning Heavenly Go. His Dongxian Sutra was clearly much stronger than it. It was just that this strange smell surprised people, and he was curious as to how strong it could become the more he trained it. Hansen really wanted to unlock his first tier and witness the true strength of the Dongxian Sutra. When he returned from his daydream, it was to the realization that he had obtained a super beast soul. It was his first in the second god sanctuary. Super creature beast soul, dead eye peacock bow type. While Queen was looking away, Hansen summoned the dead eye peacock beast soul. A peacock like bird appeared in front of Hansen, flapping its wings. It was roughly two feet long. Looking closer, he realized that it wasn't a living creature, but a blue colored metal crossbow. It was shaped to resemble a peacock with its wings, composing the bow of the weapon. With the body as its stock, the mouth of the peacock was where the tips of the bolts were lodged, and the top of the head itself was the sight line with which its user would aim. It was a beautiful piece of equipment. The elastic string of the crossbow was unusual, however. It was like a beam of translucent hard light, fixed between the ends of the wings. Hansen could command for bolts to be knocked and drawn with his mind and he only had to pull on the lock to loose them. 
Han Sun looked inside its accompanying quiver and saw that there was enough space for eight bolts to be stored. This was a fine amount, particularly for a weapon that could be used as efficiently as a pistol. If he used beast soul bolts, he'd have an infinite supply of ammo, too, provided the bolts weren't broken. Han Sen examined the peacock crossbow with an open jaw. It was a remarkable weapon to have in his possession, but without the appropriate bolts, it was little more than a sturdy stick to beat stuff over the head with. This is great, but you could at least provide me with some bolts. You didn't even give me a single one. Now I have to go find some myself? Hansen didn't know whether he should be happy or sad right now. The peacock crossbow looked incredibly powerful, but his visual perception was all that he could use to get to know it. He had no way of giving it a proper test run. I suppose it doesn't matter. I'll formulate a few steel bolts for it and think about getting beast soul bolts further down the line. Hansen tucked the crossbow away, realizing that its usage wouldn't be as simple as he had hoped. However, even without the high-end bolts that would be best to use, it should still be pretty powerful. A crossbow was vastly different to a traditional bow. The strength of the latter weapon stems from the human that makes use of it. Crossbows were automatic, and the power and efficiency derived from the weapons came from the bolts that were used and the craftsmanship of the weapons themselves. They continued to sail for another ten days before Hansen caught sight of land. It wasn't just any parcel of land, either. It was a human shelter, one that operated on the coast. Han Sen, upon arriving, made sure to teleport back to the Alliance. He had been gone for some time, following his misadventure with the White Tiger. He was afraid Ji Yen Ran had become gravely concerned over his welfare and whereabouts, so he made sure to check in on her. He wanted to comfort her and make some bolts for his new crossbow. Ji Yen Ran really did worry over him. When she saw him return, she was delightfully surprised and she did her best to shelve how upset she was. Hansen comforted her for a while and her mood genuinely brightened. Ji Yen Ran had been upset not because he had been gone for so long, but because she did not know whether or not he was okay. As Hansen lay on his bed that night, he decided to log into the virtual community. He visited the army to take a look at the weaponry on offer there, and finally decided to purchase C-class bolts. All sorts of weaponry and equipment could be purchased in the army, for the right amount of money. Only weaponry that dealt raw, physical damage, could be bought, however. Weapons that inflicted elemental damage were not available. Hansen browsed around for a while, before he stumbled across the Z-class bolts he had resolved to buy. Different crossbows could only employ certain types and sizes of bolts, and these were the ones Hansen thought he would need. But the peacock crossbow was a beast soul crossbow, and that meant it had fantastic compatibility. Provided the bolts weren't too long, he could make use of them. So Hansen selected a few different types of bolts and bought them. After buying the bolts, Hansen went off to browse the news and see if anything important had occurred in the Alliance during his absence. Many things had transpired, such as a half-god killing a bunch of creatures, a victory for the Alliance in a war that was taking place in another system, and how the Shura people managed to reclaim a planet that was taken from them. Still, despite all of the things that had been going on, none of these events were a personal concern to Han Senator after a while of browsing there. He went onto the Skynet platform to research as much information about crossbows and their bolts as he could. After a good while of searching for bolts exclusively, he noticed there was an extreme shortage of the bolts available in the Second God Sanctuary, which led him to believe the crossbow was an unpopular weapon type. More popular swords and knives had billions of beast soul variants to purchase, but the total number of bolts available for purchase was in the low tens of millions. He enabled the filters to browse for sacred blood beast soul bolts and was surprised to see only a mere dozen for sale. Hansen looked at the locations where these bolts were on sale and saw the names of shelters that he had never heard of before or were in remote, inaccessible places. It seemed that it might be impossible for him to trade for the bolts he sought. If I cannot buy the bolts I need, I'll just have to hunt down the creatures myself. 
Hansen scoured the ice field, Golden Beach, and Whitestone Beach for information, hoping to find out where sacred blood beast soul bolts could drop. After a good while of searching, he came across a creature that was known to drop sacred blood beast soul bolts near Whitestone Beach. It was a creature known as Sky Falcon. They were mostly ordinary, but there were mutants amongst them. The Sky Falcon King was the sacred blood variant. Many people had hunted the ordinary Sky Falcons for traditional bolts that were quite powerful. After learning what he could about the Sky Falcons, he knew he'd like them. And if a Sacred Blood Falcon became a Berserk Sacred Blood Class Beast Soul, it'd be a fearsome thing to behold. With his new crossbow in hand, perhaps he could use such a bolt to shred or pierce the shells, scales, or skin of super creatures that were extra thick and previously impervious. But the Sky Falcons lived on the peaks of the Sky Pillar Mountain. There were many other creatures there, which would make it a difficult trek to the top. The person who provided him this information had only learnt what he knew from a Sky Falcon that had fallen down the mountainside. He hadn't climbed up the mountain himself, so it was sketchy information at best. With the Silver Fox here, I shouldn't have much difficulty reaching the peak, provided there are no super creatures up there, Hansen mused to himself. Hansen really wanted these Sky Falcons now, and even if they did not drop a sacred blood beast soul, with their small bodies, Hansen could increase his sacred geno point tally by a good deal in a short amount of time. Hansen conducted more research about Sky Pillar Mountain, so he could be as prepared as possible. After looking for a while, Hansen furrowed his eyebrows. People had recently reported sighting a freakish monster there, riding a red cloud around the Sky Pillar Mountain. Judging from the reports, all signs pointed to it being another super creature. Ring. Ring. As he was finishing up his browser session, his communicator rang. It was Zhu Ting calling. He had asked for his number a while back, but this was the first time he had called him. Hansen wondered what he wanted at this time. Boss, this is not good. Zhu Ting said, hastily. What's not good? Hansen frowned. Mystery Island. There is a mystery island on the ice field. Where are you? Come back. If you don't, others will seek to claim the benefits. Zhu Ting's face looked panicky. Hansen was frozen for a bit, knowing why Zhu Ting was in such a rush. The mystery island here was different than the one in the first god sanctuary. The mystery island must have had a royal class spirit shelter situated on it. If it did, the likelihood of something good being there was extremely high. After speaking with Zhu Ting, Yang Manli also called. He talked to her for a while and expressed his desire for her to remain available and prepared for what was to come. There was nothing Hansen could do right now, since he was near Whitestone Beach. Returning to the ice field on such short notice would prove difficult. Even returning within a month would be a remarkable achievement. After finishing his discussion with Yang Manli, Han Sen called up Huang Fu Ping Ching. He wanted to purchase a map from her, one that would guide him back to the ice field. You are on Whitestone Beach? You really are on Whitestone Beach? Huang Fu Ping Ching seemed quite surprised. Is it such a surprise that I'm here, at Whitestone Beach? Han Sen looked at her strangely. You should be near the White Sand Shelter, then. You are aren't you? Huang Fu Ping Ching skipped a direct response and inquired. Yes. Han Sen's eyes opened wide. You can't be here too, can you? Yes, I'm here. Wait for me in the White Sand Shelter for two days and I'll come see you. She hung up. Han Sen was taken aback and felt a little insulted. He said to himself, you didn't have to hang up so quickly. You didn't even provide me the opportunity to tell you that Queen is with me. After waiting a day, the Z Steel Arrow were delivered. Han Sen went to the archery range to try out the strength of his new peacock crossbow. Han Sen loaded a bolt, took aim at the platinum target board, and pulled the trigger. The bolt was loosed with a blue beam of light as its guidance. Boom! The thick platinum target board was smashed into splinters, which surprised Han Sen. Holy smokes! 
This is great. Hansen shouted, overwhelmed with incredible joy. For such power to come from an ordinary Z-steel arrow was tremendous. If he managed to obtain sacred blood beast soul bolts, the power was sure to be insane. It was even likely it could shoot through the body of a super creature. I'm going up the mountain to slay the Sky Falcon King. When Hansen now thought of the Sky Falcon King, his heart burned with the desire to slay it. Entering the shelter again, Queen said she had managed to make contact with Tyrant. He and the rest of the group would be there in a few days. That means we aren't too far from the ice field, then. Hansen was surprised. Traveling by sea, it would take a month, even if we were free from danger and any likely interruptions for the duration of the trip, Queen said. In that case, never mind. Hansen wanted to avoid the ocean right now. He currently fancied walking where he needed to go, to avoid drawing the ire of any sea creatures like the lobster. We should wait until Tyrant arrives. I'll propose your inclusion in our group again, but this time, I'm sure there will be no issues, Queen suddenly told Hansen. Nah, that's okay. I'm not really fond of cooperating with others. After what had happened, Hansen realized being with others wasn't as beneficial as he had first assumed. There was still every chance he'd get bullied by a super creature. And if he wasn't with a group of people he could place his complete faith and trust in, it would be silly to walk into life or death situations with them on a regular basis. Hansen was looking for people he could trust, and Tyrant and the others did not fit the bill. He foresaw many issues that could arise if he were to remain with them. Why? Queen asked, frowning at Hansen. I can cooperate with you, but I cannot cooperate with Tyrant and the others, Hansen confessed. In all honesty, Hansen looked down upon Tyrant and the rest of Queen's group. He at least wanted his teammates to be on par with Queen's power, otherwise, facing off against super creatures would be a pointless venture. Queen looked at Hansen as if she was in deep thought, without saying anything. It seemed as if she desired to read what was going on in Hansen's heart. Oh, yeah. Senior Pingqing is coming over tomorrow. After I meet with her, I'm going off to hunt. I won't be returning just yet, Hansen said. Where are you going? Queen asked. Sky Pillar Mountain. Hansen didn't think there was any reason to hide his destination, so he told her directly. When Queen heard the name, she paused. After some thought, she said to Han Sen, there may be super creatures residing there. You should wait a few days so we can all go together. Han Sen thought about her proposition, and it didn't seem like a bad idea. When he researched the location, he had read of the possibility of a super creature being there, too. If Queen and her people wanted to go there, that would be fine. The more people there were, the more distractions there would be for an attacking monster if they needed to escape. On the second day, Huang Fu Pingqing arrived just as she said she would. Seeing Hansen with Queen, her beautiful eyes opened wide and her mouth did not close. Why are you two together? Huang Fu Pingqing asked, with a puzzled expression. I want to invite Hansen to join my team, Queen responded. You're inviting him into your team? Huang Fu Pingqing thought her ears were being faulty for a moment. Queen inviting someone into her team personally was a rare thing. And Han Sen had only been in the Second God Sanctuary for over a year. She really did not understand why Queen would want to invite Han Sen into her team. She understood how Queen's team functioned. The people who joined were the cream of the crop, they were the best of those who had managed to unlock their first gene lock. Hansen did not seem to qualify no matter which way you looked at it. He rejected, Queen said, stoutly. This came as a big shock to Huang Fu Pingqing. She was speechless, and all she could do was stare at Hansen with wide eyes. Queen had invited Hansen to join her team, but Hansen rejected her. This was like a fairy tale, a strain for anyone to believe. If it wasn't for Queen telling her this, she wouldn't believe the news. Hansen merely laughed and said, Queen is only joking around. It's not that I do not wish to join, it's just that there is someone on the team who does not desire my presence. Who? 
Huang Fu Pingqing thought this sounded more believable. But who would dismiss Queen's desires? Hansen then quickly told her the story of what happened when his position in the team was first relayed to the members, and Tyrant's fierce objection to his inclusion. I know this Tyrant. He's too big for his britches. He is so cocky. Aside from Big Sis, he doesn't take anyone else seriously. His objection to you comes as no surprise. Huang Fu Pingqing looked as if she was starting to understand the situation more and more. She continued, but this guy really is something. Out of all the evolvers who have unlocked a gene lock, he is certainly the most powerful of the lot. Aside from Big Sis, he is undoubtedly the strongest on the team. Queen, who was still standing there and listening to the discussion, suddenly said, If you are willing to join the group, then I will propose your membership once more. If you are rejected again, then I will quit the group and follow you. At that moment, Huang Fu Pingqing was petrified as if she had seen something ghastly. All she could do was stare at Han Sen and Queen. She thought her brain was too small to handle the complexities of their situation, and she had no idea what was going on anymore. It was hard to imagine that Queen, of all people, would say something like this. In the White Sand Shelter's market, Huang Fu Pingqing walked alongside Han Sen, often turning to observe him. I know I am handsome. If you like my appearance that much, why don't we book a room together, so you can inspect me in all my splendor? Hansen asked her. He felt awkward, getting stared at by her. Huang Fu Pingqing merely fluttered her eyelashes and said, Sure. Do you want to go right now? Hansen did not say anything, but his eyes were suggesting enough. They couldn't keep away from Huang Fu Pingqing's inflated chest. Similar to Queen, her breasts were the best of the best. Huang Fu Pingqing blushed and asked, What are you looking at these for? Aren't you afraid Ji Yanran might suddenly appear and cut your penis off? Feel free to book a room if you've got the balls to do it, though. What is that supposed to mean? Hansen knew Huang Fu Pingqing was willing to say anything that came to mind, but if he actually stepped up to book a room, she'd chicken out. You really can't tell? I'm serious. You can go book us that room right now. I must say, though, I can't believe someone like Queen was willing to say she'd follow you. Be honest with me, what mind trick have you used to put her under your spell? Huang Fu Pingqing giggled and looked at Han Sen. You know that's not what she meant. Han Sen opened his arms to express his disbelief. I know that's not what she meant but it's still strange for her to be willing to give up her team for you. What have you done? Huang Fu Pingqing's curiosity had reached the pitch point. She couldn't fathom what Han Sen might have done to make Queen feel this way. I have no idea. Maybe she thinks I'm incredibly handsome, too, and won't be able to keep her eyes off me, hence her desire to follow, Han Sen expressed, with off-putting cockiness. Whatever. Huang Fu Pingqing rolled her eyes towards Han Sen. Han Sen laughed and turned to look at the beast soul shop they had just arrived at. Before climbing the mountain, he wanted to buy one type of beast soul bolt first. If he couldn't get a sacred blood class bolt, he'd at least want to grab a mutant class bolt. After all, bringing a Z steel arrow with him wasn't ideal, and a mutant class bolt was guaranteed to be far more efficient. But bolts, as he had previously seen, were still too unpopular. Han Sen and Huang Fu Pingqing walked around the markets for some time without finding a single one. They did, however, see a wide variety of arrows. But arrows were too long for the peacock crossbow, and they wouldn't load in. The peacock crossbow was medium sized, which required short bolts. Balls. How are you the one to sell this? Hansen at last found a mutant class bolt in a beast soul shop that wasn't looking too popular. It was a black bolt, formally referred to as an ice snake bolt, and its tip was coated with a paralyzing substance. Hansen was surprised to see that the bolt was 30% cheaper than any other mutant class beast soul. It really did seem like crossbows were unpopular, and few people were willing to buy their beast souls. After all, crossbow beast souls were considerably rarer than the bolt beast souls themselves. 
Hansen bought the ice snake bolt and continued walking around the markets, but that proved fruitless. He couldn't find a second beast soul bolt. Still, what he had was enough for the important time he'd need to use it. Because they were waiting for Tyrant and the rest of Queen's group, Han Sen had to wait a few more days. Huang Fu Pingqing wanted to visit Sky Pillar Mountain, as well. Initially, Queen did not agree with the venture, but after Huang Fu Pingqing spoke with her privately, Queen agreed to come. Huang Fu Pingqing's power wasn't too bad. Her genes were almost maxed out, but she hadn't managed to unlock her gene lock yet. If she didn't have a run-in with a super creature, she should have no trouble keeping herself protected. With the powers gifted by the Ares Martial Hall, Huang Fu Pingqing had managed to gather many sacred blood beast souls, so ordinary sacred blood beast souls could not harm her. On the fourth day, Tyrant, Sky Jealousy, and Lazy Cat arrived. Seeing Hansen present, Tyrant sternly frowned. Tyrant did not heed Hansen's presence and was wholly uncaring. He approached Queen with haste, asking, Are you okay? Huang Fu Pingqing gave him a spiteful glance, showing a clear distaste for what Tyrant had just asked. It was clear to see that Queen was okay and his question was unnecessary. I'm fine, Queen answered. She then looked at the three and said, You all saw what Han Sen was capable of last time. I am hoping that he can join our team, and I'd like to hear your opinions. Tyrant furrowed his eyebrows again and said, Big sis, has this not already been a subject of discussion? Queen explained, Last time, Shang Qing was still here. Now we are low on members. I think Han Sen would be a great fit, for he has been of tremendous service to me. Believe it or not, he has actually unlocked his gene lock and his qualities and traits would benefit us all. I don't think he helped. If anything, he has a negative influence on the team. Tyrant then proceeded to tell Queen of Hansen leaving the group to go to her aid and continued to say, someone who does not follow the rules is a liability to the team. This is why I am vehemently against his membership on our team. I really can't persuade you. Queen frowned. I stand by my decision for the benefit of our team, no matter how cruel it may sound, Tyrant said. Okay, I see. If things are like that, then I quit. Queen stated her resignation without a moment of hesitation. Tyrant, Sky Jealousy, and Lazy Cat were shaken. None of them expected her to quit the team on Han Sen's behalf. Big sis, we can talk about this. We can talk about this. There is no need to be like that. Lazy Cat said, doing her best to fix the situation and ease tensions. Yeah, this sis. Tyrant did not mean what he said. If you think Hansen is the sort of person this team needs, then we can talk about it, Sky Jealousy chimed in. Tyrant's face looked bleak. Still, he gritted his teeth to hiss, Big sis, we have been through much together over the years. Are you really going to throw it all away on the behalf of some outsider? Queen calmly said, I have not spoken recklessly. This is not a knee-jerk response. I am not mad at any of you, either. Have you each forgotten why we formed this team in the first place? It was to slay super creatures, Tyrant said. Queen nodded and then said, This is indeed a team to slay super creatures. But over the years, we have not managed to kill a single one. Tyrant looked ill, and so he pleaded, But we have been doing better and better in recent times. The opportunity will soon arise. Even when Shang Qing was still here, we could not kill a super creature. With the others gone, and our team being considerably weakened, do you still think we have a chance? Queen said it straight. You seem to suggest that we don't. Are you telling me we would stand a chance with this person's inclusion? Tyrant bit his teeth and asked, painfully. Queen nodded and said, yes, I do believe so. After that, not only could Tyrant say nothing further, but even Sky Jealousy and Lazy Cat were too shocked to say anything. They had never seen Queen respect someone as much as she did Han Sen. Everyone looked upon Han Sen, unable to determine which aspect of him made him so desirable and beneficial to the team. They did their best to figure out what was so special about him, that Queen was willing to quit the group for him. 
I only have one aim and duty, to kill a super creature. And I will do anything to achieve that goal. If Hansen cannot join the team, then there is no reason for me to stay with this team anymore. Queen explained it all calmly, but her certainty and absolute manner of speech made the others speechless. The atmosphere was cold. It was so cold, it felt as if the air itself was close to freezing over. Big sis, we have spent so many years together, are you just going to throw it all away? Lazy cat pleaded with red eyes. Queen's eyes moved. With a frosty tone of voice, she said, when we built the team, I told you what my aim was. I told you that all I wanted to do was hunt super creatures. I have no warmth or love for the friendships and relationships we have established in our time together. This is who I am. After that, Queen turned around and left. Tyrant clenched his fists, but did not speak another word. Sky jealousy was merely dim, left speechless by the whole affair. Tears began to flow from the corners of Lazy Cat's eyes, as she nervously nibbled at her own lips. Huang Fu Pingqing tugged at Han Sen to go after Queen. Despite their speedy pursuit, they weren't quick enough, and by the time they exited the shelter after her, Queen was gone. Sometimes, even I cannot understand how she works, Huang Fu Pingqing sighed. She must have had a reason to say what she did. Can you think of anything? Hansen inquired with a bewildered look. Queen was raised by the Huangfu family, so it was only natural for him to expect Huangfu Pingqing would know something. With a wry smile, she just shook her head and said, Not me. In the Ares Martial Hall, there are only two people who are close enough with her to ask such personal questions. Hansen nodded, acknowledging that she was referring to Huangfu Xiongqing and his wife. I'm going to the mountain. Since they won't be tagging along, it'll be too difficult for me to protect you. You should return to the shelter, Hansen said. This time, she did not object. She merely nodded. After splitting up with Huangfu Pingqing, Hansen rode Golden Growler to the Sky Pillar Mountain. He was unconcerned with what others thought, and his plan wasn't going to change on account of some drama. Hansen left White Sand Shelter and ventured off into the mountainous regions. Before long, his passage was suddenly blocked by three people. These three were Tyrant, Sky Jealousy, and Lazy Cat. Out of us three, I want you to pick one. Tyrant coldly looked at Hansen. Pick one for what? Hansen asked. Combat. If you beat one of us, I will allow you to join, Tyrant answered, with a proud tone of voice. Hansen laughed. Sorry, I don't even want to join your team. I'm not interested in humiliating you in combat, either. The three of them were no ordinary evolvers. They were strong, and they were the most elite there were. But despite their accomplishments, Hansen thought there was still no point in joining their team, for despite their unity, they still lacked the ability to slay a super creature. After that, Hansen wished to walk past them and continue his venture. Lazy Cat was enraged. She summoned a dagger and attacked Hansen in her fury, yelling, You only say this now, do you? You have deliberately tried to sabotage our group. I am going to kill you, you asshole. Lazy Cat was incredibly quick, and streams of wind were visible as she ran. Although she was not as strong as the White Tiger, her speed surpassed any Evolver Hansen had ever seen. Dong. Hansen did not even need to turn around. The ancient sword that was in his right hand swooped around his back and stopped Lazy Cat's killing dagger in its tracks. Lazy Cat shouted and spun like a tornado to Hansen's other side, with her dagger now aiming for his neck. Hansen's body did not move, but his sword did. Effortlessly, it swung around and put an end to the course her dagger followed. Lazy Cat's small body had a wild, primitive energy. Her right hand summoned another dagger, which targeted Hansen's waist. Hansen lowered the ancient sword in his hand, using the hilt to deflect her attack. Like a hurricane, Lazy Cat started spinning around Hansen at her. Her two daggers were thrusting and slashing from every angle at ridiculous speed. But Hansen was still standing, seemingly unfazed. 
With just one sword and one hand, he moved them around, deflecting every single strike with the precision of a machine. The way Hansen responded almost seemed casual and unconcerned. The sounds emitted by the clashing of the dagger and ancient sword rung out far and wide, with nary the smallest break. With remarkable efficiency, Han Sen had managed to block every single attack Lazy Cat made. She couldn't even nick his clothing. After Tyrant and Sky Jealousy observed what was happening, they wanted to join in. Lazy Cat employed the power of the wind and her daggers were unbelievable as a result, but here, Han Sen had effortlessly deflected every single attack. The power he possessed was something else. Cat, fall back. Sky Jealousy pulled out his soft sword, which reached out for Han Sen like snow. He's mine. Leave him to me. Lazy Cat's fury for Han Sen ruining her relationship with Queen showed no sign of going away any time soon. Han Sen's mascot sword continued to block and deflect every single one of Lazy Cat's attacks, but with the approach of Sky Jealousy, Han Sen had to summon his silver snake sword. Sky Jealousy's soft sword was infamous for its ability to grow hard and soft on a whim. When he approached Han Sen, it shot out a white, frosty miasma to freeze him. Unfortunately for Sky Jealousy, this manner of attack was useless against someone like Han Senator his jade skin made him nearly invulnerable to all frost-based attacks, and when it came to sword fighting, Han Sen was better on nearly all counts. It was only now that Han Sen noticed that, after unlocking his gene lock with jade skin, his speed and strength were the best they could be. His speed was no less than lazy cats, but he was superior in every other facet. Hansen excelled due to his balance. He wasn't lacking in any specific department, and he was strong in every aspect. Despite going up against two people, Hansen was still not at a disadvantage. He didn't even fight back, all he did was remain where he was, deflecting attacks and being as defensive as possible. Tyrant's face displayed a mixture of emotions as he witnessed the battle. He had previously looked down on Han Sen, believing him to be worthless. He had never guessed Han Sen possessed such power. To fight two people simultaneously and not sweat, with no obvious depletion of power, was an impressive feat. But still, Han Sen was not fighting back. Tyrant gritted his teeth and his body shone with the color of gold. He summoned his black lance and, like a toxic dragon, he lunged towards Han Sen. Dong. Han Sen's ancient sword clashed against the black lance. They were both pushed back, which gave neither of them an advantage. Tyrant joined in the fight. All three of them fought Han Sen, with no winner yet looking likely to be determined. It was a frightening sight to see and their inability to overcome one solo battler left the three attackers with conflicted emotions. Hansen's speed was on par with Lazy Cat, his strength was no worse than the strength-excelling Tyrant, and Sky Jealousy's frost air had no effect on him. This was the first time they had ever come across such a powerful human, and he seemed stronger than Queen herself. He was indestructible. Under the barrage of attacks from three people, the swords in Han Sen's arms danced with alarming speed, accuracy, and efficiency. As time went by, the realization they could not beat him began to sink in. Their unified push was slowly starting to become a unified retreat. Han Sen was pushing his dual skill to the max, but he couldn't afford to remain defensive forever. Switching to the offensive, Han Sen's swords swung around like the frantic flapping of a butterfly. The strength and power of each swing was unbelievable, however, and his opponents hastened to take a few more steps back. Despite going up against three accomplished evolvers, Han Sen was emerging victorious. Dong. 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 A lance fell, a sword dropped, and a dagger broke. Tyrant, Sky Jealousy, and Lazy Cat were robbed of their weapons. With pale faces, they now looked at the motionless Han Sen with eyes of resentful surprise. Despite their combined effort, they lost the battle. Han Sen's fitness was so strong he was barely human, they thought. His dexterity and proficiency in every aspect of combat was at the pinnacle of what they believed a person could achieve. Every sword skill Han Sen used was a raging one, 
blazing with an unimaginable power. None of the three could withstand the barrage of attacks cast upon them. They couldn't retaliate with a display of power remotely resembling what he had done. Lazy Cat's eyes looked lost and devoid of hope, realizing now why Queen so desperately wanted Hansen to join. His power was terrifying and none of them were a match. Sky Jealousy's eyes were bewildered. He believed that a person like Hansen was out of their league and they were foolish to attempt competing with him. But still, he could not accept that Queen was abandoning them for someone who was practically a stranger. Let's go. Tyrant did not say any more before turning around to abandon the fight he instigated. Who knew what emotions now ravaged his heart? Tyrant never would have thought Han Sen, the person he looked down upon, actually possessed such fantastic talent. And it wasn't just him who had lost to Han Sen, it was the three of them, all in a combined effort. Watching the three of them leave, Hansen sheathed his sword. Then, he turned around to look at a thicket of trees. He called out, You can come out now. Queen Slender Shadow appeared from behind an ancient tree. She approached Hansen to whisper, Thank you. For what? Hansen asked with a smile. Of course, he already knew. She was thanking him for sparing the lives of his attackers. Queen did not reply. She just looked in the direction her three former compatriots had left and sighed. It was rare for Hansen to see this woman in such a downtrodden mood. The likelihood of seeing her in such a state was far less than seeing her smile. Hansen thought there was nothing in this world that would even prompt her to frown, but there she was, actually sighing. Sky Pillar Mountain? Let's go. Queen's emotions frosted over once more. Is it really okay for you to just leave them hanging like that? Hansen really wanted to understand what Queen was thinking. I only require people who are useful to my cause. If one day I find out you are of no use to me, I will leave you without hesitation. Queen started walking ahead and said without looking back, the same applies to you. If I am of no use to you, please be rid of me. What plagues this woman's heart? Seeing Queen's silhouette step forward, aloof, Hansen could not help but sigh. Hansen had many questions weighing on his heart and mind, but he chose not to ask them. It was just like Queen said, she needed his power and he needed hers. That had to be enough. Killing a super creature solo would be too difficult. Even a person like Hansen had to consider cooperating with others, and the same was true of elite evolvers like Queen. Sky Pillar Mountain was almost like a spire in its structure and formation. It was difficult to recognize as a mountain from afar, as it resembled some sacred pillar that tethered the world and sky. This semblance had become its namesake. When they reached the mountain's foot, Queen looked at Hansen with concern and said, This Sky Pillar Mountain belongs to the Chen family. If you encounter anyone from the Chen family, be wary of Chen Ran in particular. Is he powerful? Han Sen had met two people from the Chen family before, Chen Zichen and Zhu Ting. Han Sen had always desired to learn the Chen family's special seven twist skill, but he never had. Even though Zhu Ting had learned it, being a bastard son of the family, he was tight lipped about its practice. Eighty years ago, Chen Ran unlocked his gene lock, Queen said, and then did not say any more. Han Sen knew how frightening Chen Ran was, merely from hearing his name. The history of this world only went back a hundred years. If he unlocked his gene lock eighty years ago, he had to be an old elite. To have been able to train with his open gene lock for eighty years, who could fathom what mighty powers he might have learnt? Even if he hadn't totally unlocked the first gene lock, the amount he had opened it must certainly be more than any other evolver. For Queen to warn him about this person was a testament to his abilities. Hansen thought Sky Pillar Mountain was huge, and it was nearly impossible to determine an optimal path up. Therefore, he picked a trail at random and began hiking. He also believed their presence would go unnoticed if they climbed the mountain in such a manner. He was wrong, for shortly after they began their trek, a group of people approached them. The leader of the group had gray hair, but his face put him in his forties. There weren't any wrinkles Hansen could see 
and his body looked toned and well-trained. He was clad in silver armor. He rode a tiger that was three meters tall and looked like a bona fide badass. You there, who is selected to ascend this glorious sky pillar mountain, tell me, why have you not made your presence known to us? Our hospitality knows no shortage. Chen Ran stopped before Queen, leading an entourage of a hundred in his wake. We have only come here to hunt a few sky falcons. It was not in our interest to trouble you, Queen politely said in response. You speak as if you were unknown to us. The Chen family and the Huangfu family have borne a relationship extending back many generations. You are half of the Huangfu family, which makes you a relative of mine, whether you wish it or not. There is no trouble, I assure you. Chen Ran smiled and said, The sky falcons of your pilgrimage reside at the top of this mountain, and it is a trying campaign to reach them. I beseech you to allow me and my fellow elderly men to escort you. Sure, Queen agreed. Chen Ran commanded many of his followers to remain at the foot of the mountain. He rallied ten others to his side, and with them, Queen and Han Sen resumed their ascent. Han Sen knew that it was not for their own safety that Chen Ran was willing to escort them. He was afraid they would seek to kill the super creatures that resided there. That was okay, however. Han Sen did not wish to slay the super creatures, so he was not against the company. With them leading the way, it would be a much safer journey to the peak. Out of the ten who followed Chen Ran, two had unlocked their gene locks. But they did not belong to the Chen family. After all, the second god's sanctuary was a big place. Even if the Chen family was large, the chances of them remaining all together in one area was incredibly slim. Hansen raised his head but could not see the peak of the mountain, for its top was buried in the clouds. He imagined the mountain resembled a long, slender dragon reaching into the sky. It is fortunate I did not bring the silver fox. If Chen Ran didn't encounter any creatures on this outing, it would most certainly raise his suspicions about us. Hansen came here to hunt, and thus he could not bring the silver fox. He left it in White Sand Shelter in a room he had rented for it to wait in. Sky Pillar Mountain was easily 3,000 meters high. And now, they noticed they were walking through a garden of bones. They weren't ordinary bones, as they were grand in size. They were easily a few dozen meters long, each. They looked incredibly powerful, representing exhausted powers from the ancient ages of the world. Although they were merely bones, having long lost their flesh, they were still unnerving to see. The legends say that these bones belonged to the creature that once guarded this mountain. When it reigned supreme over this place, no one dared approach for a thousand meters, Chen Ran explained. A few hundred meter long bones lay strewn across the mountainside, and much of the area was wreathed with vines. Strangely, they were all shriveled and withered and many had knitted their way across the bones that were scattered about. Hansen curiously observed the bones. They had a diffuse, ancient aura of power, one that was dormant, as if it were slumbering. This power seemed to ward away creatures from coming anywhere near them, too. It was not normal for mere bones to be so oppressive. It made Hansen question whether they were the bones of a long-dead super-creature. I wonder if I can cook some soup with the bones? Perhaps I can nab a few super geno points by doing that. Hansen wondered. But after looking at those sinister bones again, he gave up the idea. Still, he walked nearer them to get a better view. Chen Ran saw them both examine the skeletal remains of the guardian hound with great interest. He did not say anything but approached them by the bones. Hansen inspected them and found that they looked like gray pillars of stone. Some were the size of a barrel, whereas others were as big as a house. The remains were mostly complete, and it looked as if the ancient creature had just died quietly on the mountainside. Chen Ran called a man named Su Dong Jin to come forward. He summoned a beast soul sword and struck the bone with it. A great sound rang out across the valleys and mountains of the region, but upon inspecting the bone that was hit, there was not a single mark on it. These bones are incredibly hard. Even with a sacred blood weapon, they cannot be damaged. Su Dong Jin sheathed his sword as he explained their strength. 
This was almost confirmation for Hansen that these were indeed the remains of a super creature. If they weren't, Su Dongjin's mighty strike was sure to leave a hefty cut. But it was a puzzling conundrum why would a super creature simply die here without a struggle, with its bones cast across the mountainside? Chen Rad's people discussed various topics with Queen while Hansen walked along the spine of the creature on their ascent. The further he walked, the more vines seemed to strangle the bones. It made Hansen wonder how long it took for the creature to decay, and for the vines to tangle and course their way up and down what remained. When he reached the skull of the creature, it seemed to resemble the skull of a dog. The teeth were terrifying, and picturing how they might have one day gnashed at helpless victims made a chill run down his spine. Hansen sighed in his heart, saying to himself, It is a shame only the bones remain. Heaven knows how long these bones have been lying here. They are useless now. When he prepared to leave the bones, he caught sight of a nut hanging from the vines that smothered the skull. It looked dried up, yellowish like the vines it clung to. Hansen went to take a closer look. It was in fact a gourd. It was small, too, and could easily be picked up in one hand. It seemed to have sprouted as the vines themselves withered. Ordinary people did not care much for plants or botany, but it was a subject of great interest to Han Senator with so many vines blanketing the skull, he wondered if that sole gourd was special in some way. Hansen put his hands around the gourd and tried to pry it from the vines. Despite exerting all his strength, he was unable to remove it. With great surprise, he had to ask aloud, why is this gourd so stubborn? Give it up, friend. Try as you might, that thing won't ever come off. That dead gourd is as tough as the bones it is attached to. Even if you use a weapon, it'll be to no avail. You aren't the first to inquire about that little thing. Many people have come to try their luck and remove it, and many more with fire. Nothing ever seemed to work. Su Dongjin chuckled as he walked. Hearing him say this, Hansen only become more inquisitive. He summoned his mascot sword and said, If it is indeed as you say, I cannot help but try it out for myself. Hansen slashed the gourd with all his might. It felt like he was striking rubber and with nary a budge, his sword smacked it like a stone and bounced off. What did I say, eh? Su Dongjin resumed his laughter. You are right. That thing is tough. Hansen's curiosity only increased, thinking the gourd had to be something quite special. For a gourd vine to be that strong was abnormal. By no right should it have been that difficult to remove. Hansen put away his sword and grabbed the gourd with his hands while he secretly activated his gene lock. Just as he prepared to pull with all his strength, the gourd fell off into his hands. This was quite the shock for him. Su Dongjin was even more surprised. He could not not believe the gourd was now in Hansen's hand, and all he could ask was, how did you do that? For countless years, the vines had read those bones. Countless people had come and gone, each trying their luck at removing the gourd, all with no success. But now, Han Sen had just come along and removed it with a casual pull. This bewildered Su Dong Jin. I have no idea what I did. I only gave it a little pull and poof. It fell off. Han Sen was almost disappointed to have removed the gourd with such little effort. Su Dong Jin watched Hansen pull the gourd off the vine with little to no strength and the surprise he felt was immeasurable. So immeasurable, it bore repeating. What has transpired here? Chen Ran brought Queen and the remainder of the followers over to see what the commotion was about. Our new friend, Brother Han, pulled the gourd off the vine with his hand. Su Dong Jin simply recounted the story to Chen Ran. Chen Ran and the rest of the people weren't sure what to think, but they didn't dwell on the issue. They still believed it to be an ordinary gourd and nothing more. Brother Han, you look to me like a man of good fortune. Heaven knows how many years this gourd has clung to the withered vines that birthed it, despite the insistence of its removal by others. Now, with you coming along, it seems to have accepted you as its bearer, Chen Ran said with a smile. He continued, would you allow me to take a look at the thing in its entirety? Of course. 
Without hesitation, Han Sun passed the gourd to Chen Ran. Chen Ran inspected it for a good while, but could not see anything out of the ordinary. He then gave it to Su Dong Jin to look at, who came to the same conclusion. Su Dong Jin then passed it back to Han Sen. If this was meant to be, Han Sen should hold on to it. Perhaps it is a treasure of some kind, one whose true value is unknown to us, Su Dong Jin said. It is only a dead gourd, Su Dong Jin. It's not some treasure. Trophy or souvenir? Sure. Treasure? I would be hard pressed to believe so. Han Sen then placed the gourd in his chest pocket. Everyone resumed their trek to the top of the mountain. With Chen Rant's guidance, they managed to avoid many dangerous areas that were prone to the visits of fierce monsters. Because of this, their progress was good and hindrances were practically non existent. As he walked, Hansen began to feel as if something was wrong, however. The gourd against his chest began to beat, as if it possessed a heart. Hansen was shocked. He secretly fingered the gourd, trying to get a better feel of what was in there. A faint pulsing sensation came from the gourd, as if it really did possess a heartbeat. But because it was so weak, Hansen wouldn't have been able to tell it had one without his seventh sense. Hansen was so disturbed by the minor revelation that he almost wished to throw the gourd away. Ever since he saw the Lotus Bear 18 blood crystal wasps, he had grown a slight fear of meddling with curious plants. When Hansen tried to feel it again, the pulse had vanished. No matter how Hansen held it in his hand, he could no longer feel what he previously had. Strange. I just felt it. Why has it gone? Hansen frowned. He didn't dare place the gourd back in his chest pocket, so he continued to just hold it in his hand. If something strange were to happen, at least he'd have the time to react. As Hansen continued walking, his attention remained fixed on the gourd. He could not sense any additional movement, however, and so he started to feel as if he had been mistaken. Strange. It's really strange. What is this thing, I wonder? Hansen wanted to toss it away and be rid of anything malicious it might harbor inside. But then, his thoughts returned to the possibility of it being some sort of treasure, in which case throwing it away would be a profound loss. Hansen regretted that he did not bring the silver fox with him. Unlike Hansen, who was stumped to figure out what the gourd was, the fox would probably know what to do with it. Once he picked it up, a selfish person like Hansen would not throw it away. He continued holding on to it, planning to give it to the silver fox later. Luckily, nothing strange occurred with the gourd for quite some time. It remained as lifeless as it had been when it was first collected. Every now and again, they encountered a few creatures on the path. Many populated the mountain, and they came in all sorts of shapes and sizes, so it was impossible to avoid a skirmish or two along the way. Without a spirit shelter nearby, however, they did not have to worry about there being large quantities of monsters. They made sure to avoid the hot spots and dangerous zones as marked by Chin Ran and his people, and any monster that ventured near, they quickly ran through. There was no chance for Han Sen and Queen to put in a strike or two, which robbed them of the opportunity to collect some loot along the way. But it did not concern them too much, because Han Sen was only there for the Sky Falcons atop the mountain. The mountain was far higher than they initially believed. They ascended its treacherous paths for another two whole days without even reaching the halfway point. All of a sudden, the neighing of a horse sounded from somewhere ahead. The faces of Chen Ran and his people drained of their color. Quick. We must hide. Chen Ran went ahead to look for a spot to hide and noticed a narrow crevice in the cliffside they followed. Whatever was headed their way was obviously a creature of some notoriety for the people of the mountain, something wielding a most heinous power. Without hesitating, they followed Chen Ran and his people into the crevice. Not long after, the sounds of a neighing horse came closer and closer. Soon after, something that looked like a horse or donkey riding a red cloud passed by their hiding place. Hansen snuck a peek at it with a strange look on his face. Before he came to the mountain, 
he read reports of a horse-like creature riding a red cloud up and down the mountain. This had to be what the reports were referencing. But this creature looked more like a mule. Its hair was shaggy, but shone red and looked good. Its most striking aspect was the red cloud that surrounded it. The mule looked like a holy deity of some sort and it seemed to be riding down the mountainside carefree and happily. What it was excited about, Hansen couldn't guess. After hovering around for a minute, the mule soon disappeared. That creature is extremely powerful. Many travelers who have desired passage to the peak have died, trampled beneath its murderous hooves. We have taken you along a trail that bypasses the areas it most commonly traverses, so it was a surprise for us to encounter it here. After waiting until the creature was out of earshot, Chen Ran explained the situation. Queen and Hansen looked at each other without saying anything. The reason why Chen Ran took a detour was to avoid bumping into this super creature, since he did not want them to know of it. Let us depart. And let us pray we do not encounter it again on our return journey, Su Dongjin said. Everyone in the group had no a profound desire to run into that creature again, so their pace up the mountain hastened a considerable amount. Although this mountain was host to many strange phenomena and dangerous creatures, it was fortunate they had not found themselves in any particular danger. After six days of hiking, they had almost reached the top. Hansen took a moment to look down and observe the length of what he had traversed, and he was surprised to see very little. The clouds blanketed the lands below like a sea of white foam. It was as if he had reached heaven or entered a world only fairies lived in. Atop the peak rested a large ancient tree that sprouted branches outward in various directions, resembling a mushroom. The branches were so thick, entwined and long, that they sheltered the entire peak like an umbrella. It was a mighty tree. Hansen looked at it from afar. Although he had read about the tree's existence before, seeing it in person was a different story. Its magnificence was mesmerizing to behold. Many creatures resided among the leaves. White birds flocked out from among the branches, in varying species and breeds. The giant tree almost seemed like a world all to itself, constructed like a haven for birds. It was incredible. There are thousands of creatures living up there in that tree. There are over a thousand big bird species, too. The sky falcon you desire is amongst the largest in size, and our last count tallied their number at over a thousand. Sacred blood varieties exist amongst them, as well, Su Dongjin explained. Hansen furrowed his eyebrows. It was hard to believe so many creatures resided among and beneath the boughs of such a humongous tree. If they approached, they wouldn't only be doing battle with the sky falcons, it would seem. Every nest and chirping bird would be startled, most likely, and that would put them in a lot of trouble. When Queen and Hansen didn't say a word, Chen Ran smiled and said, Although the sacred tree has many creatures, fear not. Strangely, each species has its own set of rules and spot inside the tree to live in. The sky falcon, however, lives at the very top of the tree. They will be tricky to hunt, I must confess. Chen Ran and his people showed no interest in helping Han Sen and Queen complete the task that led them there, so they stood back and waited to see how they would perform. When Queen said she had come here to hunt a sky falcon, Chen Ran did not actually believe she could do it. There were many creatures on the tree, and it would be difficult to reach the top. Plus, at the speed the sky falcons flew, strength would not matter if they were unable to hit one. Chen Ran believed Queen had come with a secret desire to search for a super creature, and that the desire to hunt a sky falcon was merely a dishonest excuse. Queen looked at Han Sen, believing it might actually prove too difficult to hunt the sky falcons where they were. Even with sacred blood wings, they would not be able to fly past the other birds that populated the tree. Once they reached the top, many creatures would swarm upon them. Unlocked gene lock or not, against such numbers, it didn't seem likely this was a quest they could accomplish. Old Chen, can we climb the tree? Queen asked, looking at Chen Ran. Chen Ran smiled and responded, the tree's trunk is host to numerous bug-type creatures. They are not only tough, but they are in great number, as well. 
Once the birds come for you, all at the same time, survival would seem unlikely. You guys stay here, I'll go get the Sky Falcon myself. Before Hansen arrived, he had already conducted a lot of research, and he knew Chen Ran wasn't lying. But he didn't come here without a plan up his sleeve. Chen Ran was surprised that Hansen stepped forward to hunt the Sky Falcons, not the Queen. Su Dong Jin and the rest looked at Hansen, as if they were getting comfy for an unsuccessful, albeit hilarious, spectacle. The Queen's heavenly go was infamous, however, and they thought if the Queen were the one to go, she might have been able to run up the tree, kill the bird she sought, and make it back in one piece. None of them had heard of Han Sen's name before, and when he proclaimed his intent of hunting a sky falcon solo, they thought it was a foolish notion. They believed the deed to be impossible for him and that he'd only cause them grief. The queen nodded, okay. I'll wait for you here. Unexpectedly for Su Dong Jin, the queen agreed instead of preventing Han Sen from going alone. Hansen summoned his wings and took off into the skies. He circled the tree and then went up to the top. Watching Hansen fly straight to the top to slay a sky falcon, Chen Ran shook his head and confessed, this brother Han lacks patience. To rush in like that is a fool's errand, and I fear he will be killed before he even reaches the top. What is this reckless boy doing? In silence, the queen looked to the top of the tree and watched Hansen fly. She was looking forward to seeing how Han Sen would defeat any birds that dared attack him in midair. Although a human could fly with wings, the speed statistic of a pair of wings had no correlation to a person's body. He could not just push it whenever he wanted to, like on land. Dealing with such birds in the air was indeed quite dangerous, and as a result, he most likely would not be able to compete with them. Chen Ran observed the silhouette of Han Senator even though he was from the Chen family, and a learner of seven twists, even he would not dare provoke a flock of such hazardous birds. To him, Han Sen looked like someone with a death wish. When Han Sen was 100 meters from the top, the birds on the tree noticed him. All sorts of birds flew out from the tree, all targeting Han Senator, it was a terrifying sight to witness. There were so many birds that the skies became black, blotting out the sun and shrouding the area in darkness. It was riveting to watch due to the size of the birds, as well. They were each quite small, and the biggest was roughly the size of a white crane. Most of them were only the size of ravens or sparrows. But size did not matter, and the sight was ugly all the same. No matter how hard they might try, a person with arms and legs could do little to deflect such swarming creatures. Although he was expecting this sort of situation, it was still a shock for Su Dong Jin to witness a man be assaulted by so many angry birds. Han Sen, who was still in the sky, had yet to react. He remained fearless and focused on analyzing the flocks of birds to find out which were the sky falcons he sought. According to the information he had obtained, sky falcons looked like owls, just a little slimmer. They were greenish blue in color and flew incredibly fast. Hansen knew where the sky falcons lived and so he continued to observe the top of the tree as he went through the air, so he'd be able to see them the moment they emerged. Just like the information he had obtained suggested, the sky falcons were faster than any other bird. All of a sudden, they came speeding out to the head of the crowd of birds coming for Hansen. But in the group of sky falcons that came for him, Hansen could not catch a glimpse of the extra-large sky falcon king in their midst. This puzzled him. In the blink of an eye, a large group of enemies were directly in front of Han Senator. He summoned his ancient sword and silver snake sword, flapped his wings, and challenged the birds head-on. This man is incredibly brave. Seeing Hansen go up against the birds with equal aggression, Su Dong Jin could not refrain from commenting. These words were not complimenting Han Senator, the words were spoken to put emphasis on his recklessness. To go all in like that was insane, and even if he had unlocked his Jin lock, performing this deed in such a manner was sure to result in his death. After all, opening your Jin lock did not make you invincible. Everything was limited and gauged by an individual's fitness. The same as ever, it was incredibly difficult to survive a situation in which you were surrounded. 
But in the next second, Sudan Jean and his people abandoned their thoughts and dropped their jaws to the rocky ground. They witnessed Hansen emerging from the other side of the black bird veil of the sky, with a few dead sky falcons exploding in plumes of red feathers. Hansen then stretched his wings and escaped the crowd of birds that were now unable to catch up with him. How can this person possibly be so fast? Su Dong Jin said in absolute shock. Hansen was like lightning, zipping backwards and forwards in the air. He was much quicker than the birds that attempted to surround him. Every time he killed a few sky falcons, he'd zip away and gain some distance from the crowd. Even the sacred blood creatures that chased after him could not catch him. Berserk sacred blood wings? Chen Ran squinted his eyes as he suddenly shouted in excitement. After Su Dong Jin and his people heard it, they understood. But in this new understanding, they were shocked even more. It was rare to see a berserk sacred blood creature, let alone a beast soul. This was a flying type berserk sacred blood beast soul. To purchase such wings would put many young evolvers out of business and bankrupt many shopkeepers. Han Sen was twirling around the skies, killing what he wished with little to no effort. Unable to catch up with Han Sen, the birds couldn't do anything. Across the sea of clouds, Hansen weaved his way around, killing and dodging every foe he chose to. Cut feathers were beginning to mask the skies as blood painted the ground below. While Hansen was enjoying his time, a sudden green and blue light flashed. A blue kingfisher appeared, about the same size as someone's palm. Flapping its wings madly, it shot out of the tree. Its speed was no less than Hansen's berserk sacred blood wings and it may even have been faster. Although the blue kingfisher was small, it was no less intimidating, and its face looked as if it had murder on its mind. It darted towards Hansen like a hawk, trying its best to peck him. Is this the Sky Falcon King? Hansen looked at the kingfisher's face and noticed it appeared similar to a Sky Falcon, just smaller. The feathers on its body looked as if they had been carved in jade and its beak was like a hook of crystal. No matter what, Hansen wanted to kill this new challenger. He unsheathed his silver snake sword and took aim at the kingfisher like a bolt of silver lightning. But at that moment, the kingfisher barrel rolled to the side and dodged Hansen's strike. The bird circled around and came back for Hansen. Hansen saw the flock of birds coming his way, and not wanting to fight them, he flapped his wings and tried to avoid them. The kingfisher was too fast, however, and before Hansen could gain some distance, it caught up with him. Hansen cast his dual skill and attempted to kill the kingfisher again. But this foe was much too fast for his berserk sacred blood wings, and far more agile, too. Hansen's sword could not hit it due to his inability to focus. But he couldn't remain still, because he'd be ravaged by the flock of birds if he did. The situation was quickly going pear-shaped. Your partner is talented. He is so talented, he has managed to draw the ire of the Sky Falcon King. Chen Ran squinted at Han Sen, telling himself he would do well to get better acquainted with the young man when he returned. He did not know someone such as that accompanied the queen. With a power so impressive, he would be worth keeping an eye on. Although Zhu Ting used to send information to the Chen family, not very often would his news garner any attention. Thus, very few people were even familiar with his name. Hansen continued to fight as he fell back, bit by bit. The prospect of winning against the Falcon King of the Sea of Clouds seemed unlikely. Su Dong Jin and the rest leaned forward to watch the battle with greater intensity, still caught up in the admiration of his berserk sacred blood wings. It's no good for him to continue like this. If he exhausts his strength, he'll be in danger, Su Dong Jin commented, as he watched Hansen zip around the sky. Continuing to talk, he said, Queen, ought we provide him aid? Su Dong Jin's offer to support Hansen was not out of the kindness of his heart. He saw that Hansen had attracted the attention of countless murderous birds, and with the majority preoccupied in the pursuit of Hansen, he and Queen would be free to bag plenty of easy kills. While he was happy to sit and watch, 
The suggestion of going over there and getting free kills was incredibly self-centered. That was why he extended his offer to Queen. There is no need. Within thirty strikes, the Sky Falcon King will be no more, Queen responded coldly. To the eyes of those who watched, Han Sen was a free-spirited bird himself. He soared the skies with no formation, diving and rising on a whim. Queen was the only one who did not see things like that, however. She could see that Han Sen was calculating each movement and every time he swerved, turned, or twirled, it was at a destination he had planned. Within thirty strikes, the formation would be complete, and the Sky Falcon King would be slain. Thirty strikes? That doesn't seem likely. Su Dong Jin continued to watch Han Sen getting chased by the flock of birds. He thought he was doing okay, provided they did not catch him. Chen Ran remained quiet and motionless. He stood off to the side, watching in silent contemplation. An old man like him, unlike Su Dong Jin, was able to understand such intricate situations a lot more. That was why he was so surprised at what he was witnessing. How does this kid know how to perform Heavenly Go? Did the Huangfu family teach another? That is impossible. Huangfu Xiongqing took a vow, so how could someone else I have no knowledge of or relation with, know how to perform Heavenly Go? Chen Ran spoke with a strange look on his face, as his eyes continued to trace Han Sen's movements in the air. A few of the evolvers that watched were counting how many strikes Han Sen had performed, not putting much stock into Queen's claim of him being able to do it in thirty or less. Yeehaw! After the count of twenty-four, Han Sen shouted. Without any prior indication, Han Sen performed a brutal counterattack on the Sky Falcon King. The Sky Falcon King was flying at incredible speed, flapping its wings with a new tenacity in an attempt to dodge Han Sen's incoming strike. It managed to dodge the first sword, but upon doing so, found itself caught up in the pursuing crowd of birds. At that precise moment, Han Sen's second sword came down on it. The Silver Snake Sword was imbued with incredible power and brought down on the Sky Falcon King with a mighty thrust. The Sky Falcon King's greatest asset was speed, but that came at the sacrifice of strength, its body was weak. When it was hit, its entire backside was sliced open to expose its organs. A hit such as that was guaranteed to ensure its death. Su Dong Jin and the others could not move. Han Sen had performed 24 strikes to slay the Sky Falcon King. Now, Han Sen swerved to dodge the next assault of the flock of birds. He made a quick turn and went after the falling Sky Falcon King. He hadn't yet heard the notification tone, confirming his slaying of the beast, so it had to still be alive to some degree. The Sky Falcon King descended directly into the crown of the tree. When Hansen raced there, the branch that the Sky Falcon King landed upon rebounded. Hansen reached out his hands to grab the near lifeless body of the Sky Falcon King and used his in force to throttle it. After a vigorous squeeze, the notification finally played. Sacred Blood Creature Hunted, Sky Falcon King. The beast soul was not acquired. Consume its flesh to obtain a random numeric amount of sacred geno points, ranging from zero to ten. Hansen's inability to claim the beast's soul did not come as a surprise. The probability of obtaining one was incredibly low, so it would have been highly unlikely to get it on his first kill. Hansen was prepared for this, so he wasn't disappointed. With the Sky Falcon King's flesh, he was sure to gain at least eight sacred geno points and eight sacred geno points from a single meal was a generous amount. Hansen circled the crown of the tree while avoiding the flock of birds that continued to pursue him. He caught a glimpse of what lay beneath the foliage, and when he saw what was there, his pupils shrank in shock. Beyond the dense dressing of leaves, Hansen saw a bird nest that had been built from branches. The nest itself was not remarkable. But inside the nest, he saw a bird that looked like a raven. It was inky black and all it did was stare coldly back at Han Senator Hansen looked into its eyes and felt a chill. He figured if the raven decided to move and come after him, he'd be gutted alive in no time at all. But the raven did not do anything. 
It remained where it was, comfy in its nest, watching Hansen fly past. Hansen was soaked in cold sweat. He only looked into its eyes, but with his highly attuned senses, he was able to determine how powerful it was. It brimmed with energy, and Hansen just knew that it had to be a super creature. Hansen believed he should immediately remove himself from the area and start praying to the gods above for a blessing. He had been so close to the super creature, yet it had done nothing at all. It was a miracle. The more Hansen mulled over the situation, though, the more he felt something wasn't quite right. The raven super creature was only a few meters away from him, so there was no chance it had not seen him. But if it had indeed watched Hansen, why would it choose to ignore a free meal? Unless the raven cannot move? This thought flashed through his mind. If the raven is laying eggs, is that why it did not choose to kill me? Aside from that, Han Sen could not think of any other reasons he would be allowed to escape from the raven. But that did not matter to him right now, what was most important was his need to leave the area and return to safety. If the raven did decide to leave its nest, he would be in trouble. Hansen soared off in the direction of Queen, shouting, Leave! There is a terrifying creature atop the tree. You have to leave. After that, he swooped down to hit the ground running and return his wings. Queen, without hesitating, joined Hansen in his hurried departure. Pa, surely you jest. If there is indeed a terrifying creature aloft in the tree, explain to me how you have returned with Nerea wound upon your person. Su Dong Jing did not believe Han Sen's words. Chen Ran only frowned, wondering whether or not he should leave and follow Han Sen's unnerving warning. But then, a deafening screech pierced his ears. It was the frightening cry of a raven. Ka! Ka! After sounding, a pitch black raven emerged from the crown of the tree. When it flew out, the rest of the birds that were still airborne, panicking, calmed down and retreated into the tree. The raven creature spread its wings and flew down with its beady eyes, peering at them. Go! Chin Ran felt a chill run down his spine and issued his command without hesitation. He was the first to start running. Su Dong Jin and his people did not dare loiter any longer, and they took off behind Chin Ran. The raven casually glided down towards them, in no apparent rush. It coldly watched Han Sen and the others flee for their lives, its eyes viewing them all like a joke. Its eyes were sullen voids, and after it took off into the air, the mountain descended into an oppressive silence. Hansen may have led the retreat, but he did not feel safe. A frightening chill latched onto him, and he imagined the beady, stabbing gaze of the raven targeting him. Damn it! What is going on? What has it taken the others so long to get moving? Hansen was bewildered, but he couldn't spare the time to think it through. The best he could do right now was escape with his life, leaving the mountain behind. Hansen did not dare summon his wings to fly off. Expecting to outpace a super creature that excelled in flying was a fool's hope. They were all now running down the mountain as best as their legs could carry them. Not once did they see another creature on their rapid descent. There was only the black raven callously mocking them from the sky, watching them all flee in terror. It was the de facto emperor of the skies, that was clear. With its presence, nothing else would dare creep out from hiding. Hansen looked back and spotted the shadow of the black raven overhead. Although it was not a particularly large creature, it scared Hansen as any other super creature would. The raven glided casually through the air, not even exerting the effort to flap its wings. It made no difference, however, for no matter how quickly they ran, it still followed them closely. They had run less than a kilometer when the raven cruelly looked upon its prey and let out another heart-stopping screech. Ka! The sharp noise echoed across the land. In the next second, the crow reached a speed that suggested it was teleporting and flew down behind the last evolver in their party. The inky wings looked as if they were able to absorb light and, in a flash, brought it down across the evolver's neck. The raven's speed did not allow the evolver a chance to react and all it took was one quick slash. The head of the evolver was hewn from her neck. 
It twirled in the air after its detachment, painting the rocky trail in crimson. With the raven's speed, it could have easily avoided the blood that gushed from the severed head and exposed throat. But it didn't. It allowed itself to be showered in the blood, its eyes squinting in pleasure. It extended its wretched tongue to taste the blood rain that descended from its gruesome kill, and it looked delighted. The people in front watched it happen, and it made their skins crawl and their hair stand on end. The unfortunate victim was not an elite evolver, but she didn't even have the time to fight back, no matter how hopeless such a deed would be. Removing her head so effortlessly was little more than a show of power for the raven. No one dared to slow down, and they continued their rapid descent. But the raven wasn't keen to let any of them go so soon. With its murderous eyes, it painted a few more of the fleeing evolvers. Help me! The evolver, who was furthest behind, could feel what was coming. And could not do anything save cry for help with a trembling voice. But with what had just occurred, who could be blamed for not slowing down and attempting to save him? Everyone had been rattled by their nemesis, and no one dared to slow down to watch it descend upon them. With its unfathomable speed, it had near enough warped behind the previous evolver to decapitate her, and no one wished to suffer the same fate. It was so quick, they wouldn't be able to dodge any potential strike, let alone fight back against the foe. Hansen activated his gene lock to enable his supreme abilities of sense, but even he was unable to witness it fly down in the manner it did. By the time the raven disappeared, the wing was already slicing through the evolver's neck. The distance it covered, to go from the sky to the running evolver, could not possibly have been crossed through speed alone. Hansen was beginning to believe it did indeed possess teleportation capabilities. Otherwise, it could not have evaded his senses. Ka. Another screech sounded, and the head of the raven turned towards the mountain trail once more. This time, Hansen applied greater focus to his senses to analyze the movement of the raven but it revealed not. The moment it decided to fly down, it escaped his senses again. The moment the raven rear revealed itself, the head of another evolver was in the process of being lopped off. In this moment of fright, Han Sen was shaken by the sight of Chen Ran running past both him and Queen. The talents of the Chen family are not understated. Han Sen gritted his teeth to push on and keep running. He tried the best he could, but he could not keep up with Chen Ran, who outpaced them all. Not long after, another screech sounded. It was like the tolling of Satan's own dinner bell. Upon hearing it, everyone clutched their chests in the hope it wasn't them who was next up for a deep six holiday. The further behind in the group you were, the tighter the fear gripped your heart. A person who was weaker than the rest was now lagging behind. In this moment, he noticed his position amongst his compatriots. Three people had been recipients of the raven's wings, by this point, and just as he expected a wing to greet his neck, his shaky legs tripped on an exposed tree root. No. Help me. Aarg. The scream of another hapless victim smothered the depleting hopes of escape by those who remained. In truth, they were now fleeing through a valley of death. Han Sen was beginning to realize at the speed they were running, they were all going to be killed before they could even descend halfway down the mountain. The raven was playing with them. It seemed to take pleasure in killing them, and if it wanted them all dead, that was how things were going to go. If they were lucky, they'd only be alive for one more kilometer. If we continue going like this, we aren't going to make it. Han Sen slowed his speed down to run alongside Queen. If we cannot beat the beast, there is no way to escape this predicament, Queen said, and Hansen understood what she was implying. Queen had come to the same conclusion as Hansen when analyzing the speed of the raven. Try as she might, she was unable to track its attacks. And if they could not do this, they could not fight it. If the raven came for them, only death would quickly follow. How about we split up? Hansen suggested, frowning. No. What good would that yield? Queen vehemently objected. With the horrible speed of the raven, it would make no difference. If anything, it would only result in a quicker death. Do you recall the creature riding a red cloud, further down the mountain? 
Queen said. Are you suggesting an enemy of our enemy is our friend? I'm not sure that would work. For all we know, we'll simply end up getting sandwiched between the two. If that were to happen, a grisly death would surely await. Hansen understood what Queen was suggesting. Well, we have to do something. If all we do is continue to run, we'll die no matter what, Queen objected. Hansen reconsidered her suggestion, thinking she might indeed be on to something. To keep running would result in certain death, as they were getting picked off one by one. A simple escape was off the table. Even if we tried, the creature that roams these slopes is too far off. For all we know, we may be killed before reaching it. Amidst their discussion, someone screamed from behind. Before the Evolver was killed, he had stopped in an attempt to fight the raven. But before he could strike, the wings of the raven was scissoring his neck, leaving a wretched blood fountain stump atop his shoulders. Queen's eyes went cold, and her signature purple light began to flow in and around her body. All of a sudden, a long scream sounded through the air. It was not the work of the raven, but something else. The sound was deafening, drowning out the noise of the mountains and surrounding landscapes. As Hansen pondered Queen's reason for using her purple light, he suddenly heard the sound of a horse neighing from further down the mountain. Then he heard the stampede of hooves drawing nearer. Something scary was coming their way, and its speed could not be rivaled. Chen Rand was running as fast as his legs could carry him. All of a sudden, the sight of a red cloud appeared in the distance below. It was the creature that resembled a donkey or horse. Chen Ran stopped his flight, but the red cloud monster was already on its way up to strike him at an alarming speed. Chen Ran's long gray hair all stood up and a windstream began to form around his body, circling him. He jumped ten meters into the air and dodged the incoming attack. He spun around like a pigeon in the air, jumped once more on the air itself, and landed ten meters away from his foe. Then, he started running once more. This entire scene played out over the course of a second. It was flawless, and it went without a hitch. The strength of the Chen family was impressive. The creature did not return its attention to Chen Ran, but instead turned to look at Queen. As it exhaled, red clouds emerged from its mouth. Streaks of a purple flame danced out of Queen's eyes, and her body was cloaked in the same wreaths of purple light. She evaded the monster and proceeded to run downhill. The creature looked as if it recognized Queen. It traced her with its eyes and followed her on her descent without paying heed to anyone else. Hansen could do little but frown. Their worst-case scenario was coming to life. He did not know what Queen did to elicit the creature's attention, but it was intently locked onto her, with no desire of chasing anyone else. The situation they were in had gone from bad to worse. Another scream erupted from behind, signifying another headless evolver. With more bodies dropping and two super creatures now targeting them, their hope of survival was quickly diminishing. All of a sudden, Hansen saw Queen turn to flee in a different direction. Abandoning their route, it looked as if she desired to lead the creature away from the rest. Hansen was taken aback by her noble deed. But not wanting to leave her alone, Hansen turned to follow. The people behind Hansen did not come with him, and they remained on their current route, being chased by the raven. Hansen ignored them and focused his attention on giving pursuit to the red cloud donkey, as fast as he could. The red cloud donkey was a scary foe, but at least you could watch its attacks and dodge them if the need arose. The same could not be said for the raven. But with Han Sen and Queen now preoccupied with the donkey, it was unlikely the raven would follow them. It would instead opt for the greater party that was fleeing in a straight line down the mountain. By trading one foe for a lesser foe, Han Sen and Queen had a chance of making it out alive. For Queen to come up with this idea in the midst of their current situation was impressive, and this ability to come up with such a strong strategy on the fly was an invaluable asset. As Queen continued to run, so too did the Red Cloud Donkey. Hansen was not far behind. It wasn't long before they were a fair distance from Chen Ran and his people, who had now disappeared beyond a ridge on the trail they followed. 
It was a grand relief for the raven not to continue following the other party. Clearly, it had allowed for the donkey to take care of Queen and Hansen. Hansen was immeasurably happy that they had figured a way out of their predicament. The red cloud donkey was clearly inferior in power to the raven. The predictability of its attacks and movements was particularly helpful. This was far better than dealing with the warping raven. Queen used heavenly go to keep changing her direction as she fled, dodging the donkey over and over again. She may not have been able to fight back, but at least she wasn't going to be killed. As Hansen followed, he witnessed the clouds of the donkey begin to rise and mask itself. Its shape now started to resemble a horse built from puffy clouds. All of a sudden, it jumped a whole ten meters and arrived behind Queen. Its sudden acceleration disrupted the rhythm of Queen's heavenly go. Although she was still able to avoid the donkey's attacks, the gap that had been closed meant she could no longer escape from it. The situation looked bad. Hansen jumped on top of the red cloud donkey. While airborne, he summoned his peacock crossbow and loaded a Z-class bolt from his quiver. With great speed, he fired three bolts at the donkey. Three Z-class bolts became three flashes of explosive wrath, striking the donkey in separate spots. Without sparing time to look at the results, he leapt off the donkey and resumed his run. The red cloud donkey squealed as the three bolts hit, and it screamed when the fire ravaged its body. They may not have torn its skin, but they were powerful enough to damage it. The red cloud donkey expelled air from its nostrils in anger and turned around to chase after Han Senator. The red clouds were terrifying and in three steps, it had managed to get behind him. Hansen's skills were not inferior to Queen's, but they weren't much stronger. Hansen stopped running to handle the donkey. With the time Hansen had bought her, Queen managed to gain a decent lead. She turned around and shouted towards the donkey. When it heard her voice, its eyes turned red again and it resumed its pursuit of her. Neither of the two could compete with the donkey, but with both of them drawing its attention back and forth, the donkey remained confused and distracted. It ran between them, growing increasingly angry. Further and further Hans Sen and Queen went, with neither of them sustaining a single wound. But no matter what they did, they couldn't lose their tail. They could not harm it, either, for its skin was incredibly tough. Escaping it through speed alone was impossible. This isn't going too well. If the raven killed the rest and decides to make its way over to us, we're dead too. Hansen shouted to Queen. There is no other option, Queen answered, not displaying a single flicker of emotion. Do you remember the bones of the guardian hound? Creatures never dare approach it within a kilometer. Perhaps we should attempt to reach there? Hansen suggested. Sure, Queen answered without hesitation. She aligned her destination to the Garden of Bones they had visited on their ascent. Although they were unsure whether or not it could repel super-creatures, it was worth a try. Their options were fairly limited, after all. They merely hoped that they were able to reach their proposed sanctuary before the raven had finished picking off the rest. And in regards to the Red Cloud Donkey, despite its anger and power, it was little more than a pest if they cooperated together. Because they had departed the trail they took to ascend the mountain, they had to run around for a while to find where the bones lay. Fortunately, the donkey continued to kick and scream the entire way, which frightened off any other creatures that might have dared to interrupt their baiting of the hellish mule. It saved them a lot of trouble. And luckily, their worst fear did not materialize. By the time they reached the remains of the guardian hound, the raven remained out of sight. But when Hansen breached the kilometer radius of the bones, the donkey did not break off its pursuit. It still chased them with the same fervor it always had, which made Hansen and Queen furrow their brows in unison. Hansen and Queen continued on their current trajectory, silently praying the raven wouldn't show up. But when they reached the Garden of Bones, they noticed the donkey's reluctance to approach. That pleased them both because they knew ordinary creatures weren't willing to go within a kilometer radius of the bones. It seemed that the radius was merely reduced for super-creatures, and they would instead not dare to go within ten meters of the bones. 
Han Sen and Queen jumped between the skeleton's ribs as the donkey remained outside, neighing in anger and turmoil. It seemed to be afraid of something. Hansen breathed a long sigh of relief and rested up against a bone. He looked towards the nervous donkey, which wasn't daring to draw nearer, and said, I wonder what creature these bones belong to. It must have been a majestic thing, to make super creatures fear its remains. Well, we can't stay here for long. After a brief rest, we must move on quickly. Queen sat down to rest with her eyes closed. Hansen nodded. He knew they could only rest for a short while, despite the fact that their gene locks had been on for too long, sapping their bodies of energy. Had he not thought of coming here, though, they may not have had the chance to rest at all. They weren't sure whether or not the raven was planning to make an appearance. With its murderous intent, they knew for sure they'd be trapped between the bones for a long time if it did. But it wasn't long before they heard the sound of rapid footsteps. A flicker of shadows appeared, revealing the approach of Chen Ran and his people. When they saw Han Sen and Queen, they were a bit shocked. The red cloud donkey was frustrated after losing its target, but seeing Chen Ran and his people arrive, quickly looked delighted. Fortunately, they were all able to evade the manic mule and reach the ribcage. The faces of Han Sen and Queen dropped when they noticed the raven was still pursuing Chen Ran, who had now just let it near. It landed on a withered tree nearby and watched them coldly. If I'd known you'd be showing up, I would have kept running. Han Sen's heart sank into depression once again. He didn't expect to see Chen Ran and his people ever again, imagining they would have been killed by the raven long before they reached the Garden of Bones. Chen Ran and his people weren't looking well, but at least they had not sustained any injuries. Only five people remained, but it was better than what Queen and Han Sen had been projecting. If they had been able to make it here under the ravenous pursuit of the raven, something was not right. Something must have happened. Old Chen, I am surprised. How did you get here? Han Sen looked at Chen Ran and asked. It is difficult for me to explain, Chen Ran sighed, dismissing an explanation. Hansen knew it would be useless to ask again, if Chen Ran wasn't willing to tell him what had happened. He looked outside the ribcage and saw the donkey wandering around in circles, letting out the occasional neigh. The raven made no sound. It remained perched on the tree it had landed on, and simply continued to watch. It is fortunate they won't attack us in here. But I don't see them letting us go anytime soon. I could imagine them waiting us out watching as we starve to death or die of dehydration. Do you have any ideas, old man? Hansen asked. There are two most wretched creatures out there. What do you think I can do? Let us remain here for some time so we may see what becomes of them. For all we know, they'll become bored and eventually decide to move on, Chen Ran said. Hansen did not ask any more, so he returned to Queen's side, where she continued to rest with her eyes closed. Activating her gene lock for such an extended period of time was almost too much for Queen. She was not like Han Sen, who possessed heresy mantra and jade sun force, and so her stamina and durability were not as great. It was fortunate she did not collapse during their escape. The group of seven were now stuck between the bones. They waited an entire day and night, and still their wardens remained. The mule hovered about aimlessly while the raven sat on the tree in silence, watching them. Their faces looked incredibly glum. Hansen did not know what to do. They knew whoever exited the shelter of the bones first would be killed by the combined force of two super creatures. There was no way around that. Leaning against the bones, Hansen suddenly felt a pulsing sensation come from his chest pocket once more. He had almost forgotten about the gourd's existence due to the situation they had found themselves in. When he took it out from his pocket, the beating stopped. As Hansen fingered it and examined it, nothing out of the ordinary happened. What a strange gourd. Hansen didn't return it to his chest pocket just yet, and so he continued to hold it. If anything happened this time, he'd be ready to inspect it. The red cloud donkey and raven were incredibly patient, refusing to abandon the prey they had chased here. 
A few more days passed and dehydration began to kick in. No one had any water left, and they couldn't leave the safety of the bones. If this continued, more people were going to die. Brother Han, it looks to me as if they're not leaving. We have to do something, soon. Chen Ran walked towards Han Sen, lowering his voice to talk with Han Sen. If you have an idea, then I'm all ears. Hansen knew it was only a matter of time before Chen Ran would come talk to him again. We are famous evolvers. It'd be quite the gaff if we were discovered to have died of thirst here, trapped between these bones. After that, Chen Ran continued to say, but these bones are scattered across many kilometers. If we split into two teams and run both ways, we may have a chance. What do you think? I suppose we could do that, but what will the teams be? Hansen thought what Chen Ran was saying made sense. The donkey was nearer the tail of the guardian hound. People who ran that way would be at a big disadvantage. There was every possibility that both super creatures would attack that place, too. This is my plan, and I won't needlessly put any of you at risk. I want you all to run out the front while I take the back. Chen Ran sighed. He then said, but I will do this under one condition. Please tell me. Hansen was surprised Chen Ran was planning to do something so selfless. Su Dong Jin and the others are my brothers, I am hoping you will take them with you. I am the strongest here, and I am willing to exit via the tailbone and provide you all with the time you need to flee this wretched place, Chen Ran said. Old Chen. Su Dong Jin and the others were touched, trying to bring words to their mouths. There is no need for you to say anything. I have made my decision. You have followed me for a long time, and there is little more I can teach you. There is little more I can do for you, except this. Besides, I'm a small target. Perhaps by the time the day is through, I'll be the one owing you, Chen Ran smiled. Chen Ran insisted. Su Dong Jin and the rest of the followers then went with Han Sen and Queen to the skull, while Chen Ran went alone to the tailbone. They both set a timer and when the time came, both teams would run. The raven continued to watch them, as if it lacked the motivation to move. The red cloud donkey now drifted over to Han Sen's side, which had more people, and neighed at them every now and again. Seeing the red cloud donkey come closer, Su Dong Jin felt at ease. If it was the raven that chose to come after them, the danger would be far worse. There was a chance of surviving the pursuit of the murder donkey, but not the raven. If it was the raven that chose to be upon them, there would be no hope of survival. Although they felt great remorse for the selfless deed Chen Ran had proposed, they each wanted to live. And it was because of this they were thankful in their hearts and gratefully relieved, as well. When the timer reached zero, Chen Ran shouted run. Chen Ran bolted out from beneath the bones as fast as the morning light. Seeing Chen Ran run, Su Dong Jin's vigor was reinstilled. He and his people left their end of the skeleton, too. The queen was about to leave with them, but Hansen pulled her back. She turned to him with a bewildered look, not understanding why he did not want to run. But quickly, the queen realized what was happening. The raven had taken flight, but its target was not Chen Ran. It had flown towards the skull. Su Dong Jin and his people had already made their departure, but the donkey was already on their heels. It prevented their return to the safety of the skeleton. With no way of turning back, they had no choice but to continue on their way down the mountain as they had planned. The queen turned back to look at Chen Ran and noticed he had already run a distance of 200 meters. It looks like the raven follows the larger crowd. The queen frowned at the thought. Bollocks! Hansen coldly said. Chen Ran, that old bastard, he played us. The tail may have looked to be a more dangerous exit at first, but look closely. Would the skeleton of a creature this large only have a tail that was a few meters in length? It is broken off. The rest of the tailbone most likely resides below the soil, and that's why Chen Ran was happy to head in that direction. We may not have noticed it, but the creatures are most likely able to sense it. That's why they have favored chasing us. The queen was mortified, he led his own people to a slaughter. 
Now, the queen was beginning to understand the situation, as much as she would have liked not to. Chen Ran was willing to sacrifice his own followers for just a bit more time in his attempt to escape. That asshole. The queen couldn't help but swear. It would have been okay if Chen Ran tricked them alone, but it was a wretched thing to betray the people you have sworn to lead and nurture. He was insane, a man willing to do whatever it took to survive. Don't worry, though. The way he did this has given us a chance to survive. Hansen said coldly, watching Chen Ran run off without stopping. The queen acknowledged what he meant. Standing inside the ribcage, they had nowhere to go. When they heard screams from afar, it told them Su Dong Jin and his people were meeting a grisly end. After ten minutes, the screaming stopped. They must have all been killed. After the raven and the red cloud donkey were finished with them, they returned. They coldly watched Han Sen and the queen, who continued hiding between the bones of the ribcage. Believing that they were not willing to make an exit any time soon, the duo of bloodthirsty creatures took off in Chen Rant's direction. I will count to a hundred. When I say one hundred, we run out together from the skull. This will be our only chance of escape. Hansen started counting up. He unlocked his gene lock to keep track of where the raven and the donkey were. The fact they had gone off after the treacherous Chen Ran brought a modicum of gladness to their hearts. Once the monsters had gone far enough, Hansen was prepared to make one last run for escape alongside the queen. When he counted to one hundred, he was no longer able to see where the raven and donkey were. Acknowledging they had to be a great distance away by now, Hansen knew it was time. They both darted out from beneath the bones like arrows. A little while later, Hansen's heart felt as if it was going to leap out of his chest. Tugging on the queen's hand, he yelled at her to go back. The queen looked around and did not sb any nearby danger, but she had come to trust Hansen's judgment a lot. Without hesitation, she returned to the skull with him. As Hansen retreated, he looked around himself to confirm whether or not there was any danger, but could not see anything. Still, he trusted his instincts, and his instincts were telling him to turn back. There was a danger of some immediacy in the area, and it was something that could kill him. Running as fast as he could back to the bones, the feeling of danger began to choke him. It was getting stronger and stronger. With his gene lock at max capacity, the sense of impending doom was unbearable. In the next moment, a bright light flashed by Hansen's neck. He didn't hear anything, but he jumped forward. That was when he saw the looming black shadow that had crept over him. Blood gushed like a bouquet of flowers. Hansen felt as if his back was burning. He suspected a bone in his back had been broken. But the wound was the least of his concerns right now as he rolled and climbed towards the bones of the ribcage once more. It was a life-or-death gambit, and what had seemed like a short distance to traverse now went on and on instead. The raven was furious at its inability to finish off Han Senator, it flapped its wings and disappeared once more. When it reappeared again, the wingblades of Han Sen's nemesis sliced against the back of Han Sen's neck. Han Sen's heart let out a cry, it's over. The raven was too powerful, and its speed denied him the ability to dodge. But at that precise moment, when it appeared Han Sen was about to lose his head, the dried vines that strangled the bones came to life. They were each like toxic snakes, lashing out at the raven that had drawn too near to the ribcage. They trapped the beast, and though it pecked and swung its wings as hard as it could, the raven could not cut its way free. Han Sen felt a chill. The raven had wanted to kill Hansen so much, and now its body was being dragged into the ribcage he had previously sought shelter in. The gourd vines were choking the life out of it as it struggled to get free. Hansen froze. He had never expected the seemingly lifeless vines to have so much power, power enough to restrain a super creature such as that. Now Hansen understood. The creatures weren't afraid of the bones, they were afraid of the vines that were wrapped around them. Having managed to remove the gourd from the vines earlier, Hansen hoped the seemingly sentient vines did not think poorly of him. In Hansen's chest pocket, the gourd began to pulsate once more. 
this time it was stronger than ever. Bringing out the gourd to hold in his hands, he really did feel like it was a heartbeat. Hansen now knew for sure that this was no trick of his mind. The weak pulse was like the heartbeat of a baby. It may have been faint, but it was life all the same. Are you okay? The queen looked at the wound on Han Sen's back in fright. From shoulder to waist, his back had been sliced entirely open. The gash was so deep, his spine was visible. On Han Sen's neck, there was another wound that oozed blood. Fortunately for him, it wasn't so deep as to touch the bone or windpipe. If the raven had been allowed to go any deeper, he'd most likely have been decapitated. The wounds were scary to look at, but the blood loss wasn't too severe. Han Sen's eye skin allowed him to control his body, whereas his heresy mantra allowed him to control his blood flow. If it weren't for those talents, he'd most likely have bled out and died. I can hold it, Han Sen hissed from his gritted teeth. His back was in agony, and he knew he had a damaged spine. But fortunately, it wasn't too bad. If he had been a second slower with his jump, his spine would have been shredded and nothing could have saved his life. The queen retrieved some medicine from her satchel and applied it to his wounds, which made Hansen cry out in pain. Then, all of a sudden, a screech pierced the air. The black raven, tangled and restrained by the vines, didn't look so fearsome as it once did. The ends of the vines were spiked, and they drove themselves deep into the raven's body. The vines seemed alive, as if they had a thirst for the raven's blood. As they absorbed the scarlet, the vines themselves turned a deep shade of red. The dried-up vines writhed with renewed vigor, and they started to grow longer and larger than before. Ka! Ka! The black raven called out twice. Its body contorted and twisted as plumes of feathers puffed out to dress the air like snowfall. With great strength, the raven squirmed its way free from the clutch of the vines and took off into the air in fear. It was gone for good. Hansen froze when he saw that. He did not expect the raven to be strong enough to escape the grasp of the vines. After the raven escaped, the gourd vines retreated, wrapping their way around the bones just as they were earlier. The vines that had turned red now became yellow like before, as well. However, many of them started to sprout green leaves. The gourd in Hansen's hand continued to pulsate, but this sensation did not disappear like it had before. Hansen held on to it, unsure whether or not life existed inside it. If it contained something like the blood crystal wasps, Hansen would rather discard it right now. But because he was unsure, he wasn't willing to let go of some potential treasure just yet. Aside from the strange beating pulse, nothing in particular stood out. As he fingered it, his eyes drifted to the raven's feathers that now carpeted the ground. The black feathers of the raven were of its outer coat. It wasn't a great number that had fallen, but there were around thirty. Each feather was about one foot long. He reached to grab one and his eyes lit up. The black feathers belonged to a super creature and did not look normal. Rather than enabling flight, they were more like weapons the raven could employ. Every feather was like steel, and it was frightening to simply hold. This cannot be the treasure the raven dropped. Hansen told the queen to gather up all the black feathers for him. After an accurate count, there were thirty-six feathers. It was a number that could be evenly split. With each feather being the same size, Hansen considered the possibility of crafting a fan with them. Hansen's back was in terrible pain. He looked at the queen and said, How about you try out the sturdiness of the feathers? The queen nodded. She drew her sacred blood beast soul sword and chopped one of the feathers with a direct hit. Nothing. Not a single scratch was left upon it. This really is some good stuff. Hansen looked happy. If he managed to modify the feathers a certain way, he'd be able to craft a new type of bolt. If he used them alongside his peacock crossbow, he might be able to slay a super creature with them. How about we split them up evenly? Eighteen feathers each, Hansen suggested to the queen. It is useless for me to own a bunch of silly feathers. You can have them all. 
the queen passed all of the feathers to Han Sen. Earlier, the queen took notice of the strange crossbow Han Sen had used to fire at the red cloud donkey. Strangely enough, it looked quite similar to the dead-eye peacock. The queen was starting to wonder if the crossbow was the peacock's beast soul. Han Sen was certainly not going to admit anything on such a subject, so the queen didn't ask. If Han Sen wanted those feathers, it'd be to make bolts. Such bolts and a crossbow would come in handy for the slaying of super creatures, so she preferred not saying anything and simply giving all of the feathers to Han Sen outright. Han Sen gave the queen a strange look as he accepted all the feathers. He believed from the way the queen looked back at him that she knew there was something up with his new crossbow. Yet she hadn't said a word about it. Her giving him all the feathers just made him confused. We have to leave while the raven is gone. If the donkey returns, our escape will be difficult with you unable to run due to your injury. After the queen said this, she picked Hansen up and supported him in his descent down the rest of the mountain. Hansen was being carried on the queen's back. He felt incredibly privileged and cared for, for this was the first time anyone else had helped him in such a way. The fact that it was a woman made him feel odd, however. Luckily enough, no more dangers arose during their time on the road. They managed to descend the mountain without interruptions. The queen summoned an elephant ride and took Han Sen to the nearest shelter so he could return to the alliance and recover. His wounds were incredibly grievous, and healing would not come quick or easy with only medicine. But he didn't return to the alliance, in the end. He had the silver fox, and it was better than any potion or remedy the alliance could provide. Therefore, there was no reason to return. Han Sen continued thinking about the gourd, as well. He did not want to return to the alliance yet, because he did not want to leave the gourd unattended. He went straight to the silver fox and it immediately approached Han Sen to lick his wounds. It was as strange as ever, to watch the wounds seal up with each passing lick. Even the damaged bones straightened, their gashes filling in. With Han Sen's wounds recovering, the queen booked another room so they could live there temporarily. After leaving his room, Hansen pulled out the gourd and presented it to the silver fox, so he might determine if it was good or bad. Examining the gourd, the silver fox looked upon it strangely. It continued to observe the gourd closely, circling it and sniffing it every way it could. Hansen looked at the gourd for a while, as well. But soon after, the silver fox just turned around and went to sleep on the carpet. Hey, you better tell me what this thing is. From the silver fox's behavior, he could not tell whether the gourd was a good thing or a bad thing. But the silver fox just remained sleeping on the carpet, ignoring the commands of his master. Hansen knew the silver fox wasn't human, and it would not understand the complex lexicon of the human language, so he stopped talking. Judging from the silver fox's reaction, that gourd surely presents no threat. But if it was something good, why would the silver fox go back to sleep? Han Sen was still unable to determine whether the gourd was good or bad, but he wasn't willing to take the risk. Once he was healed, he planned to take the gourd out someplace far from the road's others, tread and discard it. It would be best to throw it somewhere deep into the wild, in case something emerged from the gourd that would harm innocent people. It wasn't as if Han Sen did not want to see what was inside the gourd, but it was too hard for him to break it. He had even tried to crack it with his berserk sacred blood beast sword, to no avail. Han Sen had been grievously injured, and even with the silver fox's frequent licks, it took him four whole days to recover enough strength to walk. It would most likely take another half month for him to heal completely. Han Sen still had the 36 raven feathers in his possession. If he was to transform them into bolts for his peacock crossbow, perhaps he'd be able to shatter the gourd. Han Sen observed the black feathers with great inquisitiveness. They were one foot long each, and they were as black as soot. The shaft of each feather was hollow, with the vein tightly knit across its length with little to no after feather. They were like two finely cut slices of obsidian. If you went along the vein, stroking gently with your fingers, you could push down the barbules. They were delicate and gentle. 
but if you went against the vein, they were frighteningly sharp. It felt like countless spikes were forming a line to shred whatever came against them. The shaft of the feather was lethally pointy, as well. I wonder if these feathers can be loaded directly into the peacock crossbow? Hansen summoned his peacock crossbow and tried to load one of the feathers. It worked better than Hansen thought it would, as the feather fitted inside perfectly. The feather aligned with the bolt chamber so that it could glide softly along when fired. The only downside to using these feathers was the difficulty of retrieval. To pull a feather out of a target, you would have to go against the vein. This meant you risked the terrifying prospect of shredding your own skin against the feather. Hansen loaded one up and fired a raven feather bolt. A black streak flew a distance of three kilometers, managing to pierce through a giant fir tree without slowing down. It took another three barrel-thick trees to slow it down enough to remain stuck. It's so strong. Hansen was so happy, he almost jumped with joy. He quickly went to retrieve the feather. Hansen could only load 16 of the 36 feathers into the crossbow's quiver. The feathers were smaller than the average bolt, of which the quiver could only contain nine. After loading up his quiver, Hansen traveled to the base of a mountain cliff. He placed the gourd into a little nook along its rough surface and took aim with his peacock crossbow. He fired it at the gourd. Boom! The black feather had a direct hit on the gourd, which triggered a powerful explosion. A big hole was blown into the craggy surface of the cliff, in which the gourd still remained lodged, without harm. Hansen wasn't willing to give up so easily, however. Again, he fired an arrow at the gourd. He fired again and again. Hit after hit, explosion after explosion. The hole eventually became a deep cave, but still, the gourd was undamaged. Holy smokes! What is with this gourd? Hansen couldn't believe what he was seeing. Now that Hansen thought about it some more, the raven was unable to bring harm to the gourd vines. It had to shed its own feathers to escape their grasp. Perhaps this was to be expected. Hansen retrieved the gourd with a puzzled expression and a bewildered mind. After contemplating the scenario for a little while longer, he gritted his teeth and decided to fly up somewhere extremely high with the gourd and drop it. Hansen really could not shake the fear of toxic wasps one day emerging from the gourd to strike him in his sleep. Hansen had heard the fable of the farmer and the viper many times, and the last thing he wanted was to become such a victim. When Hansen dropped the gourd from a great height, the silver fox quickly grabbed it and spat it back out into Hansen's hand. What the hell is that supposed to mean? Hansen asked the fox, holding the saliva-covered gourd in his hand. But the silver fox was unable to talk, so all it could do was remain on Hansen's shoulder, wagging its fluffy tail. Hansen, not receiving a formal response, dropped the gourd once again. And again, the silver fox leapt down, grabbed it, and passed it back to Han Senator, at least he knew that the silver fox wanted him to keep the gourd. Han Sen observed the silver fox for a good while longer, but then turned around and left the area. If this was something the silver fox insisted that he keep, he didn't believe it to be of any genuine threat. Perhaps one day, it really could yield a mighty treasure of some sort. And at least when he held the gourd himself, he could not sense any danger. It was just his paranoia, insisting that he be rid of it. The heartbeat of the gourd was what disturbed Hans and the most. Whenever he held it in his hand, the movement inside concerned him a great deal. The curious pulsation hadn't stopped ever since his return from Sky Pillar Mountain. It beat rapidly, but faintly. He could only feel it if he held it in his hand. Hansen continued playing with the gourd for a few more days, unsure if it was actually the gourd that was playing with him. The dead, yellowish gourd did start looking brighter, however. It now looked like a yellow jade stone, with gold veins coursing around its complexion. It was quite beautiful. The heartbeat of the gourd seemed to feel a little stronger, as well. It was still weak on the whole, but there was most certainly a minor improvement in its strength. Hansen rested for half a month. 
His body healed in that time and the mood of his mind improved, too. Now that he had the peacock crossbow and raven feather bolts, providing he didn't meet an obscenely powerful super creature like the raven, he might finally be able to hunt one down. Hmm, but where would I find such a target? If it was a super creature like the donkey, I could give it a shot. Literally. And even if it did not die, I should be able to escape it without much trouble, Hansen mulled to himself. But the Sky Pillar Mountain was still home to that wretched raven, and he didn't fancy going near that place for a good long while. And in regards to the super creatures that might be found in the sea, he didn't want to hunt those either. He would be relying on his crossbow, and crossbows were significantly weaker underwater. The queen told Hansen she had something to do, and promptly returned to the alliance. He asked her where they might find an easier super creature to deal with, but she didn't respond to him. Just as Hansen was wondering whether or not it was time for him to return to the ice fields, someone knocked on his door. Who's there? Hansen frowned. Brother Han, it is me. A familiar voice sounded from the other side of the door, it was Chen Rantz. Hansen was shocked, unable to believe the old bastard was still alive and that he had actually dared to come see him. What could he possibly want? Old Chen, I am surprised you have found the time to come visit me. Hansen opened the door to the side of Chen Ran standing outside it, alone. Zhu Ting said you are a good friend of his. I heard from him that you were here, and so I have come to see you. Why didn't you say so before? If you had, perhaps our acquaintance and travel together would have been far more cordial. Chen Ran smiled. Hansen thought to himself in his heart, it would be a great misfortune to be considered your family. Hansen's relationship with the Chen family was fine. It wasn't particularly amicable, but there had been no strife between them, either. Had Chen Ran known about his connection with Zhu Ting, it wouldn't have made a difference. Chen Ran's actions that day were not spurred by anything other than his selfish desire to live, putting himself before anyone else. Please, come in. Han Sen allowed Chen Ran to enter. He was keen to know what he was here for. He was fairly sure Chen Ran hadn't come here to wish him a warm recovery and become buddies with a friend of his family's bastard. Chen Ran entered the room, looked around, smiled, and said, Brother Han, this place is no good for you. How about you move into my shelter? I will prepare the best room for you, have the nicest food served to you, and have the prettiest girls wait on you. You'll have everything there. Old Chen, thank you, but no thank you. I will be returning to the ice fields in two days. If there is something you would like to tell me or get off your chest, I am standing right here, Hansen said. Okay. You and Zhu Ting are best friends. You aren't outsiders, so I'll come right out and say it. Chen Ran looked at Hansen and paused briefly. Then he told him, since you are returning to the ice fields, would you aid me by delivering a few beast souls to Zhu Ting? How many beast souls? Hansen asked. A few thousand. Before anything could be asked, Chen Ran continued, of course, this won't be for free. This card I have here has fifty million in it. This is the price I can pay you for their delivery. Hansen observed the card Chen Ran pulled out but did not take it. He laughed on the inside and said to himself, this old man is smart. There is a lack of beast souls in the ice fields, and now this man is having me transport a vast number there. He tells me he'll give me fifty million, but who knows how many billions he'll earn from their sale. Old Chen, you are well aware of the situation in the ice fields. I am a self-proclaimed leader, little more. The true managers of the ice field are Li Xingluan and Qi Xiuwen. Even if I did transport them there, I do not believe they would allow Zhu Ting to sell them, Hansen said, smiling. The ice fields did indeed belong to Han Senator, the markets were his. The only way he would have helped Chen Ran earn such money was if he had become insane. We are family. You are king of the ice fields. I am sure you can think of something. Chen Ran pulled out another card and presented it to Han Senator, then he said, here is five hundred million. You have to take this money to help out Zhu Ting, this poor kid. 
he was born poorly, alone in the ice fields, without family. It is my sole desire to help him. Han Sen did not believe Chen Ran was the sort of person who was willing to aid a bastard son. He eyed Chen Ran up and down and smiled, Old Chen, there is no need for me to accept this money. The ice fields do not belong to me alone. If you want to do business, I will accept 20% of the revenue generated from any sale of these boast souls you wish for me to transport. Chen Ran's face was unexpectedly happy. He jovially said, Sure, if you say so. Han Sen then proceeded to say, But like I said, the ice fields do not belong to me alone. Aside from my goddess army, there is the Star Will faction, Black God faction, and Philip faction. This deal will not work if they aren't provided a benefit. If you really want me to help you, then you will have to provide them 20% of each sale, as well. If you are willing to accept these terms, then I would be delighted to help you. Chen Ran's face was stiff. It didn't move an inch. He looked at Han Sen and said, Brother Han, you are too cruel. I thought you were a friend of Zhu Ting. Do you not believe yourself to be a little inappropriate by making such a suggestion? Hansen smiled and responded, Old Chen, I am helping you flood my market with a large number of beast souls. Through a simple export of beast souls, you can earn 20% for yourself. Not bad, eh? And besides, I'm only being this nice, because it is as you said, we're family. I'll be giving you 20% on Zhu Ting's account. Otherwise, you'd be lucky to receive 10%. Young man, you cannot conduct business like this. Sometimes, a simple favor is better than any monetary gain. If you accept 50%, then perhaps I will have further business ventures for you in the future. Then I apologize. I must regretfully inform you once more that the ice fields do not belong to me alone. If I only accept 50%, I cannot report this to the others, Hansen said. Hansen thought it better to be without a favor from someone like Chen Ran. He was happy to allow Su Dong Jin and his brothers, who followed him with an unwavering faith, to be unceremoniously sacrificed so he could escape. His favors were the sort of thing that could get you killed. Well, if things are indeed like that, I regret bothering you this day. As Chen Ran started walking, he appeared to be fuming. After Chen Ran left Han Sen's room, he signaled for a few others to come to his side. Then, Chen Ran coldly said, Keep an eye on that one. As soon as he leaves the shelter, contact me. Accepting their appointed tasks, the people around Chen Ran got set up to spy on Han Sen. Huh, this is the son of Han Jingji? No way that old man had a child. Chen Ran's eyes flashed with a sinister haze. Hansen stroked the silver fox's fur and squinted his eyes. With his senses, he didn't even need to take a proper look to learn his house was being watched. It looks like Han Jingji's name cannot keep everyone at bay, Hansen thought to himself, but he didn't really care. If Chen Ran did not attack, then it would be fine. If he did attack, at least Hansen could try out his peacock crossbow and raven feathers. Hansen took out a Geno creation pill from his chest pocket. Dong Lin delivered them two days ago, and since the silver fox loved them so much, it'd eat one every day. The silver fox wouldn't eat more than one, though. Perhaps as a result of the pills, its hair was getting smoother and smoother. But aside from that, he couldn't tell much of a difference. Dong Lin's people say ordinary evolvers only have to consume one for their genes to mutate. But if the silver fox has already eaten a few, why have there been no changes? Hansen looked at the silver fox with wonder, as it gobbled down its daily pill. Hansen did not know if it was because the genes of the silver fox were too strong, thus making it difficult for it to mutate, or if it was because the pills would only affect humans. Hansen placed the silver fox aside. He put the gourd on the table and began practicing his Dongshua Sutra. Earlier, he had been too injured to practice the Dongshua Sutra. Instead, he had been using ice skin to recover the wounds on his body. Now that he was fully healed, he could be in training with the Dongshua Sutra again. After Hansen cast it, his body began to smell good. 
The pleasant fragrance overwhelmed the entire room. The silver fox was lying down near Han Sen, trying to sniff the pleasing scent that was coming from its master. Even the gourd slightly shivered, as if it was absorbing the perfume. After Han Sen concluded another round of training, he opened his eyes and looked at the gourd with much surprise. Hansen noticed strange streams of energy circling around it like wind. It was not unlike what occurred to the queen on the day she improved her heavenly go alongside him. Does this gourd possess the ability to channel energy? Did this thing absorb my pleasant fragrance? Hansen looked at the gourd with a puzzled expression, as he observed the streams of energy wandering around it. The energy was faint, however and the scent it carried was quite light, despite having done an entire cycle. The energy inside the gourd was amazing, and almost as good as the queen's heavenly go. There were many curious aspects to it that Han Sen could not explain. A while later, the gourd refined all the fragrance it could and Han Sen could no longer spot the energy traveling around it. He reached out his hand to touch the gourd and could immediately tell that its gentle pulsations had gotten stronger. All of a sudden, Hansen thought of something. He looked at the silver fox and remembered he used to smell a pleasant scent off it. He initially believed the silver fox just carried his master's scent due to being around him most of the times he trained, but now he believed there was more to it than that. The silver fox must have absorbed that pleasant smell of mine every time I practiced the Dongshiwa Sutra. It simply refined too quickly for me to catch the energy streams circling him, Hansen theorized. Is that why the silver fox follows me? And is that why the gourd allowed me to remove it from the vine? Is it because I practiced Dongshiwa Sutra? Hansen frowned at the thoughts, but he couldn't be sure. He held the gourd and played with it for a little while, unable to ascertain another reason for the state of these things. So, he put the gourd aside and decided to observe the silver fox intently the next time he practiced Dongshiwa Sutra. The next day, Hansen got to practicing the Dongshiwa Sutra once again. After completing his first cycle of training, he opened his eyes and quickly observed the silver fox. He could immediately tell the silver fox was carrying his pleasant fragrance, but it was mild. After a short while of observation, it disappeared entirely. The silver fox, who was lying down next to him, opened its eyes now, as well. It was surprised to see Hansen watching. So, it leapt onto his chest and rubbed it with its fluffy head. This little guy is strange. Do creatures know how to channel energy, and make it flow in and around their bodies? Hansen stroked the silver fox's head as he pondered the idea. The next time he decided to practice, he would remember how the gourd did it. The way it trained was largely different to the way humans did, and he wondered if he'd be able to adopt its method. A few days later, the queen finally arrived back at the shelter. But she didn't stay for long, as she only came back to tell Hansen that she was still busy with matters in the alliance, and that she'd be gone for a long time. Then she left. Hansen then decided to return to the ice fields. The mystery island was still there and many creatures had arrived because of it, bringing many much-needed resources to the area. Not many people in the ice fields had wings, and for this reason not many people could visit the island. Since no one was really able to take on the mystery island, Hansen decided to rush back and lend them a hand. If he managed to conquer the royal shelter on the mystery island, it would give him possession of a space castle. With the Crystal Palace, he'd have forces for the land, seas, and skies. Thinking of the benefits, Han Sen was now worried about missing out. If someone didn't claim it soon, it'd return to the empty and be lost. Han Sen had received a map for returning to the ice fields from Huangfu Ping Ching, and with that in hand, he delayed no longer. He set out back to the ice fields. Not long after exiting the shelter, Han Sen was traveling through a mountainous region. It was a desolate and lonely place, devoid of any sign of human life. But then, Hansen stayed his travel and said out loud, Old Chen, since you're here, why not join me? Those are some strong senses you possess, Chen Ran said as he came out from behind a big tree. Another twenty people emerged from a thicket of trees to surround Hansen. 
they were brandishing bows and the weaponry of assassins. As if they were prepared to attack, they all took aim at Han Senator one signal from Chen Ran was all it would take to turn Han Sen into a hedgehog. Old Chen, is this petty gathering all due to me refusing to transport your beast souls? Are you planning to kill me? Han Sen was still a top golden roarer when he spoke, and the tone of his voice was as mellow as ever. Chen Ran smiled and said, that was only a minor order of business, I would not harbor ill sentiments over your refusal of that request. You interest me a great deal, boy. As such, I am merely here to ask you a number of questions. If you answer them, I will bring you no harm. Then tell me, what is it you would like to know? Hansen did not move. Chen Rant's first question was straightforward. You have only been in this second shelter for a year, how have you managed to unlock your gene lock and amass such a high number of geno points? Chen Rant's eyes were fixated on Han Sen, and it was evident from his question that he had done a lot of research on him. He seemed to be in disgruntled shock at what he had learned, as well. When Han Sen was in the first shelter, he may have received aid from Qin's family. But in the second shelter, he had been dropped into the ice fields, a place that wasn't half as good as the island. With no resources and no relationships to count on, reaching this stage and becoming so powerful by himself was an incredible feat it was unheard of and quite frankly, unbelievable. Chen Ran believed he must harbor a big secret. Chen Ran thought if he learned this secret he could become even stronger. He thought he might even be able to beat the super creatures of legend and become the strongest evolver in history. He had been in the second shelter for almost a hundred years, and this had been his lifetime goal. But no matter how hard he tried and no matter how much he learned, he was still too weak and unable to kill even the smallest super creature. Now that Han Sen had entered his life, he thought he might have found a way to achieve this innermost desire. Chen Ran believed Han Sen had to have been supremely talented to have unlocked his first gene lock in the single year he had spent in the second shelter. He also believed that he must have had powerful backers in order to accomplish so much. But the truth was, Han Sen did not have those resources. He must have had some reason to make it so far, so quickly, though, and that was what Chen Ran wanted to learn. I thought you were going to ask me a question of some importance. This is nothing, and there was no need for you to put on a show and build an audience for my answering. Hansen laughed. Then tell me. Chen Ran was not amused, nor in the mood for jests, so he coldly looked at Han Sen. I have amassed so many geno points and have already unlocked my gene lock because of one simple reason, Hansen said, with a heightened tone of gravitas in his voice. What reason? Chen Ran asked, with widened eyes. It is because I am a genius. Hansen laughed. Chen Ran's face dimmed. He coldly smiled and responded, What a genius. After that, Chen Ran waved his hand, and the arrows of his followers loosed upon Hansen like rain. Hansen put away his golden roarer and moved to dodge the hail, not a single arrow hurt him. Chen Ran did not expect them to hurt Hansen either. Such a thing would only be possible if there were an additional 100 archers. The numbers he had with him were too few, so the most they could do was hinder his movement. Chen Ran gestured with his hand once more, and then a man with a sword ran towards Han Senator, he was incredibly fast and in three steps, he was already in front of him. The great sword he wielded was swung upwards, as if to tear the skies asunder. Chen Ran watched Hansen intently, keen to observe the full extent of his powers. He used to have three others with him that had unlocked their gene lock, but two of them died on Sky Pillar Mountain. But the only remaining elite was, by all accounts, Chen Rant's strongest man. Even when fighting together, Su Dong Jin and his other elite could not beat him. This person was called Huang Mian. Although he did not belong to the Chen family, he was looked upon highly enough to become a successor of Qi Gong. But because the Huang family was not as popular as the Chen family, the Qi Gong was not as effective. When Huang Mian arrived at the second shelter, he was unable to locate his family. After a chance encounter, Chen Ran took care of him and eventually became one of his most trusted allies. 
The Huang family's Qigong may not have been the best, but that did not mean it wasn't strong. The only reason their Qigong was not the best was because it was a lot more simplistic. Many people knew the name Sacrifice Sword Skill in the Alliance. It was a skill that was based on the usage of swords. But because there were many mysterious and unknown components of the skill, its modification into a hypergeno art had proven too difficult. Babies in the Huang family, upon learning how to crawl, were placed in rooms full of swords. The sword a baby touched first would be selected as the one they would carry for the remainder of their lives, and these swords were appropriately named lifetime blades. These blades, however, were not given for combat. Instead, they were provided as a signature. They defined and represented their carriers, becoming the core pillars and fundamental aspects of their existence. They were holy relics, only used in their practice of Qigong. Many people believed the lifetime blade was a form of spiritual sustenance for their bearers and had no association to the practice of Qigong. But in the Huang family, they believed that one who treated his lifetime blade as a holy relic, cherished and cared for it throughout the years, would one day be able to complete his training of the sacrifice sword skill. And after that, unlock his gene lock. Huang Mian was the first member of their family to unlock a gene lock in the second shelter. The sacrifice sword skill was insanely powerful, and in a sword fight, very few could beat him. Recently, Han Sen had come to learn many sword skills. Although he had not mastered it, his progress with the dual sword skill had come a long way. But seeing Huang Mian's attack, Han Sen quickly learned what a true sword skill was. That did not mean Han Sen thought the skill was powerful, however. It gave him the feeling that Huang Mian was an extension of the blade he wielded and vice versa. The sword and the person were bound together, like one. That was what was so profound. Dong. The ancient mascot sword effectively blocked Huang Mian's sword. Han Sen had activated his gene lock, which allowed him to sense the strength delivered in Huang Mian's attack. Quickly, he took a step back. Huang Mian's waist turned, and the sword became a spike. It drove towards Han Sen like a drill. Han Sen had never before seen a person use a sword skill so naturally. There was never much difference in the performance of sword skills from person to person, as a skill was just a skill. But this Huang Mian was a different beast. Huang Mian's wielding of a sword was so dexterous, adept, and natural-looking, it really looked like the sword was a part of him. It was like a third arm connected with his flesh and bone, as wieldy and agile as his other limbs. Han Sen's power was stronger than Huang Mian's, but when he attacked, he did so only with his sword. When Huang Mian attacked, his whole body was an extension of the metallic weapon, which gave him an edge. Han Sen was able to evade each attack, but every time he tried to return a hit, his sword clashed with his opponents, and he was forced to fall back. Even though their sword skills were even, Han Sen was at a disadvantage. If Han Sen hadn't turned on his gene lock, something which robbed him of all emotion, he'd undoubtedly have been in awe of his latest foe. Dong. Han Sen was pushed to the point that he had to summon the silver snake sword. He then used this sword to block his enemy's greatsword. With two swords versus one, Han Sen cast dual sword skill. But still, he was unable to gain the upper hand and remained evenly matched with Huang Mian's abilities. Chen Ran stood on the sidelines, watching them battle. He was shocked when observing Han Sen, as his speed and power were far exceeding his own lofty expectations. What amazed him the most were the sword skills he was employing. He was using two swords, yet despite that, he was able to cast separate sword skills from each hand. The power to have two minds like that was almost frightening. What was even scarier, however, was the fact that Han Sen could continuously cast sword skills with no reprieve or cooldown. It was as if he was a man powered by a high-octane, never-depleting generator. With such profound power, he suspected he chose the right opponent for Han Senator if it was anybody else, they would have been crushed and annihilated within seconds. The Huang family's sacrifice sword skill was the most oppressive, enemy-restraining sword skill in Qigong. 
Against Han Sen's barrage of attacks, he had to use sacrifice sword skill to avoid being at a disadvantage. No one else save the Huang family could do this. He really is a scary guy. Still, nothing more. Chen Ran coldly laughed. Chen Ran did not expect Huang Mian to beat Han Sen, though. He only wanted him to keep Han Sen engaged. Due to the low fitness cap on evolvers, they could not keep their gene lock open for extended periods of time. Eventually, they would become exhausted, too weary to fight. Now, Chen Ran only had to wait for Han Sen to use up all his strength. Once this was done, he could easily capture him. Chen Ran needed him alive, though. He had to learn all the secrets he possessed. Only a living Han Sen would be useful to Chen Ran. Chen Ran was not worried about him refusing to give up whatever secrets he possessed, as Chen Ran had thousands of ways that would make him give them up. And besides that, he actually hoped Han Sen would remain tight-lipped to begin with, as that would just allow him more time to have fun. Han Sen really admired Huang Mian. His power and speed may not have been on the same level as his own, and his sword skill wasn't as great as the dual sword skill Han Sen possessed, but still, he wasn't submitting as easily as Han Sen might have initially thought he would. Friend, this is between me and Chen Ran. There is no need for you to sacrifice your own life on his behalf. If you are not from the Chen family, you should leave now, Han Sen said. I accepted old Chen's money for his employment of my services. I have to see this through. Huang Mian kept moving his sword. Chen Ran wore a smile of disdain. He thought Han Sen could not last much longer, and that was why he resorted to talking Huang Mian out of fighting him. Han Sen did not say anything more, but he found the idea of killing Huang Mian to be distasteful. It was just as Chen Ran thought, though. Han Sen did want to use words to bring about an end to the fight and conserve his energy. He didn't want to reveal his secret weapon to Chen Ran by using it on Huang Mian first, either. Han Sen had come to learn a lot about Chen Ran, he was a smart, old fox. If Han Sen brought out his peacock crossbow to end the fight against Huang Mian now, he'd be running off before the corpse of his most ardent follower hit the ground. The skills of the Chen family were no joke and they were amongst the best the alliance had. Hansen did not believe he had what it took to keep the old fox where he was. But the old fox had dared to come after him, and so, Hansen would not let him escape so easily. Hansen realized Huang Mian had made his decision and was not willing to budge, regardless of the consequences. He had no choice but to continue fighting. Hansen was aware of the old man's true intentions, however. He knew Chen Ran wanted Huang Mian to drain him of all his energy by keeping his gene lock open. And so, when Chen Ran made his move, he'd lack the energy required to fight back. But Hansen wasn't concerned about this plan Chen Ran had concocted, because he had learned the third mantra of Long Live and Jade Sun Force. He could have his gene lock active for far longer than usual. Even if he was too tired to open his gene lock against Chen Ran, Han Sen would only have to summon his peacock crossbow, take aim, and pull the trigger to blast him to smithereens. If he could not use words to send Huang Mian away, he would continue his current engagement and take the time to learn what he could from him, from his posture with the sword to the details of his sword skills. Han Sen's sword skills were powerful, but he was not particularly great when it came to the acute wielding of the weaponry. Now that he had seen what a true master could do with a sword, he believed he had learned a lot more. Just by watching Huang Mian use a sword, he preferred to think of this entire ordeal as an educational experience. Han Sen didn't allow his mind to be led astray by anything else. He remained focused on the observation of his opponent's movements and thought about what he could learn and adopt. Through this fight, he hoped he would be able to employ a thing or two of what he had seen. As Han Sen continued to fight against Huang Mian, Chen Ran was firm in the belief that Han Sen did not have any more skills to use or tricks up his sleeve. If he had, how could he not have beaten Huang Mian by now? If he continued going like this, even if he did manage to defeat Huang Mian, he would be too worn out to resist capture. Chen Ran was not in a rush, so he continued to watch. 
He wanted to ensure Han Sen's capture and was willing to wait as long as it took. One hour later, Huang Mian's power was beginning to wind down. With constant fighting, the time one could keep their gene lock open was considerably shorter. This was happening to Huang Mian, and he was struggling to maintain his composure. Han Sen was not going to let this opportunity pass him by, so he exerted more and more power into his attacks in order to strike Huang Mian down. Chen Ran noticed how Huang Mian was struggling to keep up, and he had seen enough. He knew all about the power of Han Sen's fighting abilities, so he did not hesitate to summon clouds to swirl around his body and bring out his answer sword. Then, he leapt into the fray to fight alongside Huang Mian. The skills of the Chen family were powerful. Compared to Chen Ran, Zhu Ting was just a rookie. Chen Ran was like some strange bird, swerving from left to right in an unpredictable manner. Han Sen's two swords now had to block Huang Mian and Chen Ran's attacks simultaneously, which made him clumsy. Chen Ran's movements were too strange, and he didn't even have to touch the floor. He was flying, more often than not, and the entire spectacle didn't even seem human. He made many unexpected moves. Dong. The silver snake sword clashed against the answer sword, and it was a strange sensation. Chen Ran's sword felt like a cloud, and Hansen briefly thought his sword had hit a spring. After hitting it, his sword bounced back strongly, which forced him to take a few steps back. Han Sen, if you surrender now, I will spare your life. You are friends with Zhu Ting, after all. Chen Ran attacked as he tried to talk Han Sen into submitting and to extinguish his will to continue fighting. Old Chen, if you leave now, I will spare your life. You are related to Zhu Ting, after all. Han Sen was not mad, instead, he smiled as he spoke. You are a stubborn boy. Chen Ran's eyes went cold and he applied more strength to the fury of his answer sword. Han Sen was battling two opponents at once, and despite the disadvantage, neither of them was able to deal any damage to him. Han Sen's body was unbelievably light and graceful, and it was startling to see him remain calm under the attacks of two elites at once. You really know Heavenly Go, don't you? Did the queen teach you? How dare they break the oath that was sworn? It looks to me as if Huang Fu Xiongqing doesn't want to live, Chen Ran shouted. Even if the queen did teach me Heavenly Go, what does it have to do with you? This skill is a legacy of the Huang Fu family. They can teach whomever they please, there is no need for them to adhere to your petty, mistaken whims, Hansen sternly rebutted. It seemed as if Heavenly Go had something to do with the Chen family, otherwise, why would Chen Ran care so dearly? For this, Han Sen wanted to push it. Han Sen had always wondered why the queen was the only who had been able to learn it. No matter how difficult the skill was to learn, there were many students in the Aries Martial Hall. It would be impossible for them not to select another student to learn Heavenly Go. Huh, Huang Fu family is teaching Heavenly Go? If it still belonged to the Chen family, none would be able to dodge our seven twist, Chen Ran said. Everyone knows Heavenly Go belongs to the Huangfu family. Since when did it become a skill of the Chen family? Come on. Don't bullsh asterisk Timi, Hansen said, in an attempt to further aggravate Chen Ran. An old fox like Chen Ran knew what Hansen was trying to do, but he coldly said, You don't have to try to push me. After I capture you, I am going ask Huangfu Xiongqing himself. Then I can see what reason he has for not giving me back my Heavenly Go. After that, the clouds blazed out of Chen Ran wildly. The attacks of the answer sword came faster and faster. He wasn't aiming for Han Sen's weak spots, either, he was going for his limbs in an attempt to disable him. Han Sen was able to deal with Huang Mian's attacks, but as for the old fox, he really was displaying the power of someone who had lived in the second shelter for over a hundred years. His fitness was so powerful and the progress of his gene lock was incredible. Han Sen's hands became numb every time his swords went up against Chen Rance. His chest rumbled, as if he was going to spill blood. What an asshole. He is so powerful and only conspires to hurt others, Han Sen swore in his heart. 
But now that Hansen thought about it, Jin Ran wasn't too dissimilar to who he himself was. This realization quelled his swearing. Old Chen, you can leave now. Cease your attacks immediately. If you don't, don't blame me for what happens next. Assuming you don't mind, I'd like to see what happens next. Chen Ran coldly laughed. He believed Han Sen had reached the end of his tether, and his gene lock was on the verge of exhausting him fully. I don't mind. Han Sen took a step back and summoned his peacock crossbow. He pulled a raven feather out of his quiver and loaded it, as quick as he could. Chen Ran saw Han Sen pull out a crossbow and aim it at him. He disdainfully said, I believed you to be the sort that would pack real heat. You know, the big guns, not a crossbow. Chen Ran had been in the second shelter for a long time, and he had seen many things in his time there. He had even seen a sacred blood crossbow used in conjunction with a sacred blood bolt. Against him, he thought a crossbow would be useless. If it was an ordinary bow, on the other hand, Chen Ran would have some trepidations. The power of a bow was derived from its wielder, and such weapons could be imbued with magical properties and other special powers, as such, he would be quick to try and avoid getting struck by one. But the power of a crossbow was always derived from how it was initially manufactured. There was a limit to the power they had. Even a sacred blood bolt, against an elite like Chen Ran, would be useless. Chen Ran continued to swing his answer sword with greater power and greater speed. Ping! Hansen pulled the trigger and a black flash sparked from the crossbow's muzzle. The bolt was in front of Chen Ran's face. Chen Ran's face changed, not expecting a bolt to ever possess such horrifying speed. And since it was fired at such a close distance, it didn't look likely he'd be able to dodge it. But Chen Ran was a scary elder and his reaction speeds had no equal. With the answer sword, he blocked the black feather bolt. Dong. The blade deflected the speeding bolt at great cost. The berserk sacred blood answer sword shattered in half, shards splintering off in an array of different directions. The force knocked Chin Rant's body backwards, cleaving the earth with two three-meter-long skid marks. Pop. Chen Rant's mouth spewed blood. With utter shock, his eyes locked on the crossbow in Han Sen's hand. He could not believe a crossbow could possess so much power. Han Sen quickly saw that his first bolt did not kill Chen Ran, so without hesitation, he loaded up another and fired again. The black streak beamed towards Chen Ran once more. Chen Ran shouted, as clouds streamed out around him, masking his entire body in white puffs of cotton. Then, he immediately began flying away to dodge the second bolt. The Chen family seven twist is powerful. Han Sen admired his hurried escape, but his hands did not stop moving. Again, he loaded and fired one bolt after another, not allowing Chen Ran to escape. Chen Ran believed after dodging the first bolt, he'd be able to escape without a problem. The bolts were too frightening. He didn't dare rival such a formidable weapon not knowing what was wrong with Han Sen's crossbow and how it possessed such a terrifying power. What was more, he didn't expect Han Sen's crossbow to fire so rapidly. It was almost like a pistol. Chen Ran watched the black bolts soar past him in the sky, and the fear drove him insane. If crying would have provided him mercy, he'd have bawled his eyes out in front of Han Sen. Chen Ran gritted his teeth, flying like a creepy, headless bird in the air. He kept whizzing left and right with the strangest movements. He was smarter than a real bird. But no matter how strong and agile he was, even he could not dodge the flurry of bolts that were being sent his way. After dodging four bolts, he could not dodge the ones that came after. Pang! Pang! Chen Ran was barely able to dodge the next two, but the gusts of wind that accompanied the bolts rattled his body so much that more blood spilled from his mouth. He could no longer maintain his formation. The next second, a barrage of four bolts pierced his body. The bolts tore through the sacred blood armor he was wearing like hot knives through butter. The incredible power of the bolts sent him spiraling a few dozen meters away, pinning him to a nearby cliffside. Huang Mian shouted, 
and as he did, Han Sen turned to fire another bolt his way. Ping! The bolt shattered Huang Mian's greatsword into little more than glitter, and still, its speed was not impeded. It went on to pierce his right arm. Huang Mian did not react, as if he hadn't felt anything from the bolt that tore through his arm. Madly, he threw a fist towards Han Sen's face. What benefit has Chen Ran provided you? Why do you so earnestly wish to give your life for him? Han Sen took a step back and dodged Huang Mian's incoming fist. Huang Mian's punching skills were far inferior to his sword fighting ability, and thus not a threat to Han Sen. He saved my life, and as such, I must return the favor. Huang Mian bit down on his teeth and started throwing more punches. Then I will allow you. Hansen slapped Huang Mian's head, which caused him to fall down. The other people who had accompanied Chen Ran were already running to the hills, at this point. A powerful character like Chen Ran had been defeated by a bolt, and fearing the same would happen to them, they wished they had an extra set of legs so they could skitter away at a greater pace. They could not imagine how such a wretched crossbow could have come to exist. It was just like a pistol, and with such fearsome power, it was more overpowered than it had any right to be. Han Sen could not be bothered to chase the yahoos that scampered away, and instead, ventured to the cliffside Chen Ran had been pinned to. Chen Ran's body had four bloodstained bolts sticking out of him, but still, he had not died yet. He attempted to pull the feathers out, but couldn't. Going forward, the feathers were as soft as silk, but going backwards, they cut like a dozen razor blades. If he attempted to pull them out, the organs and bones inside him would be butchered. Ah, Chen Ran. I hate to say it, but it's true, none of this had to happen. Hansen smiled as he stood before Chen Ran's ruined body. Up and down, Han Sen's eyes lingered upon the near-lifeless, defeated. Han Sen, you dare kill me? The Chen family will have their revenge. A world of pain will be the only thing that can come from this. Chen Ran told Han Sen, as he seethed with rage. But blood oozed from behind his lips, choking the words he wished to spit out at Han Senator, what might have been an unnerving warning was instead a pitiful sight. If you want to live, tell me the secrets to learning seven twist, Hansen offered, smiling. Chen Rant's mouth was full of blood as he laughed. Kid, when I first wandered these lands, your father hadn't even been born yet. You dare give me such an ultimatum? Ha! Huh. Chen Ran spat blood out onto Han Sen's face. Then, he gritted his teeth, which turned the blood in his mouth black. Then his pulse stopped. He was dead. Han Sen, to ensure the fact, examined his body. Han Sen looked at Chen Ran with shock. He did not expect this evil, old fox, would be so wild as to use poison to finish himself off. I really shouldn't underestimate prominent figures of such big families. Their loyalty to each other is almost scary. Hansen thought about it for a while longer. Then, he started a fire to burn Chen Rant's body. If anyone from the Chen family came after him, his disappearance might lend credence to whatever story Hansen decided to concoct. Hansen also believed burning his body would be considered a good deed in the eyes of any higher power that might have been watching. It wouldn't have been a very noble thing to leave his body to rot in the wild, after all. But before Hansen lit the fire on Chen Rant's corpse, his lifeless body suddenly came to life. He jumped up and yelled, No, no, no. Stop. We can talk about this. Did you say you would like to learn Seven Twist? I can teach you, I can teach you. Han Sen's eyes opened wide and he stood motionless, looking at Chen Ran for a good long while. After some time, Han Sen quietly swore, freaking loyalty. I can't believe I was willing to believe this old man had any modicum of loyalty. That makes me mad. Brother Han, could you at least tend to my wounds? If I do not receive immediate aid, I might truly die. Death is fine, of course, but to meet my demise, without passing on the knowledge of my seven twists to someone as worthy as you would be a sorrowful crime. Chen Ran had been tied up against a big tree, with his wound sill exposed and seeping blood. His voice was a pitiable one, 
as if he was groveling a prayer before an ancient deity. It's okay if you fail to finish teaching me this, you do, after all, have many other family members. If you pass during our training, I will merely find someone else in your family to finish whatever you begin. Now, you better start reciting the manuscript to me. If your blood begins to dry, it'll be too late even if I wanted to save you. Han Sen was sitting opposite to the tree, his posture relaxed as he watched Chen Ran. Fine, fine, fine. I will tell you. But brother Han, after I have told you, you will keep your end of the bargain and set me free, yes? Chen Ran sought to confirm. If you continue to stall and delay like this, I won't be able to let you go even if I wanted to, Hansen coldly said. Seek to refine the delights, from a tempered fire of your own wrath. With clarity in speech, take flight and sail the skies, Chen Ran began telling Han Sen, after gritting his teeth. Okay, and what comes after that? Hansen interrupted Chen Ran to ask, as he had just begun reciting the teachings and special incantations of seven twists. After that, the ether of your mind should feel refreshed, Chen Ran answered. Good. Continue. Hansen smiled, also gesturing with his hands for Chen Ran to carry on with his recitation. He recited for quite some time. Hansen questioned almost every line to try to authenticate what Chen Ran was saying and see if he could catch him in a lie. But no matter what he asked, Chen Ran answered everything as precisely and unhesitatingly as one could. There didn't seem to be any problems. Brother Han, please, stop asking me so many questions. My life dangles from the mercy of your fingertips. For what reason might I possibly lie? Please, save me. If this continues, I really will die. No benefit can be yielded from my death, only trouble might be wrought. Think about it, others from the Chin family will assuredly come after you. You may not fear them, but they'd most definitely be a thorn in your side. Come, please let me go. Let me go as you would a fart. I promise I will never disrespect you or get in your way ever again. His wounds continued to ooze blood and the color was starting to leave his face. Do you remember you have taught me seven twists, is this something your family is okay with me knowing? Hansen stroked the silver fox's head as he spoke. Brother Han, why are you so stupid? I taught you seven twists, which is an insult and criminal deed in the face of my family's honor and heritage. If I told someone about this, I would be the one at the end of their swords. They'd kill me first, for what I have done is a treacherous act. They'd slice me up like a sushi roll of a thousand cuts. I don't want that and that is why my lips will remain sealed. Chen Ran looked as if he was going to start crying. Ah, I see. Hmm, give me a moment to think your plight over. After Hansen said that, he took a pill. Brother Han, there is nothing to think about. I won't tell anyone. Chen Ran was now begging. Hansen had his eyes closed, and it looked like he was practicing Qigong. Don't practice it yet. Help me. When Chen Ran saw Hansen start practicing Qigong, he started shouting in a panic. Hansen merely ignored him and continued with his practice. Not long later, Chen Ran began to smell a pleasant fragrance. Not caring very much, he believed it to be the smell of Hansen's pills. Seeing Hansen continue to ignore him, Chen Ran ground his teeth against each other and started meditating to aid his own wounds. But after Chen Ran breathed in the pleasant scent, it followed along with his meditation as he breathed in more and more. Chen Ran's body started to produce woolly clouds, which wandered around him. The wound sealed up quite a bit and the bleeding slowed. After Hansen completed a cycle of the Dongshiwa Sutra, he opened his eyes to take a look at Chen Ran. He watched his meditation intently. After a while, Hansen's heart started laughing. He thought to himself, this old fox really did give me a false seven twists. Seventy percent was genuine and thirty percent was nonsense. He altered the most integral components of the skill to try to trick me. Not long later, Chen Ran opened his eyes to the sight of Han Senator he shouted, Brother Han, I gave you everything. Please help me, lest I die here on this tree. 
It's better that you die, so you are not given the opportunity to harm innocent people in the future, Hansen coldly told him, looking into Chen Rant's eyes. You seek to break your promise? Chen Rant's face changed. Not yet. Let me ask you something, did Zhu Ting learn your seven twists? Hansen asked. Yes, Chen Ran answered. Then why is Zhu Ting's seven twists different than yours? Hansen squinted his eyes as he asked. Chen Ran's face changed, and he started yelling. That traitor. That treacherous dog. How dare he tell an outsider. I knew I should never rely on a bastard. You aren't any better. You tried to fool me. And as a repercussion for your own mischief, I don't see the point of letting you go. Hansen shrugged. No, no, no. Listen to me, I did not lie to you. Zhu Ting was just a bastard who was not qualified to receive the teachings of the genuine seven twists. You must have learned three twists from him. Chen Ran was speaking faster than a bullet. Isn't three twists the first component of seven twists itself? Is that wrong? Hansen asked. Of course it is wrong. Seven Twists has an exclusive Qi Gong, which is the one I just told you. Without it, you cannot learn Seven Twists. Three Twists is just a lesser offspring of the original skill, and it pales in comparison. Chen Ran continued, You should know, Zhu Ting learned Deadly Perfume. That isn't the exclusive Qi Gong for Seven Twists. I suppose it makes sense. How about you tell me about the relationship between Heavenly Go and Seven Twists? If you do that, I'll patch you up, Hansen proposed. The reason Hansen wanted Seven Twists wasn't because of its individual power, but it was because of something Chen Ran once said. He had said that if Heavenly Go was in the Chen family, their Seven Twists would be unstoppable. This must have been a lie, but there had to be some sort of relationship between the two. Otherwise, Chen Ran would have had no reason to say what he did. Chen Ran hesitated for a while, but then said, Heavenly Go and Seven Twists were birthed from a tome which belonged to my ancient ancestors. They are a pair. They are both used in conjunction with each other, combined to create what can only be defined as a god power. But that faithless Huangfu family is obscene. They stole Heavenly Go from us and altered it so it would no longer be compatible with Seven Twists. Heavenly Go has its own Qi Gong and Seven Twists has its own Qi Gong? How can they be combined together? Do you think I was born yesterday? Do you think you can fool me again? Hansen coldly snapped. Brother Han, why would I lie to you? Heavenly Go is the first part of this combo. You need to learn Heavenly Go before you learn Seven Twists. Do that, and you will become the strongest person to tread this world. It is the mightiest skill across all recorded history. Without Heavenly Go, our family can only learn the second half. So, Seven Twists is only 70% complete. With the base of Heavenly Go, you would be shocking to all who crossed your path. Brother Han, I have already told you everything. Fix me. Quick. Chen Ran begged. Old Chen, I really would like to fix you and set you free. But in addition to not telling me the truth, you are trying to kill me. Han Sun looked at Chen Ran's side. Chen Ran's face changed and he said, Brother Han, why would you say something like that? I am telling you the truth, there is no lie. And for me to be in such a position, how could I possibly try to kill you? After the entrance, I am supposed to go up nine tiers, not down, Hansen coldly said. Chen Rant's face changed, but he still insisted that he had told the truth. How come? I have always learned by going down nine tiers, ever since I was a kid. After the jade door, I should go left and then head up. The defense ballad should be three, not nine. Should I go on? Hansen squinted his eyes while looking at Chen Ran. Impossible. Impossible. Did that, Zhu Ting, know? Zhu Ting shouldn't know the real seven twists, you, you. Chen Rant's face looked at Han Sen as if he had just seen a ghost. There weren't many people in the Chen family who knew how to perform seven twists. 
those that did were afraid of outsiders learning the skill. That was why most students were only taught three twists instead of the original, complete variant. In addition to three twists, they were also given false, filler skills to change core components of the art. Even a masterclass person, had they not seen seven twists performed in its entirety, would not be able to tell the difference. If people were being taught the fake seven twists, the differences were so minor, they'd believe it was indeed the real thing. But if you continued to practice it, you could become mildly paralyzed, and in extreme cases, end up dead. Chen Ran could not understand how Hansen already knew the real seven twists. I have given you far more chances than you are worthy of, but still, you haven't said an honest word to me. Hansen raised his peacock crossbow and took aim at Chen Ran. No, don't kill me. I can't die. I can't die. Ping. Chen Ran's eyes opened with a look of utter despair cast across his face. A bolt had blown a hole through his head. People like you, enemies of mine, I don't feel safe leaving you alive. Hansen returned his peacock crossbow. He didn't want to let Chen Ran go in the first place. Hansen burnt Chen Ran's corpse as he initially planned to, retrieved his bolts, and continued his journey back to the ice field. Although he already had seven twists, he would need Heavenly Go as a base. Otherwise, he'd have to start from scratch. Although Hansen had stolen Heavenly Go from Queen, he'd have to learn it in its entirety from the source Qigong. And that would take a long time. Hansen was already in the midst of learning Dongxian Sutra and Jade Skin, so he didn't really have enough time to spare to practice another Qigong. I wonder if I can use the Dongxian Sutra to replace Heavenly Go. After all, certain techniques of the Dongxian Sutra aren't all that different to Heavenly Go. But I'm not sure if the Dongxian Sutra can wholly replace Heavenly Go. Under the Silver Fox's protection, Han Sen's journey was almost too tame. That was why, with his thoughts free, he wondered if he could use Dongxian Sutra for the base of Seven Twists. The results of his attempts were better than he thought. Hansen had noticed, ever since he stole Heavenly Go from Queen, he could use Dongxian Sutra to simulate the skill. He could even simulate seven twists. But that did not mean Hansen had really learned Heavenly Go and seven twists in their original form, he was just simulating them through the Dongxian Sutra. And that still meant he was, at his core, using Dongxian Sutra. But for Hansen, that was already enough. When Heavenly Go and Seven Twists were combined together, Han Sen was able to fathom the terrible power such a combination could yield. The original Seven Twists included, as the title suggested, Seven Airborne Twists. But combined with Heavenly Go, the move wasn't quite so simple. With both of these together, he would not need wings to soar the skies in flight. And this was something only a handful of surpassers were capable of. He could do it straight away if he combined Heavenly Go and Seven Twists, but he'd need enough energy. Provided he had enough, he could fly through the air as free as a bird. Seven Twists would no longer be borrowing the strength of the air seven times, it'd be far more. Chen Ran said you could fly for thousands of miles, but that was clearly an exaggeration. For airborne battles, however, it was something that would prove incredibly useful but flying required a lot of fitness and a lot of energy. Hansen hated the fact that his Dongxian Sutra's progress was so slow, and he had no idea when he could unlock its first gene lock. He could use Dongxian Sutra to simulate the arrow flying skill, but it would only last 15 minutes. But even that was a scary thing, because it was entirely different than using a beast soul. This was the true power of flight and it would allow for the complete freedom of his body to do what it wished, just as efficiently as it could on the ground. Han Sen was so excited at the prospect, he continued to practice it on his way. Heavenly Go's formation was flat, but combined with seven twists, it became a three-dimensional formation with increased power. While this was quite the boon, it also required a user powerful enough to use it. With the Silver Fox protecting him on his way, and the map he had received from Huang Fu Ping Ching, Han Sen arrived on the other side of the Devil's Mountain safely. This whole area belonged to a man called Lu Hui. 
Han Sen had heard that this man was the captain of the Blue Blood Special Force and the Blue Blood Reserve Force. To become such a captain meant he had to be quite a special person. There were three royal shelters that were all under the control of Lu Hui. He was the boss of this area, and even though there existed another boss to the north, no one could dare to challenge him here. This was his domain. Hansen once asked around about Lu Hui's power, and the answers he received were quite shocking. Every one of Lu Hui's men were incredibly strong, far stronger than an average soldier of the ice field. Hansen was lucky to have the Devil's Mountain separating his domain from Lu Hui's. Otherwise, defending the ice field from either Lu Hui or the northern boss would be a near futile endeavor. Hansen followed the path Thunder Devil once took, and it wasn't long before he caught sight of a giant floating island in the skies above the ice field. There were many flying creatures soaring to and fro around the mystery island, as if they were devils searching for their next hapless victims. Back at the royal shelter, Hansen asked to see Yang Manli for a report on recent happenings during his absence. Because very few people owned high-class wings, Yang Manli was off having a quick look at the mystery island. They hadn't attacked the royal shelter there yet, due to their lack of the necessary strength. There were many creatures flying down from that place, however, which had resulted in a few casualties across the ice fields. But fortunately, they had managed to kill a good number of the beasts that had caused trouble for them. Right now, the humans that were too weak to fight were under curfew and prohibited from leaving the shelter. Elites who went out to hunt had to do so in large parties, in fear of being attacked by the rogue flying monsters. As for the royal shelter on the mystery island, not much was known. No one had dared to venture near it, so it was not known what the spirit inside looked like. Yang Manli and a few of her trusted allies were now near it, and they watched many big flying creatures circle around the spirit shelter. Following this latest reconnaissance, they decided to return. Let's discuss how we plan to deal with the royal shelter at a later date, for now, you should rest. Hans and new discussions were pointless. With the weakened forces of the ice fields, and the lack of evolvers that could fly, attacking the royal shelter would be futile no matter how many conversations were held. Although it was a bit of a waste, Han Sen could only bring the silver fox there with him. The greatest chance of conquering the place would be to fly up there by himself, fox in hand, venture to the spirit hall, and kill the spirit residing there. But that would still be a near-impossible task. If the spirit in the royal shelter flew away, it'd still be around the ice fields, providing many resources. Boss, did you kill Chen Ran? After everyone left, Zhu Ting stayed and asked Han Sen with a low tone of voice and a droopy face. I don't know. Han Sen did not admit it or deny it. There was no point in denying it. Even if Chen Ran's people had not run off, there were still many people who knew he was coming after Han Senator, the most likely conclusion of what transpired would have still been the same. But Han Sen was not willing to admit it, no matter what people thought. Besides, no one had seen Han Sen kill Chen Ran, and his body had already been cremated. Zhu Ting, with a conflicted expression, looked at Han Sen and said, Chen Ran was one of the few elders in the Chen family. He was a scarily powerful evolver and evil of heart. His passing at your hands would be a great shock to the Chen family. They won't dare trouble you here in the safety of a shelter's walls, but out there? In the wild? You should be wary. I didn't kill him. Even if I did, would they dare to kill a member of the Alliance? Han Sen was not afraid of the Chen family. Han Sen was a member of the Special Security Operations Team and had since become leader of the Ice Fields. No matter how powerful the Chen family was, killing Han Sen was impossible. It may be difficult for them to deal with you, on a surface level, but you know them. There is much strife between members of the Chen family. While others are partial to doing it, many do not wish to offend the Jin and Qin families. After a brief pause, Zhu Ting continued, saying, But Chen Ran had a real brother. He is a surpasser, and a powerful figure of the Chen family. He is the sort who is keen on the prospect of revenge. If he can't kill you publicly, there are many other ways he could go about it. 
Give me an example, Hansen said. I'm not sure of any method he might try, but I just want you to be careful, that's all. Zhu Ting shook his head. You are from the Chen family, are you not afraid or upset that I killed Chen Ran? Hansen gave Zhu Ting a strange look. Zhu Ting wore a wry smile, and he said, I am nobody to them. I am just a faceless bastard to a family who has plenty of children and grandchildren of their own to take care of. A bastard can never be treated on the same level. Do you know why I had to learn deadly perfume? Hansen watched Zhu Ting intently, allowing him to explain. The Qin family owned a country during a certain planet's era. It was ruled as a monarchy. Since time immemorial, kings have been subject to many assassination attempts. Many are killed by poison, that is why there are designated food testers. They taste the food to confirm there are no poisons within. Deadly perfume was taught to the people who performed that task. If what they consumed contained poison, their body would release a perfume. If the poison wasn't too strong, the tester could live due to the teachings of deadly perfume. If the poison was too much for the defense provided by deadly perfume, the tester would end up dead. Deadly perfume is quite powerful, few poisons can breach its protection. Isn't that right? Hansen asked. Zhu Ting shook his head and said, poisons used to kill kings are never so simple. The reason deadly perfume was so powerful is because of how often these incidents occurred. Every time a new poison was discovered, deadly perfume would be altered and improved to defend against it. Across the countless generations, deadly perfume has existed, heaven knows how many deaths were sustained to bring it to where it is today. Only the servants of the Qin family can learn deadly perfume, where only real members of the Qin family can learn the exclusive Qigong Seven Twists. Do you still think I am considered a Qin? Zhu Ting sighed and proceeded to say, Qin Jiu Ling commanded me to find a way in which I might kill you. But I know there is no way for me to do that. I cannot return with my mission incomplete and so, I will never return to the Chen family. I can only remain hidden in this shelter, never again venturing beyond its walls. You stay here, then. As long as you are on the ice fields, and even if members of the Chen family do show up, they won't be able to lay a finger on one hair on your head, Hansen sympathetically said, secretly unsure whether or not this was a ploy of Zhu Ting. Was he being truthful? Hansen did not know. But having Zhu Ting on his side was more useful than not. For now, he could continue working for Hansen while being comforted at the same time. After Zhu Ting left the room, Hansen departed the shelter. He found a place where there was no one around, summoned his wings, and flew up towards the mystery island with the silver fox in hand. With the silver fox near, the flying creatures did not venture close and his passage to the mystery island was unhindered. This mystery island was far larger than the one he saw in the first shelter. You could see from afar a black metal shelter in the middle of it, like some crouching goliath. It was far smaller than the royal shelter that had belonged to Princess Yang, and swathes of horrific beasts circled the skies around it. He could tell the spirit shelter was far stronger than the previous one he had striven to conquer. But the creatures were merely set dressings to Han Sen, right now. Holding the silver fox, Han Sen proceeded onwards as the hordes of creatures parted to provide a path. Upon reaching the front gate, he walked inside. Perhaps it was because this shelter was on a floating isle, but every creature that populated this island had the ability to fly. There were giant birds, tigers with wings, creatures with four wings, and even a giant snake that writhed its way across the rooftops had a pair. Hansen entered the menacing metal shelter. All of a sudden, he saw a dark figure fly across the mystery island. He furrowed his brows and called aloud, I have already issued a command prohibiting access to the mystery island. Who has disobeyed my orders and come? Standing on the high wall of the metal shelter, Hansen noticed it was the figure of a man that was nearing. He did not have a pet like the silver fox by his side, and he was being chased by a host of monsters. He was fighting his way through the hordes of creature, bones, and blood paving his wake. 
no monster could hinder his approach, and he was coming directly for the metal shelter. Hansen caught a glimpse of the man's face, which was unknown to him. He had black hair and black armor, his eyes were pretty, and a copper sword gleamed in his hand. His finesse with the sword was remarkable and each swipe of the sword was intimidating to watch. Strange. How come I have never seen this man in the ice fields before? Hansen was positive he had never seen this person on the ice fields before. With sword skills like that, he would have recognized him with ease. The man rushed near, and when he saw Hansen standing atop the high wall, his expression was puzzled. Hansen stood on the wall of the spirit shelter without a single creature around him. A silver fox rested gracefully on his shoulders. The two looked like a spirit themselves. And that's what the man believed Hansen to be. Without prior warning, the man began swinging his sword towards Hansen. Hansen frowned, not sure what was wrong with the stranger. Without saying a word, he had cast a powerful skill and was attempting to assault him. Wind streams trailed behind the sword as it soared through the air with a frightening velocity. With such power, this man had most likely opened his gene lock. As Hansen watched him come, he was positive this man had decided to steal the shelter away from him. He would not comply with his brutish introduction, and so Hansen decided to engage the man in combat. Wang Yuhang was shocked as the fight began. He had been in the second shelter for over a decade and had sieged many royal shelters and battled many royal spirits in that time. After he managed to unlock his gene lock, he had never gone against an opponent that rivaled his own talent. Within two seconds, two long swords were coming down on him wildly and he could not gain an advantage. He had never been in such a situation before, for he did not think royal spirits could become so powerful. Hansen believed his opponent was quite powerful, too. He was using his dual sword skill to the best of his abilities, and while it may have suppressed his latest opponent for the time being, he'd need to do more if he sought victory. The opponent was not just dexterous with the sword, but also profoundly capable in a variety of ways. He looked like a genius who hailed from a big family. Hansen feared that he might even be stronger than Shui Kuang. I have no quarrel with you. Even if ownership of the royal shelter is your goal, killing me is hardly necessary. Hansen was preparing to use his peacock crossbow to kill his attacker. The last thing he wanted right now was entanglement with another fighter, so he decided to test his resolve through dialogue first. You aren't a spirit? When Wang Yuhang heard what Hansen said, he was surprised. Quickly, he returned his weapons and looked upon Hansen's face in disbelief. How could you mistake me for a spirit? Have you ever seen a spirit like this before? Hansen breathed a sigh of relief, but he never expected his opponent to believe he was a spirit. Wang Yuhang observed Hansen for a little while longer and then approached to hold his fists together and bow. He said, I apologize. I did not mean to offend you, my friend. I looked upon you as you stood atop the high wall. The creatures encircled you, not daring to approach in fear. With your gracious looks, you being the ruler of this place was a natural assumption of mine. Or so I thought. Looks can be deceiving. But again, I must apologize for the skipping of formalities, so perhaps we can start over. Might I know your name? Hansen reviewed his explanation and thought that it made sense. With a wry smile he responded, I am Han Senator out here in the ice fields, I can only presume you have heard of me. You are Hansen? Wang Yuhang looked even more surprised. With a look of greater disbelief, he had to ask, You are the Hansen that graduated from Black Hark Military Academy? Assuming Black Hark Military Academy did not have a second Hansen, then yes, that would be me, Hansen jovially responded. How is this possible? You have only been in the second shelter for just over a year, and yet, you have already unlocked your gene lock. Pray, tell me how you accomplished such a praiseworthy feat. Upon hearing what Hansen told him, Wang Yuhang was no longer confused. Instead, he was now merely rattled with surprise. I like to chalk it up to natural talent. 
Hansen touched his nose, starting to feel like every Tom, Dick, and Harry knew about his brief, one-year tenure in the second shelter. Wang Yuhang froze for a moment, but after a while, started saying, for one to open their gene lock in one year is not something the mere talented are capable of. Nay, such an accomplished deed is reserved for those that hail from the realm of the super-talented. After another brief silence, Wang Yuhang self-mockingly proceeded to say, My name is Wang Yuhang. I am Wang Mingming's uncle. Before I embarked upon the adventure that led me here, to the ice fields, Wang Mingming recommended that I seek you out and see if there was aught you required assistance with. Now, clearly, do I see that there is not. You are Mingming's uncle? It was now Han Sen's turn to be surprised. I am her uncle, yes, twenty years her senior, as a matter of fact. Wang Yuhang smiled and continued to say, if you would prefer it, feel free to refer to me as little uncle, just as she does. If uncle does not sound appropriate, then how about big brother Wang? Either of those will do. I will stick to little uncle, little uncle. Else, I am unsure how I would tell Meng Meng about our meeting here today. Hansen coughed. This man was twenty years older than her, but still spoke as if he were young. What a man! Seeing as we are now formally acquainted with one another, I won't beat around the bush, we'll venture inside this place together. He who deals the final strike to a creature will get to keep the body, but no matter what, ownership of this shelter will be yours, Wan Yuhang said. Little uncle, you should go inside by yourself. I believe it would be inconvenient for us to go inside together, Han Sen suggested. Excuse me? Little Han, are you issuing me a handicap? Wang Yuhang smiled. Han Sen pointed at the fox on his shoulder, and as he did so, he said, This pet I have has a special power. For as long as it is with me, even monsters that lurk below the blackest waves of the sea will steer clear of me. If we go in together, I fear we won't be able to obtain any kills. A pet such as this truly exists? My oh my, that is remarkable. Wang Yuhang, with another look of shock, peered intently at the silver fox. But at least now, he understood why all the creatures were staying away from Hansen. What a wonderful creature, it brims with a delectable power. With this fox in tow, does that not enable you easy passage to the inner sanctum of any spirit shelter? You could own any spirit shelter you desired, with this little thing, Wang Yuhang wondered. This ability only works against creatures, unfortunately. The spirits have to be dealt with manually, Hansen told him, not feeling the need to hide any of this information. Well, that's good enough for me. Come on, let us venture inside. Perhaps you can show me what it's got? Wang Yuhang tugged at Hansen's sleeves, leading him inside the metal shelter. Like usual, no creature dared to come close, and without any hindrances, they found their way into the spirit hall, with little to no trouble. This amazed Wang Yuhang. A most powerful pet, indeed. Wang Yuhang was not interested in the spirit, and only continued to stare at the silver fox. It looked as if he really wanted one for himself. Hansen gazed at the spirit in front of him, and this brought a great joy to his heart. It was a female spirit. She was clad in chiffon armor, which highlighted her pair of gorgeous legs. She had sharp ears and a pair of wings on her back, shaped like those of a butterfly. Her eyes were purple, like little amethysts. The spirit was beautiful like an elf. When Wan Yuhang turned to look at the elf-like spirit, he presented a wry smile and said, Only now do I regret the opportunity that was given to try to tackle this place alone. Would I have beaten her, this stunning spirit might have been mine. If little uncle is interested in a little competition, how about we both go now and see who first achieves ownership of the spirit? Hansen smiled. Nay, the Wang family does not disregard what they have already stated. This one is all you, little Han. Wang Yuhang waved his hand as he talked. Hansen did not wait around. Immediately, he ran directly into the center of the spirit hall. The spirit watched Hansen come at her, and without any hesitation, rushed to meet him. The creatures had all fallen back, so it was just the spirit left, willing to fight to the bitter end. 
Hansen preferred not tangling with her himself, so he summoned Princess Yin and Princess Yang. He let them deal with the spirit, while he went on, racing towards the spirit statue. Holy smokes! Twin beauty spirits? When Wang Yuhang saw the Yin princess and Yang princess, his eyes went wider than those of a bull, and his mouth dropped open. The elf spirit wanted to go after Han Sen but found herself suitably suppressed by the twin spirit that had been loosed upon her. Quickly, Han Sen reached the spirit statue and snatched the spirit stone from its forehead. I, empty spirit, am willing to submit and offer absolute loyalty to a new master. I will become a faithful servant from now until eternity. The elf-like spirit gave up the fight, knelt before Han Sen, and spoke her vow. Wang Yuhang froze up after witnessing it. He just stood there, watching Han Sen effortlessly place the spirit stone onto the empty spirit princess's forehead. In a blinding light birthed from the stone, the empty spirit princess disappeared from sight. Little Han, nay, for I should say, Brother Han, you are incredible. How did you accomplish that? I can only surmise there may be a thing or two you can teach me. I have been attempting to earn a sexy, princess class spirit for myself and have never been able to. Wang Yuhang approached, placing his hand on Han Sen's shoulder. His face was beaming with happiness, and the look of a mature elder quickly dissipated. It's all down to luck, Han Sen said. Luck is a fickle mistress. I pray for good fortune every day, and especially before I assault a royal shelter. I'll even shower before that, as well. But every spirit I have encountered so far has chosen to self-destruct when given the spirit stone. Wang Yuhang's face looked disheartened. Little uncle, I am regretfully unable to help you with that. Hansen gave him a face that looked like he wanted to help, but due to the circumstances, could not. For truth? Then, perhaps you can teach me of a finer way I may ensure a capture? Or perhaps, if you were willing to sell one of your spirits, I would most certainly be willing to buy. Wang Yuhang almost had saliva drooling from the corners of his mouth as he made the suggestion. His eyes continued to drift towards Princess Yin and Princess Yang. He almost seemed obsessed with the need for one, and he continued his dialogue, saying, You can sell me as many as you'd like, money is of no concern to me. Little uncle, how about this? The next time you locate a spirit you would like, call me. I will help you get the spirit stone. With my luck, there is a 90% chance I will be able to obtain it for you. Hansen then quickly returned Princess Yin and Princess Yang. Hansen had spent a long time trying to defeat and obtain the twin spirit, so he would never contemplate selling them. Furthermore, he often called upon them both to massage his shoulders and make him feel good. Plus, with the Crystal Palace being so big, the services of Yin and Yang were of great help to the Snow Lady in keeping it operational. Hansen felt it was undermanned as it was, so he didn't want to sell them even if he could. That works for me. In that case, my future happiness rests firmly upon your shoulders. Wang Yuhang licked his lips, and the way he held himself looked as if he was trying to hide his disappointment at not being able to purchase the twin spirit. But Wang Yuhang was comforted by Han Sen's willingness to help him with a spirit stone, the next time he located a spirit he wanted. After witnessing the Yin and Yang princesses in action, and watching Han Sen claim fealty from the empty princess, Wang Yuhang regarded him as some sort of lucky goddess. Repeatedly, he grabbed his hand and wished for greater fortune, not letting go. Ahem, little uncle, what year is this? All I your superstitious beliefs for one minute. Hansen felt it strange to have his hand vigorously shaken and almost worshipped by such a big man. Little Han, you are young, yet you are a repeated recipient of good fortune. You do not know the pains of someone who must live their life as a thrall to the nasty pangs of unluckiness. I will let you know that your big brother, that would be me, is such a thrall. This ill fortune has plagued my lifetime, extending all the way back to my school days, when we separated seats in our classrooms. There were twenty-five boys and twenty-three girls in my year. Traditionally, one boy and one girl would share a desk. But the two additional boys would have to sit together, 
and as luck would have had it, I was one of those boys. I never sat next to a girl once during my time growing up. After Wang Yuhang recited his tragic school time story, tears welled up in his eyes. But Hansen couldn't say anything before he continued talking. And when we played games, I'd always be grouped with a boy. And my desk partner was frequently absent, too, which meant I had to spend many days grouped with my teacher. You don't know my pain, brother. You don't know my pain. And after leaving school, growing up, I never once won the lottery. I have never won a card game. If I go to hunt small monsters, I can guarantee you I will somehow summon a stampede of vicious, hungry, big bloodthirsty monsters. When I kill creatures, I never receive their beast souls. When I get a spirit stone, services of the spirit are never offered. I previously accepted my fate for that which it was, until today. After meeting you, I know I have located my savior. Wang Yuhang was dribbling snot and tears, as he vigorously stroked Han Sen's hand. It was like he had been single for thirty years and was now meeting a woman that was willing to give him the time of day. Uh. Little uncle? I just remembered I have some, uh, business that I must attend to, away from here. How about we continue this discussion another time? Hansen felt awkward. Wang Yuhang was a person who was super duper unlucky. Hansen thought he should be as far removed from him as possible, lest his own luck be poisoned by his proximity. But Wang Yuhang was still tightly gripping his hand, as if he'd found a soulmate. He looked eager to relay to Hansen his entire life story. Hansen tugged and pulled his hand back a few times, but Wang Yuhang did not budge. Roar. All of a sudden, a loud roar shook the ground. Hansen felt a buzzing noise in his head, and he almost fell over. Oh no. Hansen's face changed. Not only he had sensed the danger, but the silver fox, too. It hissed and growled as it looked around in alarm. Hansen quickly exited the spirit hall. Wang Yuhang was shaken from his miserable days and followed him closely. They both looked to the skies. What they saw petrified them. After Han Sen collected the spirit, the creatures of the island had all left. But one remained in the darkened sky. It broke through the clouds, heading directly to Mystery Island. The skies burned a fiery red and the atmosphere of terror was enough to suffocate a person. A second later, the scary shadow crash-landed in the metal shelter, shaking the entire island. Twenty meters away from them, a monster with eyes of fire stared them down. The creature looked like a Tyrannosaurus Rex. It had leathery red scales shielding its entire body, and four wings wreathed in fire. A spiral horn protruded from its head, and fire writhed out of its nose. Its eyes, as big as wagon wheels, had licks of flame inside the pupils, and it stared at Han Sen and Wang Yuhang. It breathed out smoke from its mouth, which looked like the gaping maw of a volcano. Split up. You go left, I go right, Hansen quickly shouted, before dashing off. The creature was intimidatingly large. Hansen thought to draw his crossbow and fire a bolt, but even if it pierced the fiend's thick scales, he feared it would only hit it with the power of a toothpick. Wang Yuhang heard what he was told and ran off to the left. He heard the creature roar, and a geyser of fire shot out from its mouth. It engulfed the spirit hall in fire and the structure immediately began collapsing under the scorching heat. Roar! The creature that looked like a T-Rex immediately took off after Wang Yuhang. Not wanting to be dinosaur chow, Wang Yuhang ran as fast as his legs could carry him, yelling. He looked like a pitiable fellow, with a T-Rex gnashing at his heels. The clothes on his body were tickled by the flames that escaped the creature's mouth, setting them on fire, which made Wan Yuhang begin calling out. Han Sen was running like the wind, and he thought to himself, you really are unlucky. The monster picked you, even though I approached it first. I didn't mean for that to happen. As he was talking to himself, Han Sen managed to exit the metal shelter and had a clear shot of escaping the mystery island. But all he could hear were the repeated screams from Wan Yuhang, who was continuing to be pursued by the T-Rex. 
It didn't seem likely he was going to escape without Hansen's intervention. I don't care. We only just met, I barely know the fellow, Hansen's mind stated, while his legs stood firmly, refusing to depart. Although Wang Yuhang was unlucky, he was not a bad person by any means. Furthermore, he was Wang Mingming's uncle. Hansen knew how guilty he might become if he were to leave him behind in such a heartless fashion. But he's so unlucky. Even if I do save his life, he'll probably end up dead due to a similar misfortune sometime in the future. Hansen spoke this out, but immediately after, bit down on his teeth. He hissed, turned around, and ran back into the blazing inferno. If Wang Yuhang ran alongside him, bringing the monster with him, he wouldn't have had these second thoughts. Wang Yuhang was well aware of his own misfortune, but despite that, he heeded Han Sen's instruction to run in the opposite direction, pulling the monster with him. He was a good, honest man. Fine. I'll do my part, but I won't risk any more than I have to, to try to save him. He'll still have to put in the effort. Hansen drew his peacock crossbow and loaded it with a raven feather bolt. Then, he began to approach the rampaging monster. The whole mystery island was ablaze, and the flames that the T-Rex breathed were enough to melt the sturdy metal structures that composed the shelter. It ran really fast, too. Wang Yuhang was unable to shake the creature, and his body had suffered a few bad burns. There were fiery holes in his clothes and his hair was singed. But Wang Yuhang, despite his unluckiness, was a powerful warrior. Although he looked to be in a sorry state, he had managed to outpace the lunatic T-Rex for a good while without suffering any injuries. He looked pitiable, sure, but they were minor wounds and nothing that could not be quickly remedied. Han Sen was not a reckless person, so he wanted to survey the area and approach the situation in as safely as possible. He didn't want to charge in like a buffoon, so he gauged the events from a good distance away. Observing the pursuit made Hansen really take notice of how unlucky Wang Yuhang was. He didn't know how or why the T-Rex was so determined to catch him. It was as if it had been locked on, and nothing seemed to sway its desire to incinerate the running man. This guy excels at being a party tank. He pulls all the aggro with no effort. Hansen continued to watch from afar and sighed. After a period of observation, Hansen could not espy any weak spots on the creature. Its whole body was covered in red scales, and he could immediately tell how difficult it would be to penetrate them. Even though the creature was fast, it was pretty slow in terms of super creatures. While the raven was unfairly fast, this T-Rex was much slower than even the red-clad donkey. With this speed, there should surely be no fear of it catching up to me. Hmm, let's see if I can get its attention. Hansen was standing on the rooftop of a palace in the shelter. He raised his crossbow and took aim at the T-Rex. As soon as he had a clear shot at the monster's eye, he would pull the trigger. Ping! Hansen fired the raven bolt across a distance of 50 meters. His aim was impeccable and it seemed to be a guaranteed hit on the T-Rex. But right before it skewered the monster's eyeball, the creature blinked to shield its eye. Dong. The bolt did go in, but the monster's eyelid was thick. The bolt remained lodged in it, not dealing damage to the actual eye itself. The T-Rex's eyelid did not have any scales, and it was evidently weaker than the rest of the body. The creature was knocked back. It roared in pain and looked at Hansen from across the battlefield. Hansen started running, and the T-Rex took off after him. He felt as if a giant flamethrower was pulling up behind his bottom, getting closer and closer. The air around him was getting hotter, and the soft fabric of his clothes looked ready to burst into flames. Brother Han, you are a remarkable example of a human being. Your charity is boundless. I almost knew it for a fact that you would not abandon me to the grisly maws of that ferocious monster. Wang Yuhang was touched by the gesture and sung his words of praise from across the battleground. I'm not a nice man, Hansen responded. See if you can draw its attention once more, I need to see if I can get a few more hits on its eye. With some luck, my luck, we can bring an end to this wretched thing. It is my pleasure to be of aid. 
Wang Yuhang did not delay in his agreement to act. Han Sen expected Wang Yuhang to summon a bow, or at least a spear, to throw at the monster, to regain its attention. But randomly, Wang Yuhang merely scrambled to pick up a piece of metal from the smoldering metal shelter, and threw it at the monster. Ping! The metal piece plunked against the T-Rex's shiny red scales. The damage dealt equated to that of a tickle. But that was all it took to garner its attention and pull it away from Han Senator, the monster turned to look at Wang Yuhang and took off after him once more. This way, you dumb doggy. I'm over here. Chase me, I taste delightful. Wang Yuhang called at the T-Rex. He even turned around, bent over, and mooned the T-Rex, clobbering his own butt cheeks, to get it to follow. He yelled, thick pork rind here, come get your free sample. Wang Yuhang's clothes were mostly in cinders, and Han Sen could see much of his posterior. He danced and slapped his own bottom like a pair of bongos, as Han Sen simply sighed, failing to comprehend the situation in which he found himself. Han Sen looked on hopelessly. He thought to himself, is this guy stupid? All he has to do is attract the T-Rex, is any of that necessary? Can't he just hit it and run? The T-Rex was incredibly angry, however. It roared to the sky, then brought down a geyser of flames on Wang Yuhang. Half on fire, Wang Yuhang took off running like a lunatic, with the T-Rex back on his heels. Damn, at least it worked well. Han Sen watched with wide eyes, thinking Wang Yuhang had really turned his opinion on him around. Brother Han, I beg that you hasten your move. I am being roasted alive. Wang Yuhang was running as fast as he could, as his hands tried to pat down the flames that were incinerating his bottom. Hold on, little uncle. Hansen raised his peacock crossbow and took aim at the T-Rex's eye once more. Ping! Hansen fired the bolt at the T-Rex's eyelid once more, but again it blinked and the bolt couldn't pierce through it entirely. But exceeding Hansen's expectations, Wang Yuhang immediately picked up more pieces of metal to lob at the monster, all the while shouting and screaming. The T-Rex only looked at Han Sen for one second before resuming its chase of Wang Yuhang. Little uncle, that's right. You can do it. I have faith in you. Han Sen couldn't fathom the sordid deeds Wang Yuhang must have committed in a past life to be given such bad luck in this one. The aggro he could pull, with such little effort, was astonishing. And now, with Wang Yuhang subject to the T-Rex's pursuit once more, Hansen got back to searching for the perfect chance of striking the T-Rex's eye. Although it wasn't quick on its feet, the reactions of this super creature weren't too slow. Even with Hansen taking his best possible shot, the creature always caught the bolts with its eyelid. Some bolts were dodged outright by the T-Rex, deflected off its scales. Trying to penetrate anywhere else on its body was a futile endeavor, for all the bolts would do was leave a little white scratch mark before pinging off to the ground. Wang Yuhang, at this point, was only barely managing to keep himself together. The flames that engulfed much of his body, leaving behind a multitude of nasty burns, were starting to take a toll on him. Brother Han, I am reaching the end of my tether. If you are to slay this oversized doggy, I recommend doing it soon. Wang Yuhang was crying as he ran. Little uncle, please, hold on just a little bit longer. As Hansen spoke, he had his crossbow raised, preparing to take another shot at the T-Rex's eye. A dozen bolts were already lodged in its eyelids, like a barroom dartboard. None had managed to pierce through and scrape its actual eyeball. Ping! Another bolt fired, from a much closer distance, this time. He expected this shot to strike its eye, but the eyelid blocked it once more. When Hansen reached for his quiver again, he was overwhelmed with dread to notice it was empty. They had all been fired, with no damage having been dealt to the beast that had assaulted them. Brave men must shoulder the greatest of deeds. Cowards? Nothing. I'm going in. Hansen knew the bolts were fairly well lodged in the monster's eyelids and thought this would be his only chance. So he took off running towards the monster. Killing the monster was not his priority right now. He wasn't doing this for himself. 
He knew, if he let the monster claim this place for itself, it would only be a matter of time before it chose to wreak havoc on the ice fields far below. Homes and shelters would be burnt to ash, and people would undoubtedly be eaten whenever it fancied a snack. Hansen didn't want to risk leaving the beast alive. He had exhausted one of his greatest chances of killing it already, so he wanted to push a little further. And even if he could not kill it, he'd at least deal as much damage as he could before retreat. He cast Long Live and Jade Sun Force. His arms were imbued with a great amount of energy, and the energy generated inside his heart empowered every corner of his body. Hansen's body made a clicking sound, as if he was shifting gear, going into overdrive. With Wang Yuhang still stealing the spotlight of the T-Rex's attention, Han Sen was able to run beside the creature and effortlessly leap up onto it. Quickly, he pranced to the top of the T-Rex's head. The T-Rex noticed Han Sen's presence, and maniacally writhed in a bid to get him off and reach him with its talons. Han Sen used Dongshua Sutra to simulate arrow. He took flight from off the T-Rex and dodged its attack like a strange bird. With a window of opportunity now open for him, he went in and tried to kick the bolt-laden eyelid. The T-Rex, however, turned around and tried to evade the attack. But as this happened, Hansen borrowed strength from the air to carry his kick and prepared to batter the eye with his legs seven times. The T-Rex, failing to dodge the attacks, simply shut its eyelids, thinking it could shield its eyes. But this was exactly what Hansen wanted. He walloped each of his seven kicks firmly into the bolts planted on the monster's eyelid. Hansen's legs were like steel sledgehammers. After seven strikes, the bolts were mallet deep into the monster's squishy eyeball. Roar! The T-Rex blasted one last cry to the sky as blood gushed from its ruined eye. The raven feather bolts, following Hansen's hits, had become implanted deep in the monster's eye. The T-Rex squirmed in pain as it tried to open its eye. But when it raised its eyelid, it dragged the bolts up with it, ruining its eye further. Now, more blood cascaded from the extra crevices that were cut into the eyeball. Taking advantage of another window of opportunity that had opened for him, Hansen kicked the beast another seven times. He was using the skill called Seven Kill, which, when combined with Arrow, brought devastating damage upon the monster's other eye. Roar. The T-Rex's other eye was now gushing blood. Having lost its vision completely, the monster flailed about in agony. Infuriated, the T-Rex began shooting geysers of flame in all directions. Hansen could only fly away from it, to avoid being incinerated by the wild flames. Brother Han. That was fine work. Wang Yuhang looked delighted. But just as he said that, he accidentally walked into the fire being spewed by the T-Rex, which had caught on fire once again. Arg! Wang Yuhang rolled around on the ground like a loon, trying to snuff out the flames. His bottom was as black as charcoal. The T-Rex no longer had any vision, and it was in agony. Every time it tried to blink, it dealt itself even greater damage. The T-Rex's talons were so long and thick, it couldn't pull the bolts out of its eyelid, either. The longer it went on, the more the T-Rex panicked. It flapped its four flame-wreathed wings in a bid to escape. Hansen used this time to pick up the bolts that were on the floor. Then, he summoned his wings to chase after the T-Rex. This was the first time he had gotten so close to killing a super-creature since coming to the second shelter. Unlike the last time with the dead-eye peacock, which was basically a kill steal. The T-Rex flailed madly in the sky as it continued shooting fireballs from its mouth. The sky was dark, lit up only by its flames. It was a terrifying spectacle to behold. The people down on the ice fields were able to watch the scene unfold, and it frightened those who looked up. No one had ever seen such a scary monster in the ice fields before, so this sort of sight was new to them. Look. Someone is chasing after that horrible creature, someone shouted. Where? Where? It's pretty far off, of course you can't see it with your eyes. Use a pair of binoculars, old man. In the shelter, technological products were prohibited. 
but simple viewing items like binoculars or spyglasses were allowed, as their function was only built through glass. Many people brought out their own binoculars to watch the scene unfold with greater clarity. They watched as a man chased off a flying T-Rex that breathed fire in the sky. Whoa! It's Leader Han. Holy smokes! Leader Han is super OP. How has he managed to get such a big scary creature to run away from him in fear? He is too powerful. Did Leader Han claim ownership of the metal shelter up there, too, all by himself? He's so handsome. He's so good. The people who watched Hansen chase away the T-Rex all reeled in shock and admiration. They thought Hansen was hunting it down. Although the T-Rex had been blinded, it seemed as if it could still distinguish things well. It was able to fly north, towards the ice sea that lay beyond the ice fields. Hansen followed the T-Rex, thinking of a way he might bring it down for good. The damage inflicted to its eyes was grievous, but it wasn't enough to slay the beast. Still, the visual impairment boded well for Hansen's battle, as the T-Rex was no longer the threat it once was. This thing's vitality is high. It is obviously well attuned with fire, which means it should be weak to other elements. It would be a difficult fight for a group to take on such a raging beast, but to one or two well-trained elites, it is not as threatening as the raven, Hansen thought to himself, observing the beast. The T-Rex resumed spewing fire but after a few roars, the flames extinguished. Was it running out of fire, or was it just exhausted? Hansen was happy to see this, so he unlocked his gene lock and used arrow to gain momentum and approach the T-Rex more efficiently. He waited for the monster to roar once more, and when it did, he fired another raven feather bolt into its open mouth. The hard light string of the crossbow flashed quickly, launching the bolt. The power of a super beast soul made the black feather appear as nothing more than a thin black laser. It was a direct hit in the T Rex's mouth. The T Rex opened its mouth again to roar, cascading blood as it did. The ten bolts Hansen fired into its mouth must have dealt a crippling amount of damage. Whoosh! The T Rex started breathing fire once more, and a creepy mixture of blood and flame gushed out from its mouth, with the occasional black feather. Unfortunately, a few of the raven feathers inside were charred and broken. No longer could they be reused as bolts or converted into daggers. Hansen's heart felt as if it had been stabbed, seeing this. But for killing a super creature, he did not mind the loss as much as he could have. The T-Rex continued to heave blood from its ravaged mouth, which inked the sea blood red as it soared above. It may have gotten rid of the bolts inside its mouth, but the wounds hadn't healed and the damage wasn't going to go away any time soon. Hansen had no metric to effectively gauge how much the T-Rex had been damaged, but he did know that super creatures had strong recovery powers. If he allowed the monster to escape, it was only a matter of time before it recovered and perhaps sought vengeance. With bolstered resolve, Hansen gritted his teeth, cast arrow, and kicked the T-Rex's eyelids again. Suddenly, the T-Rex raised its talons and flailed in Hansen's direction. They were so fast and big, it was as if the T-Rex had summoned all the remaining strength in its body for that one strike. It was already too late for Hansen to dodge, and the talons that were coming his way gave him a shock. But with the gene lock open, he didn't let it affect him. He maintained his composure and without even thinking, he summoned his golden armor, gargoyle glyph, and peacock crossbow to block the blow. Pang! When the talons met the peacock crossbow, Han Sen was sent rocketing downwards, shattering a layer of ice on the icy sea. The splash his body created was massive. Han Sen exited the sea coughing blood and shaking from the pain. It felt as if all his organs had been flipped upside down. It's easy to forget how powerful a super creature can be. Such power is frightening. Hansen's heart was shocked. When he opened his mouth, more blood dripped out. If he had not used the peacock crossbow to block the initial strike, he feared he would have been torn apart by the sudden blow. But after the strike, the T-Rex appeared to be even more injured than it had been. It spewed more and more blood down into the sea, coloring it in an inky, dark red haze. 
The T-Rex must have really despised Hansen to not care about its own wounds. With further disregard for its own health, it flew down to finish off Hansen, who was still reeling from the hit he had just received. Hansen watched the T-Rex come down and did not dare fight it face to face. He summoned his silver eel and tried to sail away from it. But the silver fox on Hansen's shoulder suddenly roared with a great ferocity of its own. It seemed to have been infuriated by the damage that had just been dealt to Hansen, and then it prickled and sparked with silver lightning, as the sound of rumbling thunder resonated from within it. Like a silver bolt of lightning, the silver fox launched itself into the air, striking the T-Rex that had sought to pursue them. Roar! The T-Rex cried out in pain as its body began to produce white smoke. It may have hurt, but the T-Rex was too strong for the silver fox to deal any lasting damage. The T-Rex then decided to halt its pursuit of Hansen and focus on its nearer opponent, the silver fox. Breathing out more streams of fire, it tried its best to incinerate the silver fox into dust. The silver fox was still in the air, gliding backwards and forwards. It continued to cast bolts of silver lightning to attack the T-Rex. The T-Rex was still blind, so its reactions and abilities of perception were far weaker now. It had great difficulty trying to burn the silver fox, which was so small and possessed incredible speed. But still, the silver fox was a juvenile super creature, and its power was nowhere near that of the T-Rex. The effectiveness of the silver lightning wasn't high as a result, despite its constant strikes upon the T-Rex. Hansen continued to clutch his chest as he coughed up more blood. He summoned his berserk sacred blood wings and returned to the air. He was prepared to leave and let the T-Rex go due to his injury, but he hadn't expected the silver fox to fight on its own. This reinvigorated Hansen's hope for victory. The silver fox was not Hansen's real pet. And because Hansen had difficulty controlling it, he didn't treat it as a battle companion. But when the silver fox started fighting, it was far stronger than a person who had unlocked their gene lock. Even Hansen was willing to confess how much better the silver fox was than him. After all, the silver fox had a super creature's fitness. Even juvenile super creatures were stronger than most human evolvers. The silver fox continued running circles around the T-Rex and kept firing its lightning at it. The T-Rex started to grow increasingly annoyed with its inability to do anything about it. Though each strike may not have dealt a lot of damage individually, it was still under attack, and that meant it was beginning to lose blood more and more from its mouth and eyes. As wretched as those wounds were, they weren't enough to kill a super creature. Hansen pushed his gene lock to the max and stared at the T-Rex without blinking, trying to determine every possible move his enemy could make and every outcome to an action he could perform. When the chance arrived, Hansen's heart jumped. Like some sort of god, he flew before the T-Rex in the blink of an eye and dealt one humongous kick to the fiend's left eye. After the kick, Hansen flew far away and dodged the attempted counterattack. But the bolt in the monster's left eyelid was wholly kicked through the eye itself. The T-Rex faced the sky, and it howled in pain once more. Its mouth was a geyser of flame and it shot out fire like an erupting volcano. The silver fox collaborated with Hansen and attacked the T-Rex at the same time with more lightning, which struck the T-Rex with miniature explosions. After the double hit, the bleeding of the beast did not stop. The T-Rex's flame-wreathed wings began flapping with greater speed as it tried to escape again. Hansen continued to hold his chest and bear with the pain as he chased after it. This was his best chance of killing a super creature, and he would not let this opportunity pass him by, no matter what. If he missed this chance, he wouldn't know when such an opportunity would roll around again. The blinded T-Rex continued to fly across the sky, getting hammered by Hansen and the silver fox's attacks. Over time, its health got visibly worse, but it still stubbornly refused to give up the ghost. Heaven knew how much blood the T-Rex had lost over the course of their battle, and it chilled Hansen to watch it continue to spew up more and more, as it carried on attempting an airborne escape. As he chased it across the big sea, Hansen spent most of his time aboard his silver eel, 
to more effortlessly keep pace with the T-Rex above. Hansen had been badly injured, as well. If he continued flying, it would only have been a matter of time before exhaustion kicked in and he was too weary to fight. They chased the T-Rex for another eight days. On the eighth day, it was unable to keep going and collapsed into the sea. Its giant body dropped into the sea, producing massive waves. The T-Rex tried its best to return to the skies, flapping and splashing about with its extinguished wings, but failed. It may not have been able to get back up, but that didn't mean it was dead yet, either. After Hansen leapt onto its back, though, he noticed it was unable to fight back. Lacking the weapons necessary to penetrate its thick scales and deal it one final, killing blow, Hansen resolved to just wait until it died. Hansen waited for two weeks before hearing the notification he enjoyed listening to so much. Super Creature Hunted, Firescale T-Rex The beast soul has been acquired. The flesh of this creature is inedible, but you may harvest its life geno essence. Consume its life geno essence to obtain a random numeric amount of super geno points, ranging from 0 to 10. Han Sen then watched as the huge, lifeless body of the T-Rex faded away. A fiery crystal dropped from its disintegrating corpse. The crystal was beautiful to look at and about the same size as a fist. Han Sen quickly went to catch the crystal, but the flames that wreathed it burnt his hand. He brought back his hand and the crystal dropped into the sea. It was like a burning orb of metal dropping into the sea. Its entry into the water was followed by much steam, and the encompassing water began to boil. Holy smokes! How am I supposed to consume life geno essence that spicy? Han Sen was afraid that after the crystal fell into the sea, another strong creature might come along and eat it. He quickly summoned his peacock crossbow and used it to fish the crystal out of the sea. The life geno essence had not grown colder, despite being submerged in the sea. It was still just as hot. Hansen observed the fiery crystal delicately perched upon his peacock crossbow. He frowned and commented, How am I supposed to eat this thing? If I lick it how I did back in the first shelter, I'll end up chewing a roasted tongue. The silver fox was in Hansen's arms. With its little paws, it attempted to grab the life geno essence. Hansen stopped it from doing so immediately as he wanted to dine on the essence all by himself. It was a hard-fought victory, and he wanted to enjoy every morsel of the reward he had earned. But Hansen soon realized he was wrong. The silver fox was just curious about how the life geno essence looked, it didn't want to eat it. It was like a cat playing with a ball. It used its paws to touch the life geno essence, which then burnt them. After that, it hurriedly gave up its interest in the crystal. You don't want to eat it? Hansen put the life geno essence down near the silver fox. Its face looked disdainful and it turned around, refusing to even look at it. That greedy silver fox doesn't actually want to eat this good stuff? Hansen was quite shocked. Then, Hansen thought of something else in his possession that enjoyed eating random stuff. So he summoned his little angel and placed the T-Rex's life geno essence in front of her and said, Would you like to eat this? The little angel just looked at the life geno essence and shook her head. It didn't seem as if she was interested in it, either. What's going on? Hansen pondered in bewilderment. He couldn't believe his two biggest monster munchers weren't interested in eating such rare and valuable consumables. Was the world ending? Is it because this thing is too hot, and they don't think it'd sit well on their stomachs? This was the only possible reason Hansen could think of. It was a shame that the little angel and the silver fox were unable to speak, so they couldn't tell him the reason why they didn't want to eat it. Hansen thought and thought about how he might be able to eat the life geno essence until his brain nearly broke. Of all the methods he thought of, not one would allow him to eat it. This is like a burning ball of iron. How am I supposed to eat it? As time passed by, the temperature of the life geno essence did not seem to reduce. Unable to resist any more, he stuck out his tongue and gave it one big lick. Unfortunately, all that did was incinerate his tongue. Heavens curse it! 
how am I supposed to eat this thing? Hansen had no idea what to do, and having exhausted all viable options, he had to put it away for the moment. Fortunately, despite how hot it was, its heat was nowhere near the magnitude of the flames the T-Rex had generated. Hansen used a metal water storage unit to tuck the fiery life Gino essence in. Thankfully, for as hot as it remained, the temperature of the crystal did not conduct into the metal pot. This thing is far too strange. Hansen then examined the rest of the battle results and found out most of his crossbow bolts were ruined. They had either been incinerated or snapped by the T-Rex, leaving only seven for Hansen to use. But defeating another super creature at the expense of those bolts was a more than worthwhile exchange. Had he lost every single bolt, he would still have thought it was worth it. Hansen then went to examine his greatest reward, the fire-scale T-Rex beast soul. He was really excited about it, having no clue what it might be. Super Creature Beast Soul, Gem Type When Hansen saw the text, he turned to stone. He recalled seeing that title someplace else in the second shelter, but there weren't many out there. He remembered seeing it once on the news, but had no clue what it could be used for. Hansen staggered a little and then summoned the fire-scale T-Rex beast soul. All that appeared in front of him was a fist-sized ruby-like gem. Inside the gem, Hansen could discern a faint image of the T-Rex he had seized the beast soul from, as if a miniature variant had been encased within. As Hansen continued looking at it, he was unable to determine what this strange gem was actually capable of. Let's go back to the shelter first. I should be able to find out what purpose this thing serves back at the Alliance. Hansen returned to sit on the Silver Eel's back and had it deliver him all the way back to the ice fields. A thought then entered Hansen's mind, what if Wan Yuhang's extended holding of his hand had infected him with a certain amount of the man's bad luck? He then thought if that were true, he surely would not have obtained the beast soul. And he even received a lot more. But, that being said, he had no idea how to consume the life geno essence he had obtained or make use of the beast soul. This gave Hansen an itch. Back in the ice fields, the mystery island had yet to return to the empty. This made Hansen breathe a sigh of relief. When Hansen returned to the lofty island, Wang Yuhang welcomed him there with great passion. Brother Han, you are back. Did you kill the creature? Wang Yuhang asked Han Sen, with great enthusiasm in his voice. I thought you'd be able to tell, just by looking at my face. Had I killed it, I would have brought its flesh back, wouldn't I? Han Sen shrugged. That's okay. I'm sure the opportunity to slay it will arise once more. Wang Yuhang didn't sound disappointed at all. He comforted Han Sen with great concern. This made Han Sen feel slight discomfort instead, as if it were unnatural. He wasn't the sort of person to be intimidated by bad people, but he was the sort to become afraid of nice people. Brother Han, I have come to believe you, and I are meant to be. I have decided to group up with you, a proposition that was sealed, signed, and delivered by the mistress of destiny herself. With Team Wang Han reporting for duty, we are sure to produce a prosperous future for the second shelter. Wang Yuhang put his arm around Han Sen's shoulders, discussing a wild future birthed by his fantasies. In Wang Yuhang's eyes, they would one day become a legendary pair that could amass riches and fortunes with the greatest of ease. These childish dreams made Han Sen shudder. After a bit of silence, in which Han Sen was given a moment to think, he asked himself, when did I ever agree to cooperate with him? Having a partnership with this guy might result in a super creature assaulting my shelters every day. This entire time Han Sen had not said a word, but as Wang Yuhang went on and on about some glorious future in which they ruled the entirety of the second shelter, he felt bad about the idea of immediately shutting down the man's deluded visions. But reflecting on his battle with the T-Rex, he realized that Wang Yuhang had helped a good deal. If it wasn't for his impeccable abilities at gaining aggro, Han Sen would not have been able to fire his crossbow bolts into the monster's eye. Han Sen needed someone like Wang Yuhang. But seeing Wang Yuhang wax lyrical about his dreams, he felt as if his input had been wholly ignored, or not even asked for. 
Brother Han, if we partner up, we will be able to achieve many great things in this world. Wang Yuhang continued to grip Han Sen's shoulders as they walked towards the Mystery Island's metal shelter. On and on, he talked about the amazing future they would have if they teamed up. But when Han Sen saw what had happened to the shelter, his face turned black. It was little more than a smoldering ruin, most of it having been utterly annihilated by the rampaging T-Rex they had fought there. Without technological aid, trying to restore the shelter to its former glory would be a vast undertaking. Even with builders working around the clock, it would take at least half a year for the renovations to be completed. Han Sen decided to summon Princess Empty to see if there was anything she could do. Perhaps she had some manner of control over the shelter. The result brought much joy to Han Sen's heart. Princess Empty was able to control the entire metal shelter and even make the Mystery Island stop moving or move to wherever Hansen wanted it to be. The only disappointing aspect was the speed at which the Mystery Island moved, it was a bit slow. As a reliable mode of transport, its usage as a convenient airship was out of the question. Still, it was enough to be a spacefaring castle. Hansen went to look for Yang Manli, Li Xing Luan, and Brother Philip to get them to invest in the development of the island. Without contributions from the other factions, there wouldn't be enough money or manpower to operate and sustain the Mystery Island. When the Mystery Island landed, the entirety of the ice field shook. Hansen had managed to take on and gain ownership over the royal shelter, pretty much solo. Plus, people had seen him chase off the fire-scale T-Rex. His reputation across the ice fields increased even more. He had achieved near-legendary status, and people treated him like some sort of god. A lot of people in the ice fields tried to post the news on the Skynet, which was met with negative criticism and proclamations that such a feat was undoubtedly fake. Most simply didn't pay attention, so it didn't really cause that much of a scene in the grand scheme of things. A few days later, Han Sen was starting to regret his acceptance of Wang Yuhang's presence. Ever since he had appeared in his life, nothing had gone smoothly. His favorite chair, which he frequently sat on, suddenly broke. As he was out for a walk one day, a sinkhole suddenly appeared, which he almost fell into. The most far-fetched of accidents imaginable were now affecting Han Sen on a day-to-day -day basis. For as long as Wang Yuhang was around, the endless misfortune continued. All Hansen could take solace in was the fact that the man's presence hadn't attracted any more super creatures. Finding an excuse, Hansen was able to leave the goddess shelter and get away from Wang Yuhang for some time. Hansen then went to the Crystal Palace alone. Although nothing truly unfortunate had happened, the constant minor troubles eventually got tiresome and Hansen couldn't take it anymore. Everyone in the goddess shelter, I am so sorry. I have no choice. Han Sen was feeling sorry for Yang Manli, Li Xing Luan, and Brother Philip, so he went to the Crystal Palace alone. There, he finally felt great relief at his ability to enjoy some simple peace and quiet away from all the bad luck. Han Sen had yet to find a way in which he could eat the T-Rex's life geno essence. Eating it as it was would be no different than taking a suicide pill. Hansen kept the essence in the Crystal Palace while he returned to the Alliance to browse for more information in the community. There was nothing about the life geno essence, so he was still unable to find a way to eat it. But he did find information on gem beast souls. The results surprised Hansen quite a bit and almost made him fall out of his chair. Gem beast souls could be consumed by other beast souls to make the recipient beast souls evolve. Ordinarily, if a sacred blood gem beast soul was combined with a mutant class beast soul, the mutant class beast soul would evolve into a sacred blood beast soul. Does that mean I can use this gem beast soul to evolve any of my sacred blood beast souls into a super beast soul? Hansen became extremely excited at this prospect. If this was true, Hansen could give the gem beast soul to one of his sacred blood weapons and resolve his current weaponry issues. Hansen then took a look at the information of his gem beast soul and discovered that there was a problem. The gem beast soul could not combine with just any beast soul, and there was a success rate percentage tied to it. 
If its attempt at being combined with another beast soul was not successful, the gem beast soul would be destroyed. The rule was that a sacred blood gem beast soul had to combine with a mutant class beast soul. If it combined with an ordinary beast soul, it would not be able to handle the increase in power and would simply break and become useless. This meant the gem beast soul and beast soul used would be gone for good. Even if it combined with a mutant class beast soul, it would have to be of a comparable type, as well. Otherwise, it would still break. From what he could gather, there was no other way to increase his chance of success. But, there were a few posts by experienced beast soul gem infusers that helped to clarify a few things. If it was a wolf element gem beast soul, combining it with a wolf beast soul would yield a much higher chance at success. Of course, this wasn't 100% certified information. And there were still many things humans did not yet know in regards to all this. As Hansen browsed, he saw a post containing information that had leaked from the third shelter. It said that aside from the type of beast soul, the element mattered as well. If a fire gem beast soul combined with a fire element beast soul, the chance of success would be much higher. If this is how things are, I will need to find a fire element T-Rex beast soul first, Hansen thought, stroking his jaw. As Hansen thought, his eyes suddenly lit up. Suddenly, Hansen thought that if the beast soul had to be chosen to use the gem beast soul for evolution, did that mean humans using the life geno essence had to follow the same rule? All the creatures in the first shelter, including super creatures, only had to evolve with meat. Therefore, you could eat their life geno essence right away. But when he reached the second shelter, creatures had their own elements. This meant that their cores were different. Did this mean that humans had to have a similar body to consume them? Of course, Han Sen was just guessing. He didn't know for sure if things were indeed like that. But if that was true, that meant he would have to use different elemental essences to max out his super geno points and become a surpasser. Would that mean he would receive a different super body? Han Sen was deep in thought. If this was indeed how things worked, he wondered what element he belonged to and which life geno essence he would need. Although he practiced ice skin, he didn't receive any icy powers. So, surely, he did not belong to the ice element. And the Dongshua Sutra had no element, it just made him smell good. Han Sen had never heard of any creatures belonging to a perfume element either. This is giving me a headache. Hansen rubbed his temples and decided to shelve those matters for the time being. Right now, Hansen wanted to create a super beast soul. If it possessed the power needed to kill a super creature, then obtaining life geno essences would be a far easier task. His worries would most certainly be lessened. This T Rex gem beast soul will need another fire element, T Rex sacred blood beast soul, to have the highest success rate possible. But creatures below the super class do not display the element they belong to, which means I will only have to care for finding another T Rex beast soul. Hansen looked at the beast souls he was in possession of, noting that he didn't have any T Rex beast souls. Hunting one by himself wasn't very realistic, so he decided to peruse the trading boards of Skynet. He wanted to see if anyone was selling a sacred blood T Rex beast soul nearby. There were quite a few T-Rex beast souls for sale, and after a fair amount of time browsing, he found a person selling a Snorex sacred blood beast soul. It was a Snow White, giant T-Rex beast soul. It was a sacred blood creature that had been hunted on some snowy mountain. After Hansen saw it, he quickly dismissed it. Although a sacred blood class beast soul did not have an element, just hearing the name and how it was related to the cold did not make him confident. Combining it with a fire-oriented gem was just asking for failure. It was also important to note that this was an armor beast soul. Although he would need such armor eventually, he needed weapons more. If he didn't have a weapon that could pierce the thick hide of a super creature, killing them would be a tall order. Hansen saw countless posts about T-Rex armor beast souls, but none about weaponry. Some of them were even transfigured beast souls. Well, I don't need a transfigured beast soul. I can't cast many skills when I look like a T-Rex. 
Although the vitality would be fairly decent, my overall power might be worse. Hansen considered getting a transfigured beast soul, but ultimately dismissed that idea, as well. He couldn't find a suitable beast soul, so he tried looking for something else. If he still couldn't find what he wanted, then he'd just have to try it out with an armor beast soul. When I went to fight the red scale dragon with Idong Mu, it looked just like a T-Rex. Perhaps it really is a T-Rex sacred blood beast soul. If I go kill it, maybe I could get a more useful beast soul? Hansen browsed for a bit longer, and being unable to find what he ultimately wanted, realized his thoughts were drifting to the red scale dragon. Red scale dragon was the title he and Idong Mu had devised for it. It was a sacred blood creature that looked like a T-Rex. During their fight, it crystallized and became a berserk sacred blood beast soul. That had rendered them unable to kill it, and so they ran away. Now that Hansen had the peacock crossbow, he could give it another shot. It would be fantastic news if he was able to obtain the beast soul. If he didn't get it, that would be okay, since he'd still be able to buy one, anyway. He didn't stay in the shelter for long this time, so he used his communicator to call home and talk with his mom. They discussed various topics and spoke about what was going on with the family. Xiaoyan's studies had been going really well, and she had many friends in the school for nobles. The fact that she had become an outgoing girl made Han Sen pleased to hear. He didn't want Xiaoyan to become a lonely person because of the family. Being a happy, outgoing girl was better than anything else. They talked for about an hour before Han Sen had to say goodbye. Being able to talk with his family was quite the privilege. Without exclusive permission, most soldiers here were unable to talk with the outside world. The reason Han Sen could do this was all down to Ji Yan Ran. So, every now and again, he was able to keep up to date with his family. He was not allowed to talk for long periods of time, however, and all communications to and from the Alliance were monitored. Right now, Hansen knew where the ice fields were in the second shelter. His mother was in the Sapphire Shelter, which was on the western side of a mountain range that was a thousand miles long. It was too far away from the ice fields for him to visit her. According to the second shelter's map, the Sapphire Shelter was several million miles away and between them were vast swaths of wild, uncharted, dangerous land. Hansen's mom was training Saint Angel skills. Hansen did not teach her or Hanyan Dongshiwa Sutra primarily because he was still learning it himself, and he didn't yet know if there were any troubles with it. He wanted to learn it himself first, and if there weren't any negative side effects, he would one day gladly take the time to teach them. And in regards to his mom, Hansen did not yet plan to visit her. He didn't believe he was strong enough to traverse such a long, treacherous road to reach the Sapphire Shelter. Furthermore, there wasn't really any point in going right now. Hansen had already prohibited his mom from hunting, and she only needed the money necessary to purchase food. Sapphire Shelter was a big shelter, and the human faction was powerful there. It was quite difficult to buy sacred blood flesh, but for any other class of flesh, there was plenty available for purchase at all times. With the money Hansen earned, it was enough to fund her purchase of all the flesh she needed. Back in the shelter, Hansen prepared himself to fight the red scale dragon and try to earn its beast soul. Hansen left the silver fox behind in the crystal palace. If he brought it with him, the red scale dragon would smell it from a great distance away and run off before it was even a speck on the horizon. He didn't dare return to the goddess shelter, either, as he was still afraid of having any contact with Wan Yuhang. If the man's bad luck happened to infect him, and he failed to obtain the beast soul he desired, Han Sen would be heartbroken. Unfortunately for Han Sen, it was a common occurrence that what he was most afraid of was exactly what he'd end up suffering. Han Sen began climbing the mountain, and his greatest fear was realized, Wang Yuhang was also there, killing monsters. When Wang Yuhang saw Han Sen, he was delightfully surprised. He finished off the creature he was engaged in combat with and enthusiastically ran towards Han Senator he asked aloud, Brother Han, have you come looking for me? Yeah, sure. Hansen didn't really know how to respond, thinking of how unlucky 
and how unlikely he was to meet Wang Yuhang here, of all places. Brother Han, have you heard of what's afoot in the alliance? It's major, from what I hear. Wang Yuhang's voice had dropped low, as if he was whispering a secret. What big thing, little uncle? Han Sen was never really concerned when it came to events in the alliance, but he asked anyway. Only a few of the high-class alliance members know about this, right now. It's currently on the down low, but I fear it's only a matter of time before it gets announced. Wang Yuhang paused for a bit, inched closer to Han Sen's ear, and said, someone has managed to slay that creature in the first shelter. What creature? Han Sen's body shook. That creature that is above the class of a sacred blood creature. It turns out, they're actually called super creatures, and it has shaken the high class members of the alliance to the very bone. Wang Yuhang spoke aloud, with envy. After Han Sen heard what he had to say, he felt some relief. Since there were more and more elites in the first shelter, it was only a matter of time before they could kill super creatures. The existence of super creatures becoming well known by humans would be a relief for Han Sen. Who killed the super creature and how? Hansen asked Wang Yuhang. It was a woman called Ji Qing, from the Ji family. In a way, you are her brother-in-law, but she is not a daughter of Ji Ruajin. She is only a cousin to your family, but she is far more talented than Ji Ruajin's daughter. She has already been titled the first genius of the alliance and a star of hope for the future. Wang Yuhang trailed off for a second with a smile. Then, he shook his head and continued by saying, but they didn't manage to kill a super creature merely because Ji Ruajin was so strong, but members of the Wang, Lin, and Shue families helped out, as well. They also hired many elites, 300, as a matter of fact. They were elites who have not yet evolved, but have maxed out their genes. They aided in injuring the super creature for her, and many people are reported to have died. It is a shame such a feat is even more difficult to achieve in the second shelter. The second shelter excludes surpassers, so once we hit that level, we have to immediately leave this place. Otherwise, our bodies will be dealt irreversible damage. It's a shame none of these events take place in the second shelter, I know I'd join in, if such a thing were to happen. Wang Yuhang sighed and said. Hansen looked confused and asked. All those people gave their best to kill that super creature and many people gave their lives. Were there any goodies? Why does that Ji Qing hog all the glory? She was the one who found an injured super creature and she was the one who dealt the final blow. The others were just hired help, sellswords, and the like, who were paid beforehand. They got what they were promised. After saying this, Wang Yuhang lowered his voice to tell Han Sen, plus, Ji Ruajin basically confirmed he is going to be the leader of the alliance. No one will offend the Ji family over the killing of a super creature. And if they can kill one once, they're sure to be able to do it again. With our association to the Ji family, where we help her and she helps us, fighting over such a kill would be pointless. Han Sen nodded. He knew it was difficult to kickstart anything in this world. After killing the first, it was incredibly likely more and more would start to die. It was only a matter of time before someone maxed out all their super geno points. As time went on, the snowball effect was inevitable. Did Ji Qing get a super beast soul? Hansen asked. Yes, an armor variant. If she hadn't, she wouldn't be called the Star of Hope for the future of the Alliance. With that sort of armor, the first shelter will become Ji Qing's stomping ground. Wang Yuhang then looked into Han Sen's eyes and continued by saying, Oh, yeah. Anyway, let's get back to business. Why have you come searching for me? I'm going into the mountains to hunt a berserk sacred blood creature. If you aren't busy, you can tag along. This was the only thing Hansen could say, really. Brilliant. Slaying berserk sacred blood creatures is my favorite pastime. Wang Yuhang was giddy like a child and looked genuinely ecstatic to be able to come. They both followed the ridge of the mountain. Hansen ascended the place carefully, in fear of any threats that may have been lurking beneath the snow he treaded upon. 
He did so because he hadn't forgotten about the super creature turtles he had once spotted when they emerged from a small cave for a feast of red mushrooms. If they were still around, and he somehow alerted them, Hansen didn't think he'd be able to take on nine super creatures all at once. Before long, Hansen safely arrived at the last place he had seen the red scale dragon. Surprisingly, it had been a journey free from any trouble. The red scale dragon had not vacated the area, and he spotted it resting in the valley. The red scale dragon looked slightly different than the first time he saw it. Its red scales were already crystallized. When watching it from afar, it looked like a giant statue encrusted with rubies. It was beautiful. That is one big chap. Wang Yuhang saw the red scale dragon too and took a deep breath. Hansen laughed. He looked at Wang Yuhang and told him, Little uncle, I'm afraid I am going to have to request your assistance once more. If you would be so kind, I would like you to attract the fiend while I kill it. As payment, I'll let you keep half of its flesh. Accepted. Wang Yuhang nodded, summoned a beast soul and ran screaming towards the red dragon. He didn't run too far, however. He stopped a good distance from it, scrambled for some rocks beneath the snow, and lobbed them at the creature. The red-scale dragon saw its harasser and quickly took off after him, seething with rage. Wang Yuhang led the red-scale dragon up and down the slopes of the mountain. Hansen summoned his peacock crossbow and loaded up his seven remaining bolts. The red scale dragon was most certainly in berserk mode and a result, its scales were currently much tougher than the scales of an average sacred blood creature. If he used the raven bolts to pierce the scales, Hansen feared they wouldn't do much damage to the creature. It was of a monstrous size, after all. So, Hansen prepared to repeat the tactic that had allowed him to bring down the T-Rex. He took aim at the red dragon's eye. Since the red dragon was not a super creature, unlike his previous foe, Hansen believed firing his crossbow at its eye was sure to have pegged a bolt directly through its brain. Finding a sound location on the mountain's peak to take his shot, Hansen waited for Wang Yuhang to draw the red dragon a little closer before he attacked. As the red dragon was led in a circle around the peak, Wang Yuhang reappeared yelling. Run! Wang Yuhang was screaming flailing his arms like a madman towards Hansen as he ran. Something was most certainly wrong. Hansen's heart began to race as he pondered what might have gone awry. He thought to himself, what's happening? Surely nothing terrible has happened once again, has it? Hansen looked behind Wang Yuhang and saw the red scale dragon turning the corner of the peak, apparently giving chase. It was running as fast as a rabbit, but it wasn't an ordinary pursuit. Something wasn't quite right. That was when Hansen froze. Behind the red scale dragon was another creature, a massive elephant composed of white bones. The already giant red scale dragon looked like a chew toy before the white bone elephant. The elephant's trunk ensnared the fleeing red scale dragon, lifted it up, and gobbled it up in one whole mouthful. The virgin snow was now splattered with blood. Holy smokes! Hansen swore in his heart, turned around, and quickly started running. Wang Yuhang truly was born unlucky. Even out here, in the midst of a fight, he had managed to attract the attention of a monstrous super creature. Hansen regretted the fact that he had not just decided to come alone, as taking out a berserk sacred blood red scale dragon solo was far better than any super creature alternative. Fortunately, the super creature was caught up munching on its draconic snack, which bought Han Sen and Wang Yuhang the enough time to get away. Little uncle, I have a question I would like to ask you, Han Sen gasped out, after reaching a safe place, far from the dangers of the super creature. What would that be? Wang Yuhang was gasping, as well. How did you ever manage to hunt creatures by yourself? Hansen asked. Wang Yuhang seemed to be a magnet for the most wretched of creatures. To begin hunting a small creature, only to end up being run off by a larger creature seemed to be a regular occurrence, so it was strange to Hansen that Wang Yuhang had managed to survive for so long. Brother Han, I must confess to you that I am rarely ever able to slay monsters by myself. 
Even if I do manage to slay a creature, I almost never receive their loot. To get where I am today, I have mostly been carried. Wang Yuhang's face was red as he admitted his embarrassing truth. Hansen was unsure of how to reply. Fortunately, Yu Hang hailed from the Wang family. If he hadn't, he would have had great difficulty carving out an identity and some modicum of prominence for himself. It would have been worse than how Hansen started out, and chances of survival would be low. For a big elite like Wang Yu Hang to need others to help carry him was a pity. It was strange, though. Wang Yu Hang was a talented warrior, and in terms of power, the peacock crossbow was the only thing that would give Hansen an edge if they were ever to duel. Wang Yuhang was almost as good as the queen, and it was a shame he lacked the self-confidence he needed to drive him forward. How about this then, little uncle? I have formed a team composed of elites dedicated to hunting super creatures. If you are interested, I will accept you amongst its ranks. However, if you are to join, you will have to sign a contract. This contract states that you are to adhere to my every command, Hansen told Wang Yuhang, looking at him. Although Wang Yuhang was an unlucky person, Hansen thought his uncanny ability to attract super creatures would be a valuable trait for such a team. Hansen would just need really strong armor to keep Wang Yuhang alive, so he could kite and tank super creatures effectively in battle. Brother Han. Wang Yuhang suddenly jumped in front of Hansen's face. He grabbed Hansen's hand, placed it on his own chest, and started to cry. He was so touched, he was unable to speak. Little uncle, if you have something to say, then say it. Hansen quickly snatched back his hand, afraid Wang Yuhang's next question would be a proposition to sleep with him. But again, Wang Yuhang grabbed Hansen's hand, not wanting to let go. He enthusiastically said, Brother Han, you are a true brother of mine. You are one of the few people who are able to see the good that resides within me. You are the sun in my sky, scattering away the clouds of contempt. You light up my world, Han Sen. Wang Yuhang was genuinely touched. Although he did not fight much, due to his awful luck, his ability to attract super creatures was a great boon for Han Sen to have. As a result, for Wang Yuhang, this would be the first time his trait was a benefit. The Wang family, despite providing him with many goodies from their various hunts, never brought him with them because of the bad luck that accompanied him. When Wang Yuhang wandered off on his own, it was a misadventure just waiting to happen. After killing a few creatures, a far more fearsome foe would be waiting for him every time. This was the first time he had been offered a place on a team. Now that Hansen actually wanted him, Wang Yuhang only wished he could have met him sooner. He was eternally grateful to be offered this opportunity. Oh, look. I have a contract right here in my pocket. You should take a look at it. The conditions therein may be a little harsh, but it is what it is. Hunting super creatures was never meant to be a walk in the park, after all. Hansen pulled the contract out of his pocket and handed it over to Wang Yuhang. Hansen formulated this contract a while ago while composing a team. This contract was originally designed for the queen, but because she had been so busy in recent times, she had not been able to return to the shelter and sign it. Now that Han Sen had deemed Wang Yuhang a suitable candidate for the team, he thought he might as well give it to him for the time being. Wang Yuhang looked it over and signed it without hesitation. The conditions were, just like Han Sen had said, harsh. It didn't inhibit his eagerness to sign, however as the terms were still fair. Hansen looked happy after this. He took back the contract, signed it himself, and provided Wang Yuhang with the copy. Little uncle, you are hereby a part of my team. Hansen smiled at him. Wang Yuhang, all excitement, asked, Bossman, how many other elites do we have amongst our ranks? Oh, let me see, two. Just two. You and I. Hansen thought it was better not to hide the truth. Finding other powerful people that were not already part of a faction or guild was difficult. He was lucky to have someone who did not already have obligations, and particularly so to have someone who had already unlocked their gene lock. 
Even though there were many elites who were alone, they were usually invited to big guilds and factions, casually, regardless of their status. There, they could reap benefits and continue training. The chances of any random elite joining Han Sen, a person without a particularly outstanding background, was quite slim. Wang Yuheng did not mind this at all. In fact, he was already thinking of a way in which he could aid Han Sen's cause. He then told Han Sen, Bossman, I know someone who is really powerful. He is a friend of mine, perhaps we can invite him to join the team? Who? Han Sen was always intrigued by someone who was described as really powerful. It was too difficult to hunt super creatures in the second shelter solo, but now, people in the world were aware of the existence of super creatures. Although no one in the second shelter was able to kill them yet, hiring others for the cause wouldn't prove as tough anymore. His name is Lei Heng Wu. He may not hail from a family of any particular notoriety or fame, but his family does possess a special skill of sorts. It is called Giant Thunderbolt Sacred Lance. I have seen it in action, and it is wickedly powerful. He is a top elite and has not pledged allegiance to any guild or cause just yet. I am also a good friend of his, which may be the connection we need to get him to join you, Wang Yuheng said. Hansen asked about Lei Heng Wu. He sounded like the sort of person he would need on his team, so he decided to follow Wang Yuheng and pay this man a visit. Hansen was unable to kill the red scale dragon as he had planned to, due to it being eaten by the white bone elephant. He still needed a T-Rex soul, so he was still determined to find one, one way or another. Luckily, Lei Heng Wu was in a rather large human shelter. Hansen wanted to take the opportunity to browse the markets and see if he could snag a sacred blood T-Rex beast soul.